I went from an 1180 on the PSAT to a 1590 on the SAT, and over the past three years, I've released hundreds of videos to help students ace the SAT. This video is a completely free digital SAT prep course designed to help you improve as much as possible in only about 18 hours of prep. If you only have eight hours or less to prep for the digital SAT, then I recommend you check out my free seven hour digital SAT prep course, which you can find right here. The first seven and a half hours of this course are actually the same as the free seven hour course, but the rest of this course adds on additional training and practice for those with more time to prepare. As a result, I highly recommend this course to anyone with the time to complete it before their SAT. While there are timestamps for each section, I highly recommend that you watch the entire course in the order it is presented. I also want to note that while reading and writing is a combined section on the digital SAT, there are still questions that primarily test your reading abilities and questions that primarily test your writing abilities. Therefore, at certain points in the course, you will notice that I will speak exclusively about either reading or writing questions. I put a lot of time, effort, and planning into this course, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe and like the video. With that being said, please enjoy the course, and let's get started with a guide on what you need to know for the writing questions on the digital SAT. So we have subject-verb agreement. As a basic rule, the subject and the verb of a sentence must agree in number, singular or plural. Here's an example. The dog barks loudly. The subject dog is singular, and the verb barks is singular. Here's a second example. The dogs bark loudly. The subject dogs is plural and the verb bark is plural. Now at this point, you may be wondering, how do I know if a verb is singular or plural? One trick that can help you is to use what I call the he, they test. So as an example, we would say he barks. So as you can see, he is singular and barks then would be singular. If we were to say um, he bark, obviously that would not work because he is singular and bark is plural. Now we would say they bark. Okay. So as you can see by using he and they, you can kind of figure out if a verb is singular or plural. With that being said, let's take a look at question number 19 to see how we can apply this. So we have when writing the other black girl, 2021 novelist, Zakia Dalila Harris drew on her own experiences working at a publishing office. The award-winning book is Harris's first novel, but her writing blank honored before. Okay. In this case, we have her subject or our subject, which is writing. Okay, so writing is our subject. Writing is singular. Okay, so since writing is singular, we need to have a singular verb that matches that. So option A, were, well, we would say they were. We would not say he were. Okay, we would say he was, and we would say they were. So were is plural, so we can get rid of A since it's plural. I'll mark that with a P. Then we have have been. Well, we would say they have been, and we would say he has been. So as you can see, have been would have to also be plural, so we can mark that with a P. And then we have has been. Okay, we would say he has been. So as you can see, that would be singular. We would say they have been. Okay, so we can mark C as a singular verb. If we look at option D, we have are. We would say they are, and we would say he is. Okay, so D would be plural as well. Okay, so we can go ahead and get rid of that. We see our only answer choice here that is singular is option C. And we have to match the number of our verb to the number of our subject. Writing is singular, so our answer here has to be C. All right, let's keep moving. We've got indefinite pronouns. Okay. Indefinite pronouns such as everyone, someone, and no one take singular verbs. Here's an example. Everyone has their own opinion. The indefinite pronoun here is everyone and it's singular. The verb has is also going to have to be singular. Example number two, no one knows the answer. The indefinite pronoun no one is singular and the verb knows is singular. Okay. Now let's talk about compound subjects. When two subjects are joined by and, they usually will take a plural verb. An example of this would be John and Sarah are going to the party. Subjects John and Sarah are plural, so, so the verb are must also be plural. We would not say John and Sarah is going to the party because is is singular. We would have to use are, which is plural. Let's take a look at a second example. Apples and oranges are fruits. The subjects apples and oranges are plural, so the verb are must be used. And keep in mind, are is plural is is singular. Now let's talk about collective nouns. Collective nouns represent a group of individuals can take either a singular or a plural verb depending on the context. However, most commonly collective nouns take a singular verb. And I really want you to pay close attention to the fact that most commonly collective nouns do take a singular verb. Now, collective nouns utilize a singular verb when they act when the entity acts as a whole and a plural verb when the individual members of the entity act independently. So let's look at an example of this. The team is practicing for the game. The team collectively is practicing, so the verb is, is singular. 
Now, in example two, the team are in disagreement on the course of action. In this case, the people on the team disagree with each other, so they are acting independently, so the verb is plural. Okay, and if we scroll up, we can see that collective nouns will utilize a singular verb when the entity acts as a whole, as in example one. The team as a whole is practicing for the game, but in example two, it's the individual members of the entity that are acting independently in order to be in disagreement. Okay, so we would state that the team are in disagreement on the course of action. Now, once again, I want to stress that most commonly, as in example three, you will see that collective nouns will have a singular verb. So here's another one. Congress is discussing the bill. The collective noun Congress is singular since they are collectively discussing the bill. So the verb is must also be uh, singular. We would say Congress is discussing the bill, not Congress are discussing the bill. All right, now let's talk about intervening phrases. These are words or phrases that come between the subject and the verb, do not affect the agreement. Okay, so an example would be the cat along with its kittens sits by the window. The subject here is cat, it is not kittens. Okay, and cat is singular, so the verb sits must also be used. Okay, and sits is singular. Okay, we would say he sits, we would say they sit. Okay, so once again, you can use that he, they test as well if you're not sure if a verb is singular or plural. All right, let's take a look at example two. The boys, as well as their friends, are playing soccer. The subject is boys, which is plural, and the verb are is also going to be used since our subject is plural. We need to also have that plural verb. All right, let's take a look at an example question here. So we've got number 26. The classic children's board game Shoots and Ladders is a version of an ancient Nepalese game Parampapeta Sopa Nampata. In both games, players encounter good or bad spaces while traveling along a path. Landing on one of the good spaces, and then we have a verb, a player to skip ahead and arrive closer to the end goal. Let's identify the number of our subject. So we have landing on one of the good spaces. Well, on one of the good spaces is a prepositional phrase. Okay, we would ignore the prepositional phrase when identifying our subject. So our subject here is landing. Okay, landing is going to be singular. So I'm going to mark that with an S for singular. Now let's identify A through D, which ones are plural and which ones are singular. So we have allows. Well, we would say he allows and we would say they allow. Okay, so allows is singular since we would use it with he but not they. If we take a look at B, we have are allowing. We would state that they are allowing and he is allowing. Okay, so are right there, we have plural. Next, we have have allowed. We would state they have allowed and we would state he has allowed. So once again, C would be plural as well. If we look at option D, we would state he allows and we would state that they allow. Okay, so that would be plural there. Okay, we would say landing on one of the good spaces allows a player to skip ahead and arrive closer to the end goal. So as you can see, only option here that's singular for our verb is option A. And once again, we need to maintain that singularity in both our subject and our verb. They need to match. Okay, so our answer would have to be A. All right, now let's talk about pronoun usage. Okay, we have pronoun antecedent agreement. A pronoun must agree in number and gender with its antecedent. An example of this would be Sarah lost her keys. The feminine pronoun her agrees with the female antecedent Sarah. Let's look at example number two. The boys finished their homework. The plural pronoun there agrees with the plural antecedent boys. Okay, so pronoun usage there should be fairly simple. Let's take a look at a question to practice. We have question 19. Public awareness campaigns about the need to reduce single-use plastics can be successful, says researcher Kim Borg of Monash University in Australia. When these campaigns give consumers a choice, for example, Japan achieved a 40% reduction in plastic bag use after cashiers were instructed to ask customers whether blank wanted a bag. Well, let's identify our subject. Okay, our subject here would be customers. We know customers is plural. Okay, so we can scroll down here. So we've got customers, which is plural. If we look at our options, we've got four different pronouns. Okay, one is singular, you is singular, and it is singular, they is plural. We have to maintain, um, we have to match our number, okay, so we can get rid of options B, C, and D since they would not match in number with our subject. Okay, our subject is plural, that, or I'm sorry, our noun is plural, okay, the noun that we're referring to with our pronoun, that noun is plural. Since our noun is plural, plural our pronoun will also need to be plural. So our answer there would have to be answer choice A. All right, let's talk about ambiguous pronouns. Pronouns should have clear antecedents to avoid confusion. Here is an incorrect example. And as we go through these examples, try to pay attention to where I'm giving an incorrect example versus where I am giving a correct example. Because otherwise you may end up getting confused. I will try to make it as clear as I can as I go through this. So here would be an incorrect example. Sarah and Lisa went shopping and she bought a dress. 
The pronoun she is ambiguous. It's not clear whether it refers to Sarah or Lisa. Okay, so make sure that it's clear who you are referring back to if you are going to use a pronoun. Now, here is a correct example. Tom saw John and congratulated him. Okay, this one is admittedly not the greatest example, but it still works, and here's why. When we say that Tom saw John, okay, Tom is still our subject. Okay, he saw John. Okay, John is the object of the verb saw. Okay, so Tom saw John and congratulated him. Okay, this is clear that Tom saw John and Tom is the one congratulating John. Okay, the pronoun him is referring to the antecedent John. Okay, let's look at another example, and this one's a bit more clear. I gave Mary the book that she wanted. Okay, the pronoun she refers to the antecedent Mary. All right, let's go ahead and move on to pronoun case. Pronouns have different forms depending on their function in the sentence, subjective, objective, and possessive. So here's an example. I went to the store. The subjective pronoun I acts as the subject of the sentence. Let's look at example two. She gave him the gift. The objective pronoun him acts as the object of the verb gave. Now let's talk about pronoun reference. Pronouns should refer clearly and unambiguously to their intended antecedents. Here's an example. The man who won the race was happy. The pronoun who refers to the man who won the race. Here's another example. The dog that barked is mine. The pronoun that refers to the dog that barked. Now let's talk about modifier placement and comparison. Misplaced modifiers. Modifiers should be placed in near the words they modify to avoid ambiguity or confusion. Now here's an incorrect example followed by the correct example. I saw a giraffe with binoculars. The modifier with binoculars should be placed near I. Okay, in this example, it should be obvious that there's a mistake because you wouldn't have a draft that is using binoculars. It's the individual, I, the subject, who is actually the one using the binoculars. So we need to move with binoculars in front of I. Okay, so here's how we would correct that. With binoculars, I saw a draft. Let's take a look at example number two. Okay, so that once again, we'll start with the incorrect example. John caught the ball running quickly. The modifier running quickly should be placed near John. It's not the ball that is running quickly because a ball cannot run. It is John who is running quickly. Okay, so we need running quickly to refer uh, to be placed next to John. So here's how we would correct that. We'd state running quickly as an introductory modifier. John caught the ball. Okay, running quickly is being applied to John. Now let's talk about dangling modifiers. Modifiers should clearly modify the intended subject or noun. Here's an incorrect example. After finishing the project, the snack was devoured by John. Well, the snack is not what has finished the project. Okay, a snack cannot finish a project. Okay, John is the one who finishes the project. So the modifier after finishing the project should modify whoever finished the project, which is John, not the snack. So here's how we could correct that. After finishing the project, John ate a snack. In this case, we clearly have John being uh, what comes after this introductory modifier of after finishing the project. All right, let's go over another example. Riding the bike, the tree came into view. And once again, this is an incorrect example. The modifier riding the bike should modify whoever was riding the bike, not the tree, since a tree obviously cannot ride a bike. So here's how we could correct that. Riding the bike, John, Notice the tree came into view. So as we can see, we have our modifier modifying um, who is actually riding the bike. All right, let's take a look at this with a question. All right, so in 1453, English King Henry VI became unfit to rule after falling gravely ill. As a result, Parliament appointed Richard, third Duke of York, who had a strong claim to the English throne, to rule as Lord Protector. Upon recovering two years later, okay, so here we have an introductory modifier. Upon recovering two years later, well, we know the person who fell ill is King Henry, okay? So we need to have King Henry after this. So if you look at our options, we have Henry as what's being modified, the reign of Henry. It can't be the reign of Henry because Henry is the one who fell ill. So Henry is the one who will recover two years later. We have Henry's reign, okay? It's not his reign that is being modified. And it's not, it was Henry who resumed his reign, okay? It's not it. We need to modify Henry, okay? Henry needs to be what is immediately after that comma, Okay, so our answer there would have to be A. Now, this is a pretty common type of question on the digital SAT, so make sure you understand how to work with these introductory modifiers. All right, let's talk about comparative and superlative adjectives. Adjectives should be used correctly when comparing two or more items. So here's an example. This book is taller than that one. We're comparing the height of 
two books. Now, really what I'm trying to teach right here is pretty simple, right? If we're comparing two things, we would state that one is taller than the other. Now let's take a look at example two. If we're stating that we're comparing, you know, one to many, doing a one to many comparison is not a one to one comparison. So in this case, in example two, we have, she is the smartest student in the class. We're comparing the intelligence of students in the class. So this is a one to many comparison. We're comparing the one, which is she, to all of the students in the class. So we would state she is the smartest student in the class. All right, parallel comparisons. Comparisons should be parallel in structure. Here's an example. She likes to run, swim, and hike. Okay, so this one isn't really a comparison. This one's just a list of activities. So we want to maintain parallelism. We would not say she likes to run, swimming, and hiked, right? We would want to maintain parallelism to this. So she likes to run, swim, and hike. Example two, the company is efficient, reliable, and customer oriented. This is a parallel list of qualities of the company. Now let's talk about double comparisons. Avoid using two comparative forms in the same sentence. So this kind of goes back to the school example. So an incorrect example would be, she is more talented than any other student in the school, okay? Now, a much better way to say this would be, she is the most talented student in the school. As you can see, it cuts down on the wordiness. And also, since we're doing a one-to-many comparison, Okay, we would want to state that she is the most talented student in the school, not that she is more talented than any other student in the school, okay? Because that just adds on wordiness. We wanna be as concise as we can. So our answer there would have to be, she is the most talented student in the school. All right, now let's talk about parallelism. Parallel structure in list. Items in a list should be presented in parallel form. We've kind of talked about this already, but I wanna go a little bit further with it. So we have, as an example, he likes to read, write, and listen to music. Okay, so parallel list of activities, read, write, and listen. The chef prepared a delicious appetizer, main course, and dessert. This is a parallel list of dishes. Now let's talk about parallel structure in comparison. So this is where we get into that comparisons that we didn't really touch on as much earlier. When making comparisons, the elements being compared should have parallel structures. Here's an example. The company is as successful as it is innovative. We're comparing success and innovation, which are two, um, two qualities that can describe uh, the company. All right. Example two, she is not only a talented singer, but also a skilled dancer. Okay. We're comparing talent in singing and dancing. Now, you want to pay attention to that structure. You want to maintain parallel structure. So let's talk about parallel structure and clauses. Clauses should maintain parallel structure to enhance clarity and coherence. Example, once again, we have a parallel list of activities. She likes to swim, to run, and to play tennis. So now we have to swim, to run, and to play. Okay, now, I know I'm stressing parallelism a lot. That's because it's pretty important on the digital SAT writing section. I will, um, I will say that compared to the paper SAT, it seems like parallelism has been um, showing up a little bit less often on the digital SAT practice test than it did on the paper SAT. Um, but that's just something that I've noticed. Um, anyways, let's talk about example number two. He wants to travel, to explore, and to experience new cultures. We have a parallel list of desires. All right, now let's talk about verb tenses. Proper use of verb tenses. Verb tenses indicate the time at which an action takes place. It is important to use the appropriate verb tense to convey the correct time frame. All right, so let's talk about the future simple tense. I will go to the party tomorrow. This is future simple tense, it indicates a future action. Let's talk about example number two. They have already finished their homework. This is present perfect tense. It indicates an action completed in the past with a present result. Now let's talk about sequencing events. Verb tenses help to indicate the chronological order of events. Choose the appropriate verb tense to accurately represent the sequence of actions. Here's an example. She finished her meal and then paid the bill. This is past simple tense. It indicates actions completed in the past. Another example, he had left before I arrived. This is past perfect tense. It indicates an action completed before another past action. Okay, so the first past action that's completed is he had left, okay, and then the next past action would be before I arrived. Okay, so I arrived. Now let's talk about consistency in verb tenses. Maintaining consistency in verb tenses throughout a sentence or paragraph helps to ensure clarity and coherence. And this is something that is commonly tested on the SAT writing section, so you do really wanna pay attention to this part right here. So let's talk about an example. She walks to work every day and always arrives on time. This is present simple tense, it indicates a habitual action. The way you might see this tested on the digital SAT writing section would be that arrives would be an answer option and it would be left blank. 
on the digital SAT writing section. So you would have, she walks to work every day and always blank on time. And you would have to recognize that you have walks as your verb tense in the sentence. And you have to match the verb tense then of your answer choice, which would be arrives here. So that's one of the ways that you could see this tested. Let's give another example. The team played well, but they lost the game. This is past simple tense and it indicates a past event. So once again, the way you would likely see this tested is lost or played might be left out as a blank, and then you'd have to recognize your verb that is left. So in this case, let's say that loss was left out as a blank, you would recognize that you have played, which is the past simple tense, and then you would need to select your answer choice that represents the past uh, simple tense as well. All right, let's talk about more complex verb tenses. So we have future perfect. The future perfect tense is used to express an action that will be completed before a specific point in the future. An example would be, by this time next year, I will have graduated from college. Future perfect tense is indicating an action completed in the future before another future event. All right, let's talk about the conditional tense. The conditional tense is used to express actions that are dependent on a condition or hypothetical situations. An example is, if it rained, we would have stayed indoors. So once again, this is conditional tense expresses a hypothetical situation. Okay, in this case, the hypothetical situation is if it rained. Past perfect tense. The past perfect tense is used to express an action completed before another past action or a specific point in the past. An example is, she had already finished the book before the movie was released. Once again, this is past perfect tense, indicates an action completed before another past event. Let's talk about the conditional perfect. Okay, Conditional perfect tense is used to express hypothetical actions that would have been completed under certain conditions. An example is, if they had studied harder, so that is the hypothetical um, action, they would have passed the exam. So conditional perfect tense expresses a hypothetical situation in the past. So the condition here is if they had studied harder, then what would have happened is they would have passed the exam. So once again, the condition is if they had studied harder, what would have happened is they would have passed the exam. So there's the conditional perfect. Now we have the present perfect continuous. The present perfect continuous tense is used to express ongoing actions that started in the past and continue into the present. An example is, they have been playing tennis all morning. So once again, this is present perfect continuous, continuous tense it indicates an ongoing action starting in the past and continuing into the present. Okay, so they began, okay, this action started in the past, they began playing tennis in the past, and it's continuing into the present. They have been playing tennis all morning. Past perfect continuous. The past perfect continuous tense is used to express ongoing actions that started and continued in the past before another past event. An example is, he had been working at the company for five years before he was promoted. Okay, so once again, we are expressing ongoing actions that started and continued in the past before another past event. Okay, so he had started working at the company before this past event. Okay, so he started and continued working at the company four or five years before he was promoted, which is the past event. All right, by understanding the nuances of different verb tenses, you can accurately convey the time frame, sequence, and continu continuity of events in your writing. All right, let's talk about sentence structure. So let's start with run-on sentences. And run-on sentences are very commonly tested on the digital SAT writing section, so you do need to pay close attention here. You wanna avoid run-on sentences by properly separating independent clauses, and we'll talk about how to do that later on. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple examples first. So we have, I walked to the store, comma, and I bought some groceries. I walked to the store is an independent clause. I bought some groceries is another independent clause. We can connect two independent clauses with a comma and one of the fanboys, which are for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. All right, let's talk about, uh, or next example, she studied hard for the test, but she still failed. Okay, so she studied hard for the test, it's an independent clause, and then we have a comma, and one of the fanboys, in this case, but, and then we have she still failed, which is also an independent clause. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to comma splices. Okay, do not use a comma to join two independent clauses without a coordinating conjunction or appropriate punctuation. Here's an incorrect example. I studied all night, I passed the exam. Here we have a comma splice because we are trying to connect two independent clauses with only a comma and without one of the fanboys. 
Okay, so that's an incorrect. Here's how we can correct that. We would state, I studied all night, comma, and I passed the exam. Now, a second incorrect example would be, he ran fast, he lost the race. He ran fast as an independent clause, he lost the race as an independent clause. Here's how we could correct this. He ran fast, comma, but he lost the race. So let me quickly touch on how you can kind of know when to use which coordinating conjunctions. And if you hear coordinating conjunctions, just think the fanboys. Okay, the fanboys are the most common examples of coordinating conjunctions. Okay, so how would we know to use but here instead of something like so or yet? Well, he ran fast. If he ran fast, we would expect him to win the race, but he lost the race. So this is a contrast to what would be expected, so we could use but in this case. Let's take a look at fragments. So you want to ensure that sentences have a subject and a verb and are not incomplete. Once again, you want your sentences to be complete. So let's look at an incorrect example. After finishing the race. Okay, this would be a sentence fragment. It is not a complete idea. It is not a complete sentence. If you look at the correct version of that, it would be after finishing the race, I felt tired. I felt tired is an independent clause. Okay, after finishing the race is referring to I. Okay, so that's a complete sentence. Let's look at incorrect example number two, running towards the finish line. Okay, we don't know who is running towards the finish line. This isn't a complete thought. If we look at how we would correct that, we would have running towards the finish line, I felt exhilarated. Okay, in this case, we are referring to I, we are modifying I. All right, looking at D, dependent clauses. Dependent clauses can't stand alone as complete sentences and must be attached to an independent clause. Okay, and let me zoom in. Okay, so dependent clauses can't stand alone as complete sentences, must be attached to an independent clause. An example of this, although it was raining hard, or although it was raining, they went for a walk. Okay, although it was raining is a dependent clause. Okay, it cannot stand alone as a complete sentence. All right, example number two, when the bell rings, class ends. When the bell rings is the dependent clause there. Okay. It cannot stand on its own as a sentence. Now let's talk about independent clauses. Independent clauses can stand alone as complete sentences. An example would be, I went to the store. That is a complete thought. It's a complete idea. It has a subject and a finite verb. If we look at example number two, the sun was shining brightly. Okay, That is also a complete sentence. Now let's talk about sentence logic and clarity. Eliminating redundancy. This is something that was very, very commonly tested on the paper writing section. Uh, now that the SAT has moved digital, I haven't been seeing it tested quite as much, but it is still something that's important to know. Okay, you have eliminating redundancy, remove unnecessary repetition in sentences to improve clarity and conciseness. So here is an incorrect example, and there's a few of these that I'll go over. So starting with, I saw him with my own eyes. With my own eyes is redundant. If I say I saw him, the only way I can do that is with my own eyes. So we'd correct that by just stating, I saw him. Okay, now here's two other examples that I think are a little bit more similar to what you could see on the digital SAT writing section. So one option would be, I ran home to Megan. Megan is my sister. Eliminate the redundancy of saying Megan back to back. Okay, so here's how we could do that. We would state, I ran home to Megan, comma, my sister. Okay, my sister is describing who Megan is. And by doing this, we're able to repeat stating Megan back to back. So we can get rid of that. And we can also eliminate having to use is by just using that comma. Here's another incorrect example. The teacher explained the concept briefly in a short manner. Okay, Briefly and in a short manner mean the same thing. So we would only want to use one of those. And the most concise way to do that would be to get rid of in a short manner and just say briefly. So as you can see in the correct example, we could state the teacher explained the concept briefly. All right, let's talk about clarity of pronoun reference. You want to ensure that pronouns have clear and unambiguous antecedents. So we've kind of already touched on this. Let's just go over it again. Okay, an incorrect example would be after Sarah told Rachel the bad news, she was very upset. It's unclear if she refers to Sarah or Rachel. The correct example would be after Sarah told Rachel the bad news, Rachel was very upset. Okay, here's two more correct examples. John gave the book to Mary and she read it. The pronoun it refers to the book. The pronoun she will refer back to Mary. All right, another example would be the dog followed its owner, wagging its tail happily. Well, obviously the dog would be what's referring to by its. Logical comparison. You wanna make logical and meaning comparisons in sentences. And what this is really talking about is you wanna make sure you're comparing like to like. So as an example, apples are healthier than donuts. We're comparing food to food. An example two, the flight was longer than the duration of the sunset. 
Okay, in this case, it's presumed that we're talking about the flight's duration. We're comparing that to the duration of the sunset. Okay, if we look at option C or example C, Sweden's obesity rate is less than that of the United States. And example three is one that I think is really important to highlight. Okay, when we say Sweden's obesity rate is less than that of the United States, the key part I want you to pay attention to here is that we included that of. If we were to say Sweden's obesity rate is less than the United States, that's not as good as if we state Sweden's obesity rate is less than that of the United States, because by adding that of, okay, we know that we're referring to the obesity rate of the United States, which is more clear than if we just say Sweden's obesity rate is less than the United States. All right, let's talk about appropriate word choice. You want to use words that accurately convey the intended meaning in a sentence. An example is, the book he purchased was truly captivating. The word captivating accurately describes the engaging nature of the book. Now on the digital SAT, you'll more commonly see word choice questions like this show up actually towards the, um, on the on the digital SAT practice test, it's been towards the beginning of the sections. And it's also, in my opinion, um, categorized more so in actually the reading section because it's more so about the word in context. But I did still want to touch on it here because you do still need to understand words in context in order to be able to answer questions on the writing section. Now, some of you guys may be wondering at this point, you know, what's the difference sort of between reading and writing on the digital SAT since they're all sort of combined into the same section. And it's really just about the classification of the different questions. So some questions can be classified more as reading questions, even though it's within the reading and writing section, which is now combined section. And some questions can be more confined um, to testing your writing abilities. So when I'm talking about Writing questions, I'm talking about questions that are specifically designed to test your writing ability. When I talk about reading questions, I'm talking about reading questions that are specifically designed to test your reading comprehension, your understanding of words and context and things like that. Um, so even though they are combined into the same sections, they do. there are still questions that are more so testing writing and some that are more so testing reading. But anyways, here's example number two. It was an incredibly grueling marathon. The word grueling conveys the extreme difficulty and exhaustion associated with the marathon. Next, we have idioms and diction, prepositions. So let's talk about the appropriate use of idioms. You wanna use idiomatic expressions correctly to convey the intended meaning. An example would be, she passed away. It's an idiomatic expression for she died. They got along well. That's an idiomatic expression for they had a good relationship. I'll talk about correct preposition choice. And this is what um, you might see more commonly on the digital SAT writing section. So using the correct preposition in phrases and expressions. An example would be, she is afraid of spiders, okay? The preposition here would be afraid of. So you could have options that are um, afraid in, um, afraid with, but obviously you would state that she is afraid of spiders. So when we're talking about preposition choice, this is the way that um, it could show up. So example two is I am interested in playing the piano, okay? So in this case, we are looking at in, okay? Interested in playing the piano, okay? So the preposition there would be in. Um, and now let's talk about uh, proper use of prepositional phrases. So something that is just generally very useful to recognize on the digital SAT writing section is prepositional phrases. I've already kind of talked about how you need to get rid of them when you're determining your subject, um, which is helpful for matching the number of your subject to the number of your verb. Uh, using prepositional phrases accurately to provide additional information about the subject or object of a sentence. An example of this would be the cat is sitting on the chair. So on the chair is the prepositional phrase. She walked through the forest, through the forest would be the prepositional phrase there. Now we can talk about punctuation, apostrophes. You want to use apostrophes to indicate possession or contraction. An example would be John's car is old. We have an apostrophe for possession since the car belongs to John. Next, we have it's raining outside. This is an apostrophe used for contraction because it's, in this case, is it is. We would say it is raining outside. Example three, the children's toys were scattered all over the room. This is an apostrophe being used for plural possession. Children is already plural, so we would add on the apostrophe s to indicate that it's possessive of the toys. Example four, these are the cat's bowls. Okay, cats with an s is the plural version of cat. Then we need to add an apostrophe onto the end of that to indicate that it is the cat's bowls. Okay, there is a possessive relationship there. If we look at example number five, we're going to the park. This is an apostrophe for contraction. The contraction would be we are to were. If we look at example six, they're my best friends. This is an apostrophe for contraction. They're being the contraction of they are. Now let's talk about semicolons and periods. This is something that's obviously very important to understand. Uh, so we have use semicolons to separate independent clauses or, or, or to separate items in a series that already contain commas. 
Okay, and you are going to see kind of both of these uses on the JLSAT writing section. Uh, you want to use periods at the end of a complete sentence. So an example would be, I went to the store with a semicolon, I bought some milk and bread. Okay, so we have two independent clauses that we're connecting with a semicolon. So semicolon separates independent clauses. Example number two, my best friends are John, who is a lawyer, Mary, who is a nurse, and Tom, who is a teacher. In this case, we have a semicolon separating items in a series that already contain commas. So as you can see, we state name, comma, and then occupation, who is a lawyer, Mary, comma, who is a nurse, Tom, comma, who is a teacher. So in this case, within the list itself, we have commas. So we would actually use semicolons to separate each item in that list. Example three, I haven't been feeling well. I think I might have the flu. So we would use a semicolon to separate these two independent clauses. If you look at example four, the museum exhibit includes paintings from Van Gogh, the Dutch artist, Monet, the French impressionist, and Klimt, the Australian symbolist. Okay, in this case, semicolon uh, separates items in a series that already contain commas. Okay, so if we scroll up, example four is similar to example two. Example number five, she couldn't make it to the party. She was caught up with work. So in this case, we're splitting up two independent clauses with a period. If we look at example six, the weather was perfect for a walk. It was mildly sunny with a cool breeze. We're using a period to separate two independent clauses there as well. All right, let's give an example here with question number 23. John Hinson, director of language revitalization program of the Chickasaw Nation in Oklahoma, helped produce the world's first indigenous language instructional app, Chickasaw Blank. And then we have Chickasaw TV in 2010 and a Rosetta Stone language course in 2015. So what you'll see here is we have this list and we are using a comma before we state the date. Okay, so we have comma before we state the date. So if we scroll down to our answer choices, we need to look for one that has a comma before we state the date. So we can get rid of A and B since they use semicolons here and here. Then if we look at the differences between C and D, we see that the differences are right here, whether or not we use a semicolon or a comma after the year. Now, if we scroll up, we see that after the year, we are using a semicolon, okay? We're using a semicolon to split up this list of items where a comma is used with each item, okay? So after 2009, we need to have that semicolon, okay? So our answer there would have to be C. All right, let's talk about commas. You wanna use commas to separate items in a series after introductory phrases, to set off non-essential clauses or phrases, and to separate coordinate adjectives. An example is I bought apples, oranges, and bananas at the store. A comma separates the items in a series. Example two, however, comma, they still manage to win the game. A comma after an introductory phrase is what we're using there. All right, colons. You wanna use colons to introduce a list to separate clauses when the second clause explains or amplifies the first or to introduce a quote or example. So here's an example. The ingredients for the recipe are flour, sugar, eggs, and milk. In this case, we have a colon introducing a list. Example two, he had one thought in mind to succeed. In this case, we have a colon separating clauses. Example number three, we have her dream was simple yet profound, to travel the world and discover herself in the process. In this case, the colon introduces a clause that elaborates and explains the dream mentioned in the preceding clause. An example three and example one are really the two best examples of what you could see for the use of a colon on the digital SAT writing section. In particular, example three, okay? But both of them are really the way that you would kind of see this show up on the, on the digital SAT writing section. So uh, example three is one that I want to talk a little bit more about. So let's just go ahead and discuss it. Her dream was simply yet profound to travel the world and discover herself in the process. If your second clause is illustrating, explaining, or describing what came before it, that's a very common case where you're going to want to use a colon. Okay. So I want to, I want to really focus in on that, that when your second clause explains or amplifies the first, that's a situation where you're going to want to use a colon. All right, let's talk about dashes. So you'll use dashes to set off parenthetical elements or to emphasize certain words or phrases. Example would be the car dash, a bright red sports car dash caught everyone's attention. Okay, in this case, a bright red sports car is non-essential. You could state the car caught everyone's attention and it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence. If we look at example two, she was determined against all odds to finish the race. Okay, in this case, we are emphasizing against all odds. All right, if we take a look at adjectives and adverbs, we wanna know proper use of adjectives. So you'll use adjectives to describe or modify nouns. An example would be, she wore a beautiful dress to the party. In this case, the adjective beautiful is describing the noun dress. Another example would be the tall building can be seen from miles away. The adjective tall is describing the noun building. 
So I want proper use of adverbs. So you'll use adverbs to modify verbs, adjectives, or other adverbs. An example would be, he ran quickly to catch the bus. The adverb quickly is modifying the verb ran. Another example would be, she spoke softly to avoid waking the baby. The adverb softly is modifying the verb spoke. All right, let's talk about word pairs. So we need to know commonly confused words. So use appropriate words and avoid common mistakes in word usage. So let's talk about a few examples, and then I have a list that I'll kind of run through of some commonly confused words. So we have example one, their dog is friendly. This is the correct possessive pronoun, okay? So it's T-H-E-I-R when you want a possessive pronoun. Now in contrast, if we look at example number two, we have they, apostrophe, R-E, going to the party, okay? They're going to the party. This is a contraction of they are. So you need to understand the difference between T-H-E-I-R and T-H-E-Y, apostrophe, R-E. This is a contraction for they are. Let's look at example uh, one again. We have accept the invitation to agree to something, okay? So the version of accept with an A at the start. If we look at example two, we have accept for him, except with an E here, everyone attended the meeting. Now accept, E-X-C-E-P-T, is excluding someone. Let's look at our next example. Your advice is helpful. Well, in this case, we have the noun advice. If you look at example number two, I advise with an S, not a C, you to listen to his instruction. Okay, this is a verb. All right, so now we have a list of word pairs that you should know, which I'll quickly go over. We have accept versus accept, which I discussed above, effect, which is to influence, versus effect, which is a result, complement, which is something that completes versus compliment, which is praise. For example, I give a compliment to someone when I say I like their shoes. Next, we have elicit, which is to draw out, versus illicit, which is forbidden by law. It's, which is a possessive form of it, versus it apostrophe s, it's, which is a contraction of it is. We have principle, which is main, versus the principle, or versus principle, which is a fundamental belief or rule. So example would be life principles, right? Fundamental beliefs about life. Stationary, not moving. Stationary, writing materials. Then, used in comparisons. Then, at a time, or at that time. There, T-H-E-I-R, possessive form of they. Uh, there, T-H-E-R-E, is in that place. And there, T-H-E-Y, apostrophe R-E, which is a contraction of they are. Two, is a preposition, to, which is also or excessively, and then to, which is the number. Your, which is a possessive form of you, and your, with an apostrophe R-E, which is a contraction of you are. Let's talk about who, which, and whom. We have the proper use of who versus whom. You use who to refer to the subject of a sentence and whom to refer to the object of a verb or preposition. So an example is, who is the man who fixed my car? Well, the subject of the verb fixed. Example two, to whom should I address the letter, the object of the preposition to? All right, so let's talk about the he, him trick. This is really what I want to use to highlight the who versus whom because it makes things a bit simpler. It can help you determine whether to use who or whom in a sentence. So let's use example number one, okay? So if the answer to this question could be he, then we'll use who. If the answer to the question could be him, then we'll use whom, okay? So who is the man who fixed my car? Well, we could state he is the man who fixed my car. Okay, so we would state who instead of whom. Okay, so he asked the question, who fixed my car? The answer is he fixed my car. So we would use who. Example number two, to whom should I address the letter? Well, we can ask the question, should I address the letter to him? We wouldn't state, should I address the letter to he? We would say, should I address the letter to him? So because of that, we would want to use whom there. Okay, so that's the that is the, the he, him test that you can use, okay? So once again, that's the, the he, him test. All right, using the he, him trick makes it easier to decide whether to use who or whom based on the role the word plays in the sentence. Proper use of which. You use which to introduce non-restrictive clauses and that to introduce restrictive clauses. So when you think non-restrictive versus restrictive, Another way to think about that is essential versus non-essential. So if we take a look at example one, the car, which is red, belongs to John. If we were to remove which is red, we would have the car belongs to John. That doesn't substantially change the meaning of the sentence. Okay, so that's fine. If you look at option two, or example two, the car, that is red, belongs to John. Well, this is restrictive because we are restricting the car to the one that is red. 
Okay, we're not just stating the car belongs to John, we're stating the card that is red. So presumably this is in a series of multiple cars of different colors, and we are stating it is the one that is red. So this is restrictive to just the car that is red. Okay, so that's the difference between non-restrictive and restrictive. All right, let's talk about distinguishing between these two. Understand the difference between clauses that are necessary for understanding the sentence and those that provide additional information. Example one, the book that she borrowed is on the shelf. Okay, that she borrowed is restrictive. It's restricting which book it is. It is the book that she borrowed. If you look at example two, her car, which is blue, is parked outside. This is non-restrictive. We are just adding in more information, but we're not restricting which car it is. If we were to state her car that is blue is parked outside, then we would be restricting car, but we're not in this case. We're just providing additional information, so it's non-essential. All right, let's talk about transitions. Using transition words and phrases effectively. Use transitional words and phrases to create coherence and a smooth flow between ideas and paragraphs. Example one, first we went to the store, then we went to the park. Okay, so first would be a transition here, and then we have then, so we're indicating a sequential progression. Example two, however, some people disagree with this viewpoint. In this case, we are providing a contrast with however. We want to coherently connect ideas and paragraphs. Ensure that ideas and paragraphs are logically connected to maintain coherence in writing. Example number one, the first reason for this decision is financial. Okay, so we're stating the first reason, and then we have additionally, it aligns with our long-term goals. So we are providing a second reason, therefore we would use additionally because we're adding on. If we look at example two, in conclusion, there are several factors to consider when making this decision. So in conclusion would be our transition there. We want to maintain a smooth flow and logical progression in writing. Okay, and I'll go over a bunch of transitions I want you to know uh, in a bit here, but for now, let's keep talking. Organize ideas and sentences to ensure a logical progression, smooth flow of information. So to begin with, we analyze the data. Next, we identified the trends. Finally, we drew conclusions. So in this case, since we would start with to begin with, and we have next, an example question that you could see is you would have to answer what transition should be here. You would notice that we are going in a sequence. So you'd want to use finally if we are at the last part of that sequence. Okay, we drew conclusions. Example two, moreover, it is important to consider the potential consequences before taking action. So in that case, that'd be something that we are adding on to. All right, so here's some common SAT writing transitions along with example sentences. So first off, let's start by talking about introductory. So examples would be to begin with, first and foremost, in the first place, initially. So an example would be initially, we conducted a thorough analysis of the data. Next, let's talk about addition and continuation. This is very common. Additionally, furthermore, moreover, in addition to, also, moreover. So an example would be, furthermore, the results of the study support our hypothesis. Let's talk about contrast, another very common one. We have, however, on the other hand, conversely, nevertheless, nonetheless, yet, instead, and in contrast. Okay, in contrast is a very common one. Same with however. So in this case, for our example, we have however, some people may hold a different viewpoint on this issue. So a different viewpoint than what was discussed previously. So that would indicate to us that we would be looking for a contrast there. Next, let's talk about cause and effect. So we would state in our previous sentence that we had some sort of cause, and then in the sentence that we're transitioning to, we have our effect. So as a result, stating as a result of what came before, consequently, as a consequence of what came before. Therefore, thus, for this reason, hence, so consequently, so as a consequence of what came before, thus what came after. Consequently, the company experienced significant growth. So before this, we would probably expect to have something like the company changed um, its leadership to focus on growth or something like that. And then as a result of them changing the leadership, the company experienced significant growth. All right, sequence and time. Uh, this one's also fairly common, so you would use this if you are going in sort of a progression. So we have next, then, subsequently, or in other words, what came after, or you know, the next thing. Uh, afterward, meanwhile, simultaneously, simultaneously would be at the same time. Finally, eventually, ultimately, an example would be afterward, we proceeded to analyze the gathered data. All right, now let's talk about how you would transition if you are giving an example. So you would use for instance to illustrate specifically a case in point as an example to demonstrate. An example of this would be for instance. So you will, you will often see for instance or for example. Those are probably the two most common versions of this. So for instance, many successful companies started as small startups. Okay, so before this, we could have some sort of claim that um, 
successful companies don't just arise from spinoffs of large corporations. And then we say, for instance, many successful companies started as small startups. Obviously, small startups is different from a spinoff from a major corporation. Okay, so we'd be providing an example to that claim. All right, question number or number seven, comparing and contrasting. So we've already kind of talked about contrasting. Okay, in this case, we'll talk about comparing. There are some in here that are kind of repeats from contrasting, but um, this is kind of two very similar things. So I did categorize them together. So we have similarly, okay, so if something's similar to what came before it, likewise, pretty much the same as similar there, if something is like what came before it, in the same way, very similar to the first two. On the contrary, so this would be contrast, however, which is a contrast, conversely, which is a contrast, in contrast, which is obviously a contrast, and then on the other hand, which is also a contrast, okay, in this case, likewise, we are doing something that's similar, okay, so likewise, the second study also found users preferred option A to option B, so presumably the sentence that came before it would be something stating that we had study A, or the first study found users preferred option A to option B, okay, and then we're stating likewise, the second study also found users preferred option A to option B. All right, summary and conclusion. So in conclusion, to sum up overall, in summary, okay, so an example would be in conclusion, the findings strongly support our hypothesis. So you would use these if you are coming to a conclusion or you are stating a summary of what came before. All right, emphasis, okay, some examples of emphasis would be indeed, okay, indeed is probably the most common example of emphasis. You have notably, specifically, in fact, and particularly, an example would be indeed the data supports the hypothesis that was initially proposed. Finally, we have a comparison of options. Some examples would be whereas, okay, so we'd state something that came before it, and then if we have another option, we would state whereas option, for an example would be, we would state option one is a mediocre option, whereas option two is a superior option. Next, we have in contrast to, so once again, that can also be used as a comparison of two different things. On the other hand, once again, that can also be used as a comparison and as a, as a contrast. Alternatively, okay, you'd provide some sort of alternative, something that came before it, and then conversely, which once again can be used as a contrast as well. Okay, an example would be alternatively, we can consider a different approach to solve this problem. Remember, transitions are not just words or phrases to be inserted randomly in your writing. Okay, they need to actually serve a purpose. Okay, they serve as signposts to guide your reader through your ideas, helping to create a logical and coherent flow. All right, lastly, let's talk about subjunctives. Subjunctives are used to express hypothetical or unreal situations, wishes, recommendations, and emotions. Here's a more detailed explanation of when and how to use subjunctives. All right, number one, use of were and hypothetical statements. In hypothetical or contrary to fact situations, use were instead of was after the pronouns I, he, she, and it. Okay, example one, if I were a bird, I would fly freely in the sky. We wouldn't state if I was a bird, we would state if I were a bird. I would fly freely in the sky. Okay, keep in mind this is a hypothetical. Obviously, I am not a bird. If you look at example two, she speaks as if she were the queen. Okay, once again, this is a hypothetical, as if. Okay, she's not actually the queen. So we'd state she speaks as if she were the queen. Okay, keep in mind that this is different from what you'd expect when you're just straight up matching the number of your verb to the number of your subject, because obviously, if we were just doing that, we would state she was, but we have to take account for the fact that this is a subjunctive. We are in a hypothetical, okay, as if she were the queen. She's not actually the queen. This is a hypothetical. So we have to keep in mind that we need to use were instead of was after the pronouns I, he, she, and it. All right, number two, use use of the base form of the verb after certain verbs. After certain verbs of recommendation, request, suggestion, or necessity, use the base form of the verb infinitive without to to express the subjunctive mood. An example would be, it is important that he arrive on time. Once again, this is a this is a difference from when you are just strictly matching the number of your subject to the number of your verb. If we would state he arrives and we would state they arrive, but because we are in the subjunctive, we would state it is important that he arrive on time. Okay, so once again, you need to pay close attention to if you're in the subjunctive or if you are not. Example number two, the teacher insisted that we study for the exam. Okay, now let's talk about the use of past subjunctive form for wishes or desires. So when expressing wishes or desires about unreal or unlikely situations in the past or in the present or past, use the subjunctive form of the verb. I wish I were taller. It would be an example of that. Example two, she wishes she, wishes she had studied harder for the test. All right, number four, use of were to for unlikely or hypothetical future events. To indicate unlikely or hypothetical future events, use the phrase were to, followed by the base form of the verb. Now, if you are 
someone who grew up in the U.S. Um, and who you know spoke English you know throughout their childhood, this should come pretty naturally. Okay, an example would be. If it were to rain tomorrow, we would have we would have to cancel the picnic. Okay, so once again, we are in that hypothetical. Okay, and in this case, we are in the hypothetical future event. Okay, if it were to rain tomorrow, future, we would have to cancel the picnic. Suppose I were to win the lottery, what would you do? Once again, this would be a hypothetical future event. Okay, if I were suppose I were to win the lottery, that's future and hypothetical. So we'd say I were to. Okay, it's important to use subjunctives carefully. And appropriately in formal writing, subjunctives are often used in more formal or literary texts and can add depth and nuance to your writing. By understanding when and how to use subjunctives, you can effectively convey hypothetical situations, wishes, recommendations, and emotions in your writing. All right, this SAT writing guide covers the various aspects of grammar, sentence structure, word usage, punctuation, and coherence in writing. It's important to study and understand these rules in order to improve writing skills and achieve a higher score on the SAT writing section. And I will add on to that that it's important to practice and get practice and reps under your belt, seeing these questions and applying what was covered here. Now let's talk about how to approach different types of SAT writing questions. By knowing which approach you want to use for certain questions, you'll be able to be more efficient and comfortable when taking the test. Here's how I recommend that you approach questions on the digital SAT writing section that ask you to complete the text so it conforms to the conventions of standard English. What I want you to do is take a look at your answer choices first and identify what you ultimately need to discover or identify as you do your initial read through in order to answer the question. So in this case, when we glance at our answer choices, we see that they are all pronouns. They, one, you and it are all pronouns. So now what I'm going to do is as I do my read through, I'm going to be looking for what the noun is that I'd be replacing with this pronoun. So let's go ahead and read through. We have public awareness campaigns about the need to reduce single-use plastics can be successful, says researcher Kim Borg of Monash University in Australia. When these campaigns give consumers a choice, for example, Japan achieved a 40% reduction in plastic bag use after cashiers were instructed to ask customers whether, and now we have a pronoun here, blank wanted a bag. Well, we'd be asking the customers whether they want a bag. Okay, and as you can see, customers is plural. And since customers is plural, the pronoun that replaces it cannot be singular. So our answer would have to be A, since that is the only pronoun out of A, B, C, and D, which is plural. So as you can see, by recognizing what we need to identify during our read through, we're able to be more efficient on the writing section. Here's a second example of how I recommend approaching questions that ask you to complete the text so it conforms to the conventions of standard English. So same approach, you're going to start by looking at your answer choices, identify what the difference is between all of them. In this case, we see it's punctuation. So now what we're going to be looking for as we go through the text and read it is do we have an independent clause before this punctuation? Do we have an independent clause after it? What kind of phrase or clause do we have after it? What kind of phrase or clause do we have before it? So we have, in ancient Greece, an Epicurean was a follower of Epicurus, a philosopher whose beliefs revolved around the pursuit of pleasure. Epicurus defined pleasure as the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul. Okay, so that's an independent clause. Next, we have positing that all of life, that all life's virtues derived from this absence. That is not an independent clause. Okay, that's a participial phrase. Now, one thing you can note is that if you have something that, or a phrase that ends in, or if you have a word that ends in ing or ed that starts off a phrase, okay, there's a decent chance you might be looking at a participial phrase. So understand that. So in this case, we have this ing, okay, so that's indicative that you should be looking for a participial phrase. And in this case, we do have one. Now, a participial phrase is not an independent clause. So since it's not an independent clause, we can get rid of d. Next, between b and c, we see that one uses a colon, one uses a semicolon. However, when you're connecting a participial phrase to a main clause, you would either use a comma, an M dash or no punctuation if it's if it's already integrated. Okay, so you would not be using a colon or a semicolon. In this case, we use a comma, which is perfect. Okay, so our answer would have to be A. So once again, key thing to recognize with a question like this, which is just the question type of complete the text or conform to the conventions of standard English, begin by taking a look at your answer choices, identify the differences, identify what you need to look for before you do your read through of the text, and then as you do your read through of the text, identify what it is that you were searching for. In this case, it's was there an independent clause um, before this punctuation? Is there an independent clause or what kind of phrase are we dealing with afterwards? And then identify the correct punctuation for that. Because this question type is so common on the digital SAT writing section, I want to give a third example of it. So we have which choice completes the text so it conforms to the conventions of standard English. It'll begin by taking a look at your answer choices again. In this case, we see the difference is whether we're using they are, it is, their, which is plural and possessive, its, which is singular and possessive. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. We'll go through, we'll identify what we're looking for. In this case, we're looking for what is the number of our subject and is it possessive, okay? So we've got British scientists James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize in part for their 1953 paper announcing the double helix structure of DNA. But it is misleading to say that Watson and Crick discovered the double helix. 
Okay, and then we have Blank's findings were based on a famous X-ray image of DNA fibers, Photo 51, developed by X-ray crystallographer Rosalind Franklin and her graduate student Raymond Gosling. Well, the subject is Watson and Crick, okay? So two people, so we have a plural subject, so we can get rid of B and we can get rid of D. Now keep in mind that it is their findings. They do own the findings, it is possessive. So plural and possessive means our answer there would have to be C. Option A is they are, which is not possessive. Okay, option C is plural possessive, so our answer there would have to be C. Because this question type on the digital SAT writing section is so common, I'm gonna go ahead and give a few more examples. So we have answer choices A through D is where we're gonna start. We're gonna identify the differences between them. Okay, so you have a comma here and here, but not here and here. We have commas in options A, B, and D after chin, but not in option C. And then we have commas after claim. So ultimately, I'm looking for a couple things. First thing I'm gonna look for is if Steina chin is non-essential, because that would get rid of options A and B or C and D, depending on whether it is non-essential or not. Okay, and then the next difference I'll be looking for is if I need to have a comma after claims. So it looks like if we look up, claims is before this quote, so whether or not that quote is integrated or not. If it's integrated, we will not need a comma. If it is not integrated, then we would need a comma. So let's go ahead and take a look. We've got in 1937, Chinese-American screen actor Anna Mae Wong, who had portrayed numerous villains and secondary characters but never a heroine, finally got a starring role in Paramount Pictures' Daughter of Shanghai a film that critic Steina Chin claims expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. All right, well, we've got a film that critic Steina Chin claims expanded the range, okay? If we were to remove Steina Chin, we would have a film that critic claims expanded the range. Well, we'd have to say a critic if we're gonna remove Steina Chin. We couldn't just say critic claims, we'd have to say a critic claims, okay? So we can go ahead and get rid of A and B because we know that it is essential, okay? The meaning would change if we were to remove Steina Chin. Let's go ahead and take a look at C and D. We have uh, critic Steina Chin claims, and then we go straight into the quote versus a comma before claims and a comma after claims. Well, we already know we don't need a comma before claims, so just based on that, we could get rid of D. But I also want to just add an option E here, and let's talk about what it, the case would be if we had um, critic Steina Chin um, claims and then a comma. Okay, so let's just pretend that this was an option as well. Well. If we go up, we've got a film that critic Steina Chin claims expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. As you can see, that's already integrated into the text, which means that since it's integrated into the text, we do not need a comma there. Okay, so E would also be incorrect if that were to be some answer choice. Okay, so our answer there would have to be answer choice C. Okay, so once again, to kind of sum all of this up, okay, we begin by looking at the differences in our answer choice. From there, we identify what we need to look for in the question as we do our read through. Once we identify those things, we come down, we eliminate wrong answer choices and get to the right one. Here's another example of how I recommend you approach questions that ask you to conform to the conventions of standard English. So I'd start by taking a look at my answer choices. In this case, we've got a version of claim in all of them. So what I'll be looking for is my subject. I wanna know the number of my subject, and I also wanna know what tense I'm in. So let's go ahead and go through number 23. In 1637, the price of tulips skyrocketed in Amsterdam with single bulbs of rare variety selling for up to the equivalent of $200,000 in today's US dollars. Some historians blank. Okay, so we got historians as our subject. That this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble, which occurs when investors drive prices to high is not supported by actual demand. All right, so before this comma, we need to have an independent clause. Okay, so in order to have an independent clause, we need to have a finite verb after historians. Okay, so let's take a look at our options. We got option A, option a some historians claiming that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble. Okay, now since we don't have an independent clause following this comma, we cannot we cannot use claiming here, okay? Because if we were to say some historians claiming that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble, that's just not an independent clause, okay? So we can get rid of option A. We would have some historians claim that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble. That would make an independent clause, and claim is a finite verb, okay? So we have an independent clause in B, so B will be our answer there. Let's take a look at C and D as well. We've got option C, some historians having claimed that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble. This prevents essentially very close to the same problem as A. We are using a non-finite participle and this will not complete an independent clause. So if we were to use having claimed, we would not have an independent clause before the comma, okay? And if we're going to have a sentence, we need to have an independent clause. So we can get rid of option C. If we were to take a look at option D, okay, we would have some historians to claim that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble. Once again, that would not make an independent clause. Okay, to claim there, there is a non-finite infinitive. 
So we can get rid of D because once again, we would not have an independent clause. The only option out of A, B, C, and D that would give us an independent clause prior to this comma right here, okay, is option B because it provides a finite verb. Here's another example. We have which choice completes the text so it conforms to conventions of standard English. I look at my options. I've got food with a colon, a comma, no comma and well, or nothing, no punctuation after it. Okay, so what I'll be looking for is do I have an independent clause before food? And then what kind of phrase or clause do I have after food? So we have researchers studying magneto sensation have determined why some soil dwelling roundworms in the southern hemisphere move in the opposite direction of Earth's magnetic field when searching for food. That's an independent clause before food. So I'm going to mark IC at food. After that, we have in the northern hemisphere, the magnetic fields point down into the ground, but in the southern hemisphere, it points up toward the surface and away from worms food sources. Okay, that's also an independent clause. So we have two independent clauses. We cannot connect them with just well or with no punctuation or with just a comma. So our answer there would have to be answer choice A. Here's another example with question 25, which choice completes the text or conforms to convention of standard English? Start with the answer choices. We've got a bunch of pronouns. So I'll be looking for the noun I'm replacing. We've got scientists believe that unlike most other species of barnacle, internal barnacles can dissolve the smut like secretions they use to attach blank to a turtle seashell enabling the barnacles. Okay, so ultimately we know our subject here is the turtle barnacles. Okay, so that's the noun we need to replace. Turtle barnacles can dissolve the smut-like secretions they use to attach, so it would have to be themselves to a sea turtle shell. We know it's plural, so obviously we would get rid of A and we would get rid of D. Okay, we know it has to be themselves because we wouldn't state that turtle barnacles can dissolve the smut-like secretions they use to attach them to a sea turtle shell. Okay, it is themselves. Okay, so our answer would have to be B. Here's another example how I recommend approaching questions where you ask to conform to the conventions of standard English. In this case, I'll look at my answer choices to start. I've got a bunch of different forms of the verb allow. So what I'm going to be looking to do is identify the number of my subject and also try to pay attention to tense as I read through this. We have a classic children's board game. Shoots and Ladders is a version of an ancient Nepalese game, Paramapada Sopanapada Ta. In both games, players encounter good or bad spaces while traveling along a path, landing on one of the good spaces, blank a player to skip ahead and arrive closer to the end goal. All right, so I want to identify my subject. I have this prepositional phrase of on one of the good spaces where on is the preposition that starts it off. So in order to identify your subject, make sure that you are getting rid of those prepositional phrases. So my subject here is landing. Landing is going to be singular. If you look at my options, I have option A, allows. I'll use the he, they test here. So I would state he allows, but I would state they allow. So I see option D would have to be incorrect since allow is plural, but allows is singular. If you look at option B, we have are allowing. Well, are allowing, we would state they are allowing, but he is allowing. So we know that that's plural, so we can get rid of that as well. If you look at C, we have have allowed. We would state they have allowed, but he has allowed. So once again, we see C would be plural as well. So our answer would have to be option A, since we need to maintain that singularity that is in our uh, subject to the singularity that must match with our verb. So our answer would have to be A. Here's another example. So if we take a look at our answer choices, we've got equations and though. Anytime I have a transition word like though or however, I'm going to be looking to see if it needs to be on the left side of whatever punctuation or the right side. Or in other words, does it need to be contained with the first independent clause or the first clause, or does it need to be with the second clause or phrase? Okay, so that's one thing I'll be looking for. The second thing is we have a colon here. We have just commas here with no fanboys, and we have no fanboys or commas or any punctuation in D. And then option C, we have a period. So what I'm going to look for is if we have two independent clauses, because that'll help me figure out punctuation as well. So I'm looking where to place though, and then if we've got two independent clauses. In 1943, in the midst of World War II, mathematics professor Grace Hopper was recruited by the U.S. military to help the war effort by solving complex equations. Hopper's subsequent career would involve more than just equations, though. As a pioneering computer programmer, okay, and as a pioneering computer programmer is an introductory modifier to Hopper, Hopper would help usher in the digital age. That's an independent clause. We also have an independent clause with Hopper's subsequent career would involve more than just equations. So we have two independent clauses. Okay, we can't connect them with a comma and no fanboys or with no punctuation, so we get rid of B and D. So now the question is, does though need to come or be attached basically to the first independent clause or the second? Well, we have Hopper's subsequent career would involve more than equations though. Okay, that would need to be applied or connected to the first independent clause. We wouldn't state though, and then have the introductory modifier after that, though as a pioneering computer programmer, Hopper would help usher in the digital age. Okay, that would make sense. We have to have that though connected to this first independent clause. 
Okay, the other thing that you can note is that your second independent clause here of as a pioneer and computer programmer, Hopper would help usher in the digital age is illustrating the idea that came before it or the preceding idea prior to this colon, which is that her subsequent career would involve more than just equations, which we are illustrating okay, by her being a computer programmer. Okay, the equations part was referring more to her being a mathematician. So we are illustrating this idea. Anytime you are illustrating the idea that came before it, okay, you will often be using a colon. Okay, so answer, there has to be answer choice A. Here's another example. So if I take a look at my answer choices here, I've got Henry resumed his reign, the reign of Henry resumed, Henry's reign resumed, and it was Henry who resumed his reign. So as you can see here, basically what's getting switched around is what's at the beginning. First you have Henry, then you have the reign of Henry, then you have Henry's reign, then you have it was Henry. If you see that your subject is just being like turned and switched around in the beginning, you're probably going to be looking at an introductory modifier. So in this case, if I take a look back up at where my blank is, I have a pawn recovering two years later. Okay, that's an introductory modifier. So what comes after it needs to be who it is modifying, who is recovering two years later. Okay, so let's go ahead and read through our text, figure out who that is. We have in 1453, English King Henry the uh, VI became unfit to rule after falling gravely ill. As a result, Parliament appointed Richard, third Duke of York, who had a strong claim to the English throne to rule as protector. Upon recovering two years later, well, we know that King Henry is the one who fell ill, so he would be the one recovering. So what needs to come after this comma is King Henry. So we have option A, Henry, which is the subject that this introductory modifier is modifying. Okay, we have option B, the reign of Henry. It's not the reign of Henry that is recovering two years later. It's not Henry's reign that is recovering two years later. And it's not it that is recovering two years later. It is Henry himself. Okay, so we need to have the correct subject after the introductory modifier. So our answer there has to be answer choice A. Here's how I recommend that you approach transition questions on the digital SAT writing section. If you take a look at question nine, it states which choice completes the text of the most logical transition. Now, in contrast to questions that ask you to conform to the conventions of standard English, I actually recommend that you don't look at your answer choices first when dealing with transition questions. Here's how instead I think you should approach it. Start by reading through the text. Although novels and poems are considered distinct literary forms, many authors have created hybrid works that incorporate elements of both. Okay, so here we have a claim that many authors have created hybrid works that incorporate elements of both, both being the poems and the novels. And then we have Bernadine Avaristo's The Emperor's Babe. Blank is a verse novel, a book-length narrative complete with characters and a plot, but conveyed in short, crisp lines of poetry rather than pose. Okay, so this is an example of how novels and poems are not necessarily distinct, but instead how many authors have created hybrid works that incorporate elements of poetry and a normal novel, or in other words, a normal narrative. Okay, so as we can see, we are providing an example of the claim that we are given above. Okay, so I'd be looking for something like for example. Okay, so D would be perfect there. Now, the reason I recommend that you um, you don't look at your answer choices first is because that could potentially sway you before you go through and you read the actual text. So I recommend you try to come up with your own answer choice first and then take a look at your options. That way you're less likely to be swayed by wrong answer choices. Here's another example. Once again, we have which choice completes the text in the most logical transition. We'll start by reading through. At two weeks old, the time their critical socialization period begins, wolves can smell but cannot yet see or hear. Domesticated, domesticated dogs can see, hear, and smell by the end of two weeks. Okay, so in this case, we have a contrast. We have at two weeks old, wolves can smell, but they cannot see or hear, but domesticated dogs can see, hear, and smell by the end of two weeks. So it looks like we have a contrast. We'll keep reading. This relative lack of sensory input may help explain why wolves behave so differently around humans than dogs do. From a very young age, wolves are more wary and less exploratory. So in this case, we do have a contrast. So I'd be looking for something like domesticated dogs, by contrast, can see, hear, and smell by the end of two weeks. As we can see, we have by contrast as an option, so that works out perfectly. Okay, so our answer would have to be C. One thing I will make note of is that with digital SAT writing sections and the SAT writing section before it went digital, you tend to get um, very similar transition choices, and you tend to have similar transition themes across the different practice tests. Now, what I mean by this is you will often see situations where you would use something like, for example, where something exemplifies what came before it, or a contrast or something where you're stating something in other words or where you're giving you know, something for instance, which is kind of similar to for example. Um, and some other ones that you might see are consequently, subsequently, consequently being if something is a consequence of what came before it, subsequently being if something came after what was talked about previously. So getting practice with the transition questions is very, very helpful because you often see similar transitions being used across the practice tests, which is obviously going to be indicative that those transitions are ones that the college board would want you to know for the actual digital SAT.
Here's another example. So once again, we have which choice completes a textbook's logical transition. I'll start by filling in the blank with what I expect uh, to be there after I do my read through, and then I'll go through my answer choices. So we have researchers Helena Milholjevic, Brandt, Lucia Santa Maria, and Marco Tolney report that while mathematicians may have traditionally worked alone, evidence points to a shift in the opposite direction. So one thing I'll point out here is anytime I have any sort of shift or any sort of um, you know indication that we have some sort of change going on or even some sort of something that's staying the same. I want to pay attention to that on a transition question. In this case, we have a shift in the opposite direction of working alone, so presumably working together. Then we have mathematicians are choosing to collaborate with peers, a trend illustrated by the rise in the number of mathematics publications credited to multiple authors. Okay, so in this case, we are stating that they are choosing to work with peers. That's pretty much an example of what came before. So I would probably be looking for something along the lines of, for example, here. Okay, if we look at our options, we've got option A similarly. Well, it's not similar to what came before it. Okay, we're just kind of illustrating what we previously claimed. If we look at option B, for this reason, it's not a consequence of what came before it, so we can get rid of B. Okay, what came before it did not cause mathematicians choosing to collaborate with their peers. If we look at option C, furthermore, we're not adding on to what came before, we're illustrating it. Okay, if we look at option D, we have increasingly. Okay, increasingly, mathematicians are choosing to collaborate with their peers, a trend illustrated by the rise in the number of mathematics publications credited to multiple authors. So as you can see, D would have to be our answer there. Now, obviously that's not the same as what I came up with as for example, but when we state that increasingly mathematicians are choosing to collaborate with their peers, well, is that a good transition from what came before, which stated that we are moving in the opposite direction of working alone? Yes, because the opposite of working alone would be an increase in collaboration. Okay, so obviously that's a great transition there and it is illustrating what came before. Okay, so our answer would have to be D. Here's how I recommend answering questions on the digital SAT writing section where you're presented with a student's or someone's notes, and then you have to answer questions following that. The first thing I recommend that you do is take a look at what your actual prompt is. Okay, and the prompt will basically be the last part before which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal. So when I say prompt, I'm referring to the section right here. Okay, so the student wants to present the study and its findings. From here, once I know the prompt, and identify what I want to look for as I do my read through. In this case, it's pretty broad. It's just the study and its findings. Okay, so I'll go back up. Let's do the read through. Okay, Batosaurs were flying reptiles that existed millions of years ago. In 2021 study, ACT analyzed fragments of Batosaur jaw bones located in the Sahara Desert. She was initially unsure if the bones belonged to a juvenile or adult Batosaurus. She used advanced microscope techniques to determine that the bones had few growth lines and relative few growth lines relative to the bones of fully grown Pateosaurs, she concluded that the bones belonged to juveniles. Okay, so the findings is that the bones belong to juveniles. Okay, the study is ultimately whether these um, these jaw bones are from that of a juvenile or an adult. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at our options. We've got option A. And at 2021, uh, CT studied Pateosaur jaw bones and was initially unsure if the bones belonged to juveniles or adults. That does not present the findings, so we can get rid of option A. When you're dealing with questions like this, you need to be strict and make sure that you're answering all parts of the prompt. This one does not include findings, so you get rid of A. B, the jaw bones located in the Sahara Desert were the focus of a 2021 study. Also does not talk about the findings. Option C, in a 2021 study, CT used advanced microscope techniques to analyze the jaw bones of potatoes, flying reptiles that existed millions of years ago. Once again, we do not discuss the findings in option C, so we got to get rid of it. And then we take a look at option D. In a 2021 study, CT determined that potatoes jaw bones located in the Sahara Desert had a few growth lines relative to the bones of fully grown potatoes and thus belong to juveniles. Okay, right there, we do both a presenting of the study. If we go up, our prompt, present the study and its findings. We do both of those. Answer there has to be D. Here's another example of how I recommend that you approach questions where you're given a set of notes and asked to do something with it. Okay, in this case, we see that our prompt is the student wants to compare the two women's contributions to the March on Washington. And then we have the generic part of the question, which is which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal. Okay, so we're going to focus in right here. A student wants to compare the two women's contributions to the March on Washington. So since I'm looking for a comparison, I'm going to look for things that are different and possibly things that are the same as well. So we have African-American women played prominent roles in the civil rights movement, including at the famous 19... 63 March in Washington. Civil rights activist Anna Hedgeman, one of the March's organizers, was a political advisor who had worked for President Truman. Civil rights activist Daisy Bates was a well-known journalist and advocate for school desegregation. So it looks like they have two different positions. And then we have Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman was included in the lineup 
of speakers at the march. Bates was the sole woman to speak, delivering a brief but memorable address to the cheering crowd. Okay, so Hedgman worked behind the scenes and Bates was a speaker. Looks like is the main difference there. The similarity would be that they both had important contributions to the march on Washington. So we've got option A, Hedgman and Bates contributed to the march in different ways. In different ways, Bates, for example, delivered a brief but memorable address. All right, so are we comparing the two women's contributions? Well, we say that they contributed in different ways, and then we only state the way that Bates contributed. I would prefer an option where we talk about the way that they each contributed um, in their own distinct way. So I'm going to leave this one as neutral for now. Let's take a look at B. Hedgeman worked in politics and helped organize the marts, while Bates was a journalist and school desegregation activist, advocate. Well, we never mentioned Bates's role in the march on Washington there, so I'm going to get rid of B. Option C states, although Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman speaker was included, Bates was the sole woman to speak at the march. Okay, this is much better than option A. Okay, option A states they both contributed to the march in different ways, but then we only um, discuss how Bates contributed. Okay, so we can get rid of A now. Okay, C is much better because it states how Hedgeman contributed. Okay, she worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman was included. And then we also discuss how Bates contributed, being the sole one to speak at the march. And obviously, these are both different, so that's a great comparison. Okay, we can take a look at D as well here. We have many African-American women, including Bates and Hedgeman, fought for civil rights, but only one spoke at the march. And the focus here is not on comparing Bates and Hedgeman, so we can get rid of D. Keep in mind your prompt. The prompt states a student who wants to compare the two women's contributions specifically to the march on Washington. Okay, so our answer there would have to be answer choice C. Now let's talk about how to approach different types of SAT reading questions. By knowing which approach you want to use for certain questions, you'll be able to be more efficient and comfortable when taking the SAT. Here's a tip on how to answer one of the most commonly asked questions on the digital SAT reading section. If you take a look at the prompt, it states which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase. What I recommend doing when you see a question with that type of prompt is start by reading from the beginning, and then once you get to this blank right here, fill it in with what you think sh should go there. Now, that might require that you continue reading on, but ultimately what your goal should be is to fill in the blank with a word before you actually take a look at your answer choices. This is important because it will help you avoid being swayed by what the answer choices say. So let's go ahead and illustrate this with question one. Former astronaut Ellen Ochoa says that although she doesn't have a definite idea of when it might happen, she blanked that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. This conjecture informs her interest in future research miss missions to the moon. Okay, well, if she has interest in future research missions to the moon, I would assume that she believes that someday humans would need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. Okay, so I would fill in right here with believes. Now, at this point, I would then take a look at my answer choices. So I have answer choice A as an option, which is demands. Well, we can't say that she demands humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments because obviously she cannot demand that. We have B speculates. She speculates that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. And that would make sense because it informs her interest in future research missions to the moon. Okay, so that makes a ton of sense. If we take a look at C doubts, well, she obviously doesn't doubt it because she's interested in future research missions to the moon and she cannot establish it. To establish something would basically be to prove something. She She's unable to prove that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. Okay, so our answer would have to be B, speculates. And as you can see, by filling in this blank with a word before we actually take a look at our answer choices, we're much less likely to be swayed by what they say because we already know what should fill in that blank based on the context of the question. Here's another example with question two. Beginning in the 1950s, Navajo Nation legislator Annie Dodge Wanaka continuously worked to promote public health. This blank effort involved traveling throughout the vast Navajo homeland and writing a medical dictionary for speakers of Dain Bizad, the Navajo language. All right, I would say this consistent effort. Okay, We say that she continuously worked to promote public health. Then we go on to talk about her effort, which involved traveling throughout uh, the homeland, writing a medical dictionary. So obviously, this is a consistent effort. So that's what I'd fill in there before taking a look at my answer choices. Now, if we take a look at our options, we have A and partial. Well, there's not any sides to be taken here. So you can't have a neutral stance on something that doesn't have two sides. So that wouldn't make sense. We have B, offhand. Offhand would have a negative connotation. So that wouldn't make sense here either. If we take a look at C, persistent, okay, persistent and consistent, very, very similar in meaning, okay, both in this context would basically mean that there is a consistent or um, continued effort involved um, by Annie. Okay, so that would make a lot of sense. If we take a look at D, mandatory, no one is forcing her to do that, so that wouldn't make sense. Okay, so our answer would be C. Here's how I recommend you approach digital SAT reading questions that ask you to state the main purpose or the main idea of text. So to illustrate this, I'm going to use question number seven. In 2007, computer scientist Louis Van An was working on converting printed books into a digital format. He found that some words were distorted enough that digital scanners couldn't recognize them, but most humans could easily read them. Based on that finding, Van An invented a simple security test to keep automated bots out of websites. The first version of the recapture test asked users to type one known word and one of the many words scanners couldn't recognize. Correct answers proved the users were human and added data to the book digitizing project. So 
well, for main purpose and main idea questions, what I recommend you do is come up with your own answer before taking a look at the answer choices. That way you're not easily swayed by answer choices that are close to correct, but have slight flaws in them that actually make them incorrect. So let's go ahead and start by coming up with our main purpose for this prompt. Okay, so ultimately we start out by talking about how um, Von Ahn was using digital scanners and how it couldn't recognize some of the words. Then we talk about how he uses this to create the recapture test. And then we talk about the application of the recapture test and how it's used to protect websites. So ultimately it's really about the creation of the recapture test. Okay, so let's take a look at our options now that we've just identified the main purpose as the creation of the recapture test. So we have option A to discuss Von An's invention of recapture. Okay, that looks perfect. We'll put a check by that. Let's take a look at B, C, and D. We have B to explain how digital scanners work. Okay, obviously that's not the main purpose. Okay, we don't even really discuss necessarily that much about digital, uh, how digital scanners actually work. We just mentioned them in the beginning and talk about how they can't actually recognize some of the words, but that's really just to introduce how they came up with the recapture test. So just to lead us to the creation of it. We have C to call attention to Von An's book digitizing project. The focus isn't on his book digitizing project. Okay, that's just how he ended up discovering or creating recapture. Okay, so we can get rid of C as well there. If we take a look at D, we have to indicate how popular recapture is. Okay, once again, that is not um, ultimately the main purpose. Now, do we state anywhere even that it is popular? Okay, we say that uh, if we go up, he invented a simple security test to keep automated bots on websites. So we don't even necessarily mention that it is popular. Now, some of us may know this from just our general uh, knowledge of what goes on on the internet, but we have to acknowledge that the main purpose here is talking about the creation of recapture. Okay, so our answer has to be A. Now, you'll notice by coming up with our own answer for the main purpose first, it helped us to be able to eliminate answer choices that were similar or were mentioned at somewhere in the text, but weren't actually the main purpose, but were just maybe a step to get us to the main purpose. Here's another example of how I recommend approaching questions that ask you about the main purpose or main idea on the digital SAT reading section. So I'm gonna illustrate this with question 11. The following text is from Maggie Pogue Johnson's 1910 poem, Poet of Our Race. In this poem, the speaker is addressing Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a black author. Thou with stroke of mighty pen hast told of joy and mirth and read the hearts and souls of men as cradled from their birth. The language of the flowers, thou hast rest them all and e'en the little brook responded to thy call. Okay, so we're gonna start out by coming up with our own main purpose before actually taking a look at your answer choices. That way we're not as swayed by answer choices that are close to correct, but have slight flaws that actually make them incorrect. So. Let's go ahead and start by discussing what the main purpose of this is. Let's start with this first part. Okay, so we have thou with stroke of mighty pen has told of joy and mirth and read the hearts and souls of men as cradled from their birth. Okay, so we're ultimately complimenting um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's work as a poet, stating that he's told of joy and mirth, read the hearts and souls of men. So essentially stating that um, he's very in tune with obviously the souls of men, or in other words, um, the soul really representing, you know, the inner thoughts of people, sort of who they are deep, deep down in their soul. We have as cradled from their birth. So from, um, from their birth, uh, presumably until death. And we take a look at the second part. We have the language of the flowers. Thou hast read them all and in the little brook responded to thy call. Okay, so here we're talking more so about nature. Okay, so presumably this is a poet who is talking both about uh, humans and nature. Um, clearly, it sounds like they are very in tune with both of them. Okay, has read them all, all the language of the flowers. So very great at writing um, both about humans and about nature. Okay, so main purpose I would say is that Paul Lawrence Dunbar is an incredible poet who is great at writing both about um, humans, maybe the human experience, as well as nature. So we have option A, to praise a certain writer for being especially perceptive regarding people in nature. Okay, as you can see, that's very supported by the text. Okay, that's also in line with the main purpose that we came up with before taking a look at the answer choices. So that looks really good. We'll take a quick look at B, C, and D as well. We have B, to establish that a certain writer has read extensively about a variety of topics. Well, that's not the main purpose, okay? And we're also not explicitly stating, or there's no real support for that the certain writer has read extensively about a variety of topics, okay? This is pretty much all figurative language if we scroll up and take a look at the poem. So there's really not any support for that being the main purpose. Um, ultimately, the main purpose is that um, they are especially perspective regarding people in nature, right? We talk about how um, they have told of joy and mirth, read the hearts and souls of men, and that's really the key part there, read hearts and souls of men, okay? So that's perceptive about people and then perceptive about nature, that language of the flowers, thou hast read them all. Okay, so tons of support for A. If we take a look at C, to call attention to a certain writer's careful and elaborate, elaborately detailed writing process. We're not discussing the writing process. Okay, if we take a look at D, we've got uh, to recount fond memories of an afternoon spent in nature with a certain writer. 
Okay, we never state that this is from an afternoon they spent together. Okay, so D doesn't have any support. Our answer there would have to be A. As you can see, coming up with our own answer choice first helps us to avoid getting stuck between two answers, and it also helps us to get rid of answer choices that seem like they would be close to a correct answer but have slight flaws that we ultimately can then use to rule them out as incorrect. Here's some advice on how to answer this really common digital SAT reading question. The question states, which choice best describes the function of the underlined sentence as a whole? When you come across a question like this, the first thing that I'd recommend doing is going ahead and reading through. So let's go ahead and start doing that with question eight. The following text is from Edith Wharton's 1905 novel, The House of Mirth. Lily, Bart, and a companion are walking through a park. Lily had no real intimacy with nature, but she had a passion for the appropriate and could be keenly sensitive to a scene which was fitting, which, which was the fitting background of her own sensations. The landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breadth, its long reaches. Okay, so immediately what I'm seeing is before we had a claim, okay, that she could be keenly sensitive to a scene, which was the fitting background of her own sensations. Okay, now we are going ahead and showing or proving that claim. Okay, we have the landscape outspread below her, it seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness. Okay, that's very directly supportive of that claim that we had in the previous sentence. Okay, that she finds something of herself in its calmness, or in other words, that it's fitting. Um, she's keenly sensitive to a scene which was the fitting background of her own sensations. Okay, so obviously that's supportive. It's breadth, it's long, free reaches. All right, let's keep reading on. On the nearer slopes, the sugar maples wavered like pyres of light. Lower down was a massive massing of gray orchards, and here and there, the lingering of an oak grove. All right, so this is pretty much from here down, just a description of the setting for the most part. So we have which choice best describes the function of the underlying sentence in the text as a whole. So from here, I'd go down to my answer choices. So we have option A, it creates a detailed image of the physical setting of the scene. Well, it looks like actually the sentence after the underlined one is what is really giving more of a detailed image of the physical setting of the scene. Okay, so I would go ahead and I would get rid of A. If we take a look back at the sentence that is underlined, and I'll go ahead and remove some of this blue so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, we state that the landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breath, its long for reaches. As you can see, that's really not creating a detailed image of the physical setting. Okay, so we could remove it based on that. And one thing I do recommend you do on the SAT reading and writing section is you can cross out answer choices, okay, and you can cross them out based on what makes them false or what makes them incorrect. Okay, so if we take a look at B now, it establishes that a character is experiencing an internal conflict. Okay, well, ultimately it's not really establishing that the character is experiencing an internal conflict. Okay, if we go back up to the underlined sentence, it says, the landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breath, its long free reaches. Well, here we have, it found she found something of herself in its calmness. Okay, so it doesn't sound like there's much internal conflict there. Okay, it sounds like she would be calm, so we could get rid of B. If we take a look at C, we have, it makes an assertion that the next sentence expands on. Okay, well, the next sentence is really just a description of the scene, of the setting. Okay, so ultimately we're not making an assertion, okay? And the next sentence is, would obviously not be expanding on that. If we take a look at D now, we have it illustrates an idea that is introduced in the previous sentence. Okay, if we go back up in the previous sentence, as I pointed out earlier, it states that she could be keenly sensitive to a scene which was the fitting background of her own sensations. Okay, we then go on to state that she found something of herself in its calmness, its breath, its long free reaches. Okay, and the landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood. Okay, that's ultimately supportive of the claim that came before it. Okay, so as we can see there, our answer would have to be D. Okay, so I think the key things that I want you to take away from this tip is basically if you have an underlined sentence like this, okay, be looking for the role that it plays as you read through. Here's something you need to watch out for on one of the most commonly asked questions on the digital SAT reading section. That question is which choice best states the function of the underlying sentence and the overall structure of the text. So I'm gonna approach this just like I approached the previous question, but then once we get to the answer choices, I'm gonna show you some common wrong answer choices to watch out for. So we have a study by a team including finance professor Madhu V suggests that exposure to sunshine during the workday can lead to overly optimistic behavior Using data spanning from 1994 to 2010 for a set of U.S. companies, the team compared over 29,000 annual earnings forecasts to the actual earnings later reported by those companies. All right, so ultimately we see that we start out here with a suggestion or sort of a hypothesis that exposure to sunshine during the workday can lead to overly optimistic behavior. Then we talk about how we are gathering the data. Okay, so right here we have data collection. Then we have the team found that the greater the exposure to sunshine at work in the two weeks before managers submitted an earnings forecast, the more the, com the manager's forecast exceeded what the company actually earned that year. So then we have summary. Okay, so we start with hypothesis, data collection, summary. All right, so ultimately, 
if we scroll down and get option A to summarize the result of the team's analysis, well, that would be the summary, okay? And this is one of the common wrong answer choices that I wanted to point out to you guys, is that oftentimes when you have a sentence underlined like this in the text, one of the answer choices, which is obviously gonna be a wrong answer choice, is they will select either the sentence before or the sentence after or another sentence somewhere in the text Okay, and they will put that down as one of the wrong answer choices. So you need to watch out for that. In this case, it's the summary, which we see is the sentence that is after the sentence that's underlined. Okay, so we can get rid of A because we know it's not the underlined sentence that's giving the summary, it is the following sentence. So always watch out for that. If we take a look at B, we have to present a specific example that illustrates the study's findings. So this is more so of a misinterpretation, okay? So I would identify this as a misinterpretation wrong answer choice. And the reason I identify it as that is because some people would look at this underlined text and they would think that it is a specific example illustrating the study's findings, but it's not, okay? They're talking about how they are collecting this data, okay? This is not a specific example either because ultimately, okay, we're looking at 29,000 annual earnings forecasts. So obviously that is not specific, okay? Also, we have to recognize that this is data collection, okay? This is not providing of an example. We are collecting the data. Okay, so if we look at option B, we can get rid of it. Okay, we would classify that, in my opinion, as a misinterpretation because this is not a specific example. If we take a look at C, we have to explain part of the methodology used in the team study. Okay, oftentimes on the SAT, if you see methodology, you should probably be thinking how the experiment or the study is being um, set up and how data is being collected. Okay, so that's what you want to think about when you think about methodology. And as you can see, in this case, that underlined sentence Okay, that's describing the methodology used. Okay, they used data spanning from 1994 to 2010 for a set of US companies. The team compared over 29,000 annual earnings forecasts to the actual earnings later reported by those companies. Okay, that's an example of a methodology. Okay, so C is perfect there. We'll take a look at D as well. Okay, D states to call out a challenge the team faced in conducting its analysis. The way I would classify answer choice D is just as a random wrong answer choice. Sometimes on the SAT reading section, and this isn't specific to just this question type, this is specific to just generally almost any type of question on the SAT reading and writing section. You may just get some answer choices that are fairly random, and this one is fairly random. There really isn't any challenge that's discussed at all in the text anywhere, okay? So the fact that they would put that there is really just random, okay? So we can get rid of D as well there. As you can see, your answer there will be C. What I really wanted to point out in this is the common wrong answer choices that you will see on questions that ask you to state the function of underlined sentences in the overall structure of text. Here's a tip for anyone who struggles with reading comprehension on the digital SAT reading and writing section. If we take a look at question 10, we'll start by reading the question, which states, according to the text, what is true about mother? We have the following text is adapted from Edith Nesbitt's 1906 novel, The Railway Children. Mother did not spend all her time in paying dull visits to dull ladies and sitting dully at home waiting for dull ladies to pay visits to her. She was almost always there, ready to play with the children and read to them and help them to do their home lessons. Besides this, she used to write stories for them while they were at school and read aloud to the, and read aloud, read them aloud after tea. And she always made up funny pieces of poetry for their birthdays and for other great occasions. Okay, so in this case, on a reading comprehension question like this, you really just have to go to your answer choices. There's not much you can do before that. Okay, so we'll go, ahead and go to answer choice A. We have, she wishes that more ladies would visit her. So the biggest tip that I would have for anyone who struggles with reading comprehension on the digital SAT and the SAT in general is you need to try to make it less about comprehension and more about evidence and textual support. Okay, so if you take a look at option A, she wishes that more ladies would visit her, okay? The biggest tool you have if you are someone who struggles with reading comprehension is the ability to go back to the text, okay? So she wishes more ladies would visit her. Let's see if there's any textual evidence for that, because if there's not, we can get rid of it. So we have mother did not spend all her time in paying dull visits to dull ladies and sitting dully at home waiting for dull ladies to pay visits to her. She was almost always there ready to play with the children, read to them, and then we talk about the children for the rest of this. Okay, ultimately, is there any evidence that she wishes that more ladies would visit her? No, there is not, so you can get rid of A. Okay, and one piece of advice for the reading and writing section is when you get rid of an answer choice, try to get rid of um, it based on the part of it that's false. So she wishes that more ladies would visit her. Okay, there's no evidence that she wishes that. Okay, you would have to make, um, you can't even make a reach for that. There's not, it's not even like it would be a large reach. There's just no textual evidence to support it. So you have to get rid of A. Okay, if you take a look at B now, birthdays are her favorite special occasion. And this is where being strict on the digital SAT reading section is important. Okay, you wanna be strict. This part right here, birthdays are her favorite special occasion. That's what makes B wrong, okay? And let's say you didn't remember um, that she never stated this. Well, you can go back to the text and you can look for special occasions. So let's go ahead and take a look for that, or birthdays in particular. Okay, so if we go back to the text, we'll look for birthdays. 
Okay, we see right here is the only mention of birthdays. So we have, she always made up funny pieces of poetry for their birthdays and for other great occasions. Okay, great occasions does not mean it's her favorite. Okay, so on the SAT reading section, be strict when getting rid of Anne's choices. If it states that it's someone's favorite special occasion, but it just states that uh, it's a great occasion in the text, you can't make that jump. There's not textual evidence to support that it's their favorite. Okay, now if we take a look at C, we have she creates stories and poems for her children. Well, let's see if we have evidence for that. Okay, if you're not someone who's great with comprehension, go back to the text. So it creates stories and poems for children. Well, let's take a look there. We have she was almost always there, ready to play with the children, read to them, and help them do their home lessons. Besides this, she used to write stories. Okay, so we have that she creates stories for them. And while they were at school and read them aloud after tea, and she always made up funny pieces of poetry. Okay, so she made up funny pieces of poetry. Made up means that she's writing them or creating them. Okay, so she creates stories and poems for her children. We see that that has textual support. C would have to be our answer. Okay, and then D, reading to her children is her favorite activity. Well, once again, there's no mention of anything being her favorite activity. Let's say that you um, forgot that. You're not great at comprehension. You just go back to the text. Look for where we talk about reading to her children then. Okay, we have that up here. She was almost always there, ready to play with the children and read to them and help them do their home lessons. Okay, and then after that, if we go down, okay, it doesn't really look like we're talking about, um, we talk about reading again here, read to them aloud after tea, but once again, we don't say that it's her favorite. Okay, so we can get rid of that by being strict on the favorite part. Okay, so if you are someone who struggles with comp comprehension, try to identify the subject in your answer choice, identify where that subject is in the text, okay, read that section of the text, and then determine if there is textual evidence to support it. If there is not any evidence to support it, then it cannot be correct. Okay, every answer choice on the SAT has to have evidence from the text to support it. Here's a tip for anyone who struggles with reading comprehension on the digital SAT reading and writing section. What I recommend doing is taking a look at your prompt before you end up reading through the passage. And do this each time, because then you know what to look for as you read through, and it avoids you having to do a second read through, which if you struggle with reading comprehension, you probably would have to. Okay, so based on the text, how does Lord Chancellor respond to the crowd? So we're ultimately gonna be looking for Lord, Lord Chancellor's response to the crowd as we do our initial read through. So let's go ahead and start. We have the following text is adapted from Louis Carroll's 1889 satirical novel, Sylvie and Bruno. A crowd is gathered outside a room belonging to the warden, an official who represents the Lord Chancellor, or who re reports to the Lord Chancellor. One man who was more that more excited than the rest flung his hat high into the air and shouted as well as i could make out who roared for the subwarden everybody roared but whether it was for the subwarden or not it did not clearly appear some were shouting bread and some taxes but no one seemed to know what it was they really wanted all this i saw from the open window of the warden's breakfast saloon looking across the shoulder of the lord chancellor what can it all mean he kept repeating to himself i never heard such shouting before and at this time of the morning too and with such unanimity okay so we have his response contained right here okay he states that what can it all mean Okay, he kept repeating to himself, he's never heard such shouting at this time in the morning. So he doesn't know what it means. Okay, but then he ends with, and with such unanimity, or in other words, such togetherness or closeness. Okay, so everyone's together, but Lord Chancellor can't make out what they all want. All right, so that's his response. We've got option A. He asks about the meaning of the crowd's shouting, even though he claims to know what the crowd wants. Well, he doesn't claim to know what the crowd wants. Okay, so anytime you have an answer choice on the SAT reading or writing section that you can get rid of based on a piece of it that is incorrect, cross out that piece that makes it incorrect and move on. You got B, he indicates a desire to speak to the crowd. Okay, it never has any sort of portion in the text that indicates he has a desire to speak to the crowd. Okay, if you didn't remember that, for example, if you have bad reading comprehension, you would go back to where the response is contained, okay, which we see is in this bracket of blue right here. If you take a look there, you see, what can it all mean? He kept repeating to himself, I never heard such shouting before and at this time of the morning too and with such unanimity. Obviously right there, there is no indication he wants to speak to the crowd. So you could get rid of B. And then C, he expresses a sympathy for the crowd's demands. Okay, well, does it ever show that he's expressing sympathy for the crowd's demands? Once again, it does not. Okay, so you would get rid of that. Okay, if you weren't sure on that, you would go back to that section. And notice how I've narrowed this down to a section. So if you are someone who struggles with reading comprehension, make sure that you try to narrow down where you need to look back to. Okay, sometimes it'll be in a case like this where you're only looking at one portion of the text, which is his response, because you really don't need to focus on the other portions because you're not asked about them. Okay, in other cases, you may have to jump around a little bit more because it may not be confined to one section of the text. Okay, and now we'll take a look at answer choice D. He describes the crowd as being united. That's supported. He talks about, um, and with such unanimity would be the quotation that would support that, even though the crowd clearly appears otherwise. Okay, and then let's say that you weren't sure if the crowd clearly appears otherwise. Okay, that's actually not contained within this small section. It's not confined there. Okay, that one to find support for you'd actually have to go up. Okay, so the crowd appears otherwise. Everybody roared, but whether it was for the subordin or not, it did not clearly appear. Some were shouting bread, others taxes. No one seemed to know what they really wanted. Okay, so that would show that the crowd appears otherwise, even though he describes the crowd as being united. 
Okay, so answer D has a ton of textual support there. Here's how I recommend that you approach questions on the digital SAT reading and writing section that asks you to support or weaken any sort of claim or hypothesis. I'm gonna illustrate this with question 13. Question 13's prompt states, which finding, if true, would most directly support the student's claim? In order to answer a question like this, you will need to identify the hypothesis or claim, in this case, a claim. So let's go ahead and start by reading through question 13. And when you go through, you wanna identify that claim. So we'll mark it with a C when we find it. We were born in 1891 to a Kiwicha speaking family in the Andes Mountains of Peru. Martin Chambi is today considered to be one of the most renowned figures of Latin American photography. In a paper for an art history class, a student claims, so this is very, very clear, can we mark it with a C, that Chambi's photographs have considerable ethnographic value. In his work, Chambi was able to capture diverse elements of Peruvian society, representing his subjects with both dignity and authenticity. So now we'll go ahead and take a look at our options. We have option A. Shambi took many commissioned photographs of wealthy Peruvians, but he also produced hundreds of images carefully documenting the people's sites and customs of indigenous communities of the Andes. Well, that's ultimately supporting the fact that his photographs have considerable ethnographic value and his work, he's capturing diverse elements. Okay. So both the wealthy and the indigenous communities of Peruvian society representing his subjects with both dignity and authenticity. Okay. We have, he's documenting the people's, the sites, the customs. Okay. So that would be supportive of the authenticity aspect. Okay, as far as the dignity aspect, the fact that he's taking you know hundreds of images, carefully documenting um, the indigenous communities of the Andes. Okay, I'd say that because he's in particular documenting the indigenous communities as well as the wealthy Peruvians, but in this case, I'm more so concerned with the indigenous communities. The fact that he's documenting both of those, okay, is showing that he's showing them with dignity. Okay, there's no sort of bashing or, or anything like that. Okay, he's both um, you know taking these portraits of wealthy as well as the poor with no sort of partiality to either. So he's representing them with dignity, authenticity. Um, because of that, has considerable ethnographic, val ethnographic value. Okay, so that looks good. We'll take a look at B, C, and D as well. We have option B, Chambi's photographs demonstrate a high level of technical skill as seen in his strategic use of illumination to create dramatic light and shadow contrast. Now that may, may very well be true. However, the problem is we need to directly support the student's claim. And the student's claim isn't that Chambi is the most technically skilled photographer. Okay, so we wouldn't want to focus on his technical skill. We'd want to focus on the ethnographic value of the photographs he is taking. Okay, the fact that he's capturing diverse elements of Peruvian society, not on the actual technical skill. So this is an example of something that is fairly unrelated to the actual claim that is being made here. If we take a look at C, we have during his lifetime, Chambi was known and celebrated both within and outside his native Peru as his work was published in places like Argentina, Spain, and Mexico. So this answer choice, I would ask, actually classify it as you would select this if you had a misinterpretation of part of the text. Because if we scroll up, when we state that Chambi's photographs have considerable ethnographic value, we're not stating that um, Chambi himself and him as a photographer is being valued in multiple aspects or parts of the world, okay, which is what answer choice C is trying to sort of, that's kind of the claim C is insinuating with its support here, okay, saying that Chambi is known and celebrated within and outside his native Peru as work was published in places like Argentina, Spain, and Mexico. So I'd classify this as a misinterpretation type of wrong answer choice. If we take a look at D, we have some of the peoples and places Chambi photographed had long been popular subjects for Peruvian photographers. Well, once again, we need to keep in mind the claim that we're trying to support. Okay, we know that the claim is that his photographs have considerable ethnographic value in his work. He's capturing diverse elements of Peruvian society, representing his subjects with both dignity and authenticity. Okay, no part of D is ultimately supportive of that. Okay, D is really just stating something. It's just stating that some of the peoples and places Jamie photo photographed had been long popular subjects for Peruvian photographers. That's not supportive of the claim. Okay, and also one thing I also want to point out here is you need to directly support the claim. The word directly there is important. Okay, because you have to keep in mind your answer choice must directly support. It can't just be, um, you know, some sort of tangent that is a reach to support. It needs to directly support. And the only answer choice that does that here is answer choice A. So the big takeaway I want you to have from this type of question is as you read through, identify that claim or that hypothesis that you either need to support or weaken. Here are some common wrong answer choice types to questions that ask you about findings that either support or weaken a researcher's hypothesis or someone's claim. Okay, so I'm gonna illustrate this with question number 16. So to start, we're gonna first identify what the research hypothesis is as we do our read through on question 16, and then we'll get into the answer choices. So we have in the mountains of Brazil, B, T, and B, M, two plants in the Velocio family establish themselves on soilless, nutrient poor patches of quartzite rock. Plant ecologist Anna A and Patricio de Brito Costa used microscopic analysis to determine that the roots of BT and BM, which grow directly into the quartzite, have clusters of fine hairs near the root tip. Further analysis indicated that these hairs secrete both malic and citric acids. The researchers hypothesized, so now we have our hypothesis, I'm going to mark this with an H, 
that the plants depend on dissolving underlying rock with these acids as the process not only creates channels for continued growth, but also releases phosphates that provide the vital nutrient phosphorus. Okay, so now we have to find support for that hypothesis. I'll try to leave that hypothesis within the frame so you can still see it. We have option A, other species in the Velociae family are found in terrains with more soil, but have root structures similar to BT and BM. Okay, ultimately, this is pretty unrelated to the actual hypothesis at hand here. Okay, our hypothesis is that the uh, plants depend on dissolving underlying rock with these acids um, because that they then use this to release phosphates that provide the vital nutrient phosphorus. Well, if you have the same family, there are other um, other species in the same family that have root structures that are similar but are found in terrains with more soil. That's not really telling us any support or not weakening either the claim that the um, these plants are ultimately using these acids to not only create channels for continued growth, but also to release phosphates to provide the vitamin nutrient phosphorus. So this really doesn't weaken. It doesn't support either. Um, it's, it's for the most part unrelated. So we can get rid of A based on that. So that would fit into sort of um, the neutral or unrelated category for the most part. If we take a look at B, we have though B, T, and BM both secrete citric and malic acids. Each species produces these acids in different proportions. Okay, this right here, it's not supportive of our hypothesis. It's not weakening our hypothesis. It's just neutral and unrelated. So it fits into pretty much the same bucket as answer choice A would there. Okay, if we take a look at option C now, we have the roots of B, T, and BM carve new entry points into rocks even when cracks in the surface are readily available. All right, well, if we go back up to our hypothesis, Okay. We know that if these roots are, or these cracks are already available, readily available, we would expect that if they didn't need the phosphorus, they would just grow into the cracks, okay? Because they wouldn't need to ultimately create these new cracks, which is more costly and requires more energy from the actual plant itself to make these new cracks, okay? So this is actually supportive of that hypothesis, right? Because if they were to just take the cracks that were already entered and not create new ones, then that would support the idea that or that would weaken the hypothesis and support the idea that they don't actually need the phosphorus. But because they are actively carving new entry points into the rocks, even though the cracks are already available and they're not just growing into the cracks, this supports the idea that they would need to do that in order to get the phosphorus. Okay, so we know our answer there is going to have to be C. We can take a look at D as well because uh, let's see what wrong answer choice bucket that falls into so I can teach that. We have BT and BM thrive even when transferred to the surfaces of rocks that do not contain phosphates. Well, if they're thriving on rocks that don't contain phosphates, that would weaken our hypothesis that BT and BM need to get phosphorus from these rocks by carving in these new entry points. Okay, so if they're thriving without phosphorus, then that would weaken that hypothesis. Okay, so D would fall into the bucket of being the opposite of what we need. So the opposite in this example would be something that weakens our hypothesis. Now, if our question was what would most directly weaken the hypothesis, then D would be right and C would actually be the opposite. Okay, so I wanted to point out those wrong answer choice types on questions that are asking you to support or weaken a hypothesis or a claim. Here's one of the biggest things you need to watch out for on the digital SAT reading section when asked to logically complete text. So the way I would approach question 17 is I'd start by taking a look at the prompt. In this case, we just got which choice logically completes the text. Then I'll go back up and I'll start reading. So we have herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs could grow more than 100 feet long and weigh up to 80 tons. And some researchers have attributed the evolution of sauropods to such massive sizes to increased plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide during the Mesozoic era. In this case, we have researchers attributing something, so I'll mark that with an A. So any sort of hypothesis, claim, attribution along those lines or speculation, I will mark with a letter, in this case A for attribution, and then I'll keep reading. However, there is no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in sauropod evolution, such as when the first large sauropods appear, when several sauropod lineages underwent further evolution toward gigantism, or when sauropods reached their maximum known sizes, suggesting that blank. Okay, well, as you can see, we have a contrast here, and then we go on to describe that there's no evidence for the attribution. So I've got no evidence, I'm gonna underline that. I'll draw the arrow back to attribution so we know that there's no evidence for that. All right, suggesting that what? We have option A, fluctuations in atmospheric carbon dioxide affected different sauropod lineages differently. Well, once again, we have no evidence for fluctuations in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, so no evidence for these fluctuations, so I can get rid of A. We can go and move on to B. We have the evolution of larger body sizes in sauropods did not depend on increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, we know that in our attribution, we thought that it did depend or at least coincide with this increase 
increased plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide, but we know there's no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels. Okay, so we would state then that the evolution of larger body sizes did not depend on increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, so there's evidence to support that. So we can go ahead and mark B as our answer. I'm going to quickly go over C and D as well, and we can discuss which box of wrong answer choice they fit into because there are common types of wrong answer choices on the digital SAT reading section. So here we have C, atmospheric carbon dioxide was higher when the largest known sauropods lived than, when it was, than it was when the first sauropods appeared. Well, once again, if we go back up, we state that there's no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in sauropod evolution. Okay, so there is no support for that spike. Okay, so we can get rid of this based on this part here, that atmospheric carbon dioxide was higher when the largest known sauropods lived. Okay, we don't know that, so we can get rid of C. If we take a look at D now, we have sauropods probably would not have evolved to such immense sizes if atmospheric carbon dioxide had been even slightly higher. So there's a few things wrong with this. Okay, for one, this isn't even supportive of the hypothesis or the attribution. Okay, so it's not even supportive of that. We know the attribution's wrong. Okay, we also know that we never state that sauropods could not have evolved uh, to such immense sizes if atmospheric carbon dioxide had been even slightly higher. So there's no evidence for this. Okay, so we can go ahead and get rid of it based on the fact that there just is no evidence. Okay, so our answer would have to be B. So what I want you to take away from this is a couple things. For one, on this question type, which is a fairly common one, which choice logically completes the text, I want you to mark any claims, hypothesis, attributions, conclusions, things along those lines. I want you to mark them with their coinciding letter um, or underline them, whatever marking you use is up to you. Okay. The next thing is you want to be deliberate about going back to the text. Okay. Because oftentimes you saw as we went through these answer choices, you'll need to go back to see what logically makes sense. And that's especially true for science texts like this. Okay. This is ultimately a science passage. Okay, for science-based passages, you will very often need to go back to the text, okay, find what evidence there is to support what's coming after or what's completing the text. Here's a second example of how I recommend approaching questions that ask you to logically complete text on the digital SAT reading section. So I'll illustrate this with question 18. In documents called judicial opinions, judges explain the reasoning behind their legal rulings, and in those explanations, they sometimes cite and discuss historical and contemporary philosophers. Legal scholar and philosopher Anita L. Allen argues that while judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. And I'm going to mark this with a claim. Okay, it says she's arguing this, so you could mark it with an A, you can mark it with a C. I guess in this case, actually, I'll mark it with an A for our use. So this is her argument. Okay, discussing philosophers whose views conflict with the judge's views could therefore what? Okay, so we have discussing philosophers' views who conflict with the judge's views could. Okay, well, we know that her argument is that while judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. Okay, so discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views, she would argue would therefore strengthen their arguments. Okay, so we have option A, allow judges to craft judicial opinions without needing to consult philosophical works. Well, it's actually the opposite. Okay, it would force judges to craft judicial opinions with, instead of without, with needing to consult philosophical works, since they would have to consult works that they're not familiar with or ones that they disagree with. So they would need to consult them. So we can get rid of A. Okay, A essentially has sort of the incorrect relationship in terms of with versus without. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at B now. We have helped judges improve the arguments that they put forward in their judicial opinions. Well, we know that that is her argument. Her argument is that the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. Therefore, discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views could therefore improve the arguments that they put forward in their judicial opinions. Okay, so this is ultimately going in line with what she is arguing. Okay, so our answer there would have to be B. I'm going to take a look at C and D as well. So we can teach a little bit based on those. We have C, make judicial opinions more comprehensible to readers without legal or philosophical training. Well, we never discuss legal or philosophical training or the comprehensibility to readers. That's not the goal of this. The goal isn't um, in discussing with conflicting philosophers' views. The goal isn't to make it more comprehensible to the readers. The goal is to make it a stronger argument. Okay, so this would be trying to achieve a separate goal or a different goal from what is actually stated by Anita L. Allen. Okay, so this would be if you were not, um, if you misinterpreted basically the argument that she's trying to make or the goal behind this. If we look at D, we have bring judicial opinions in line with views that are broadly held among philosophers. Well, for one thing, philosophers hold many different views. 
Okay, so that wouldn't really make a ton of sense. But also, the goal isn't to bring the judicial opinions in line with the views of philosophers. The goal is just to strengthen the argument. This all goes back to understanding and identifying Anita L. Allen's argument. Okay, her argument, once again, I will go back up, is that well, judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. And then when we go on, we know that we're specifically looking at, and I'm going to underline this again, we're specifically looking at this section, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. We know we're looking specifically at that because we state that discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views could therefore do what? Okay, and since we're talking about how to, um, since we're talking about views that conflict with the judges, okay, that's the potential objections that I underlined here. So it would have to be that it makes the judicial opinion stronger in order to continue this idea. Okay, so there has to be B, as far as what I want you to take away from this, a couple things. I talked about this in the last question I went over that dealt with completing the text, but you want to make sure that you're marking any arguments, claims, hypotheses, conclusions with a letter or some sort of other marking so that you know how to go back to that in the text. The other thing is if you can, I talked about this in a question type that was different than completing the text, but you want to make sure you're understanding where to go back to. Okay. So in this case, you saw that we really, really focused in on the strongest judicial opinions, consider and rebut potential objections. Okay. And the reason is that that is what is directly discussed in this next part, discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges views. That is the potential objections. So as you can see, most of that text, pretty much the whole first half, we're really not very concerned with. So generally on the SAT reading section, and this is not specific just to this question type, if you can limit where you're going back to in the text to just where it is necessary in order to answer the question correctly, that will help you. There will be times when you need to you know, go through more of the text or maybe even all of the text when going through an answer choice. Um, and that's okay. That does happen. But on certain questions, you can keep the scope of text that you need to refer back to more limited, and that will help you save some time. Here's how I recommend you approach questions on the digital SAT reading section that ask you to fill in a quotation to effectively illustrate some sort of claim. Okay. So the first thing that I would do if I had just scrolled down to question 12 is I would identify, in this case, I need to effectively illustrate a claim. I would underline the fact that it's a claim. Okay, so I'm going to mark my claim as I do this read-through. So we have O Pioneers is a 1913 novel by Willa Cather. In the novel, Cather portrays Alexandra Bergson as having a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. Okay, the claim here is that Bergson has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. So that's the claim. Okay, so now we just need to go A, B, C, D find one that supports that. So the question that you need to ask yourself after you read through each answer choice here is, does this support the claim? Okay. Or does this illustrate the claim rather? Okay. Illustrate. Does it illustrate the claim? So let's go ahead and start with A. She had never, she had never known before how much the country meant to her. Okay. So this is illustrating that she cares for the country. The chirping of the insects down in the long grass had been like the sweetest music. She had felt as if her heart were hiding down there. Okay, so it felt as if her heart were hiding down there somewhere with the quail and the plover and all the little wine, wild things that crooned or buzzed in the sun. Okay, so obviously she has an emotional connection here. It feels her heart is hiding down there. Under the long shaggy ridges, she felt the future stirring. So clear that she has a deep emotional connection to nature from answer choice A. Okay, so obviously that is illustrating the claim. I'll quickly go over B, C, and D as well because it can be helpful to understand why wrong answer choices are wrong. So we have B, Alexandra talked about talked to the men about their crops and to the women about their poultry. She spent a whole day with one young farmer who had been away at school and who was experimenting with a new kind of clover hay. She learned a great deal. So some people might look at B and say, okay, it talks a ton about nature. That must be the answer, but it's not because we have to keep in mind the entirety of our claim. If we scroll up, we see our claim is that she has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. Okay. Answer choice B, while it talks about nature, it does not show or illustrate that she has a deep emotional connection to nature. It is just talking about her um, sort of learning more about nature, okay, but not showing she has a deep emotional connection to it. I can learn about football. That doesn't mean I have a deep emotional connection to football. Okay, so that's that's why B would have to be wrong there. Okay, so understand that just because we talk about one of the topics mentioned in the claim does not mean we are illustrating the claim. If you look at C, we have Alexandra drove off alone. The rattle of her wagon was lost in the howling of the wind, but her lantern held firmly between her feet made a moving point of light along the highway going deeper and deeper into the dark country. Okay, once again, even though we are talking about going into the dark country, which can be pertained or could be you know thought of, as going deeper into possibly nature, if you were to associate country with nature, which is a pretty fair association. 
It does not support, once again, the fact that she has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. Okay, so you have to make sure that you are illustrating the entirety of the claim and not just talking about one of the topics of the claim, which would be nature in this case. If you look at D, we have, it was Alexandra who read the papers and followed the markets and who learned by the mistakes of their neighbors. It was Alexandra who could always tell you about what it had cost to fatten each steer and who could guess the weight of a hog before it went on the scale closer than John Bergson, her father himself. Okay, so a couple things I want to point on on this one. Okay, first off, at the end here, when we talk about how she could guess the weight of a hog before it went on the scales closer than her father himself, that's probably indicating that she grew up close to nature, close probably on a farm. Okay, since she's able to guess the weight of a hog better than her father is, so presumably she has done a lot of work on a farm. So that's kind of what that is indicating. But I could once again, kind of the same similar example to football, right? If I had worked on a farm for a long time, that does not necessarily mean I have a deep emotional connection to nature. It just means I've worked on a farm for a long time and probably know how much a hog weighs, okay? So you cannot associate that. That does not illustrate having a deep emotional connection with nature, okay? So that's the problem with D. So I think the key thing I want you to take away from um, this question and sort of this example is, number one, the way you approach this, identify what you need, okay? In this case, you have to first identify the claims. We identify the claim. In this case, we need to illustrate that claim. So we go through A, B, C, and D, okay? Find which one illustrates that and recognize that we need to actually illustrate it. We cannot just mention or talk about the topic, okay? In this case, it was nature, but it could be another topic. It's not enough just to discuss the topic or put the character in a setting where the topic is. You have to actually illustrate the entirety of the claim. Here's a second example of a question where you're asked to provide a quotation to effectively illustrate a claim. Okay, so this is very similar to the last question. In this case, we are dealing with a poem, however. There's also one other thing I wanna point out with this question, which is why I wanted to include it here. So we have question 12. To you is an 1856 poem by Walt Whitman, and the poem Whitman suggests that readers whom he addresses directly have not fully understood it themselves. Writing, all right, well, first, let's go ahead and identify the claim. Okay, the claim is that the readers who he's addressing directly have not fully understood themselves. Yes, that's the claim. They have not fully understood themselves. Okay, now we gotta keep in mind this is a poem, so let's go ahead and go through our options. We also need to understand that he's writing this poem directly to the reader. It's called To You, okay? So we need to understand the perspective of the reader. The perspective is he's addressing them directly, okay? And that's stated up here, that he's addressing them directly. So perspective is something you need to pay attention to on the SAT reading and writing section. So just recognize that. If you come across a poem, especially, you're gonna wanna be able to recognize perspective. Um, narratives as well, but in particular poems, Okay, so let's go ahead and look through our options. We have option A, you have not known what you are. You have slumbered upon yourself all your life. Your eyelids have been the same as closed most of the time. Okay, you have not known what you are. You have slumbered upon yourself. Okay, sleep is sort of a signifier for not fully understanding yourself. But if you're looking for something even more explicit, you have this first part before the comma, you have not known what you are. You do not understand yourself, okay, is essentially what he's saying. And when you take into account perspective, when he says you have not known what you are, he is saying you have not fully understood yourself. Okay, so A is perfect there. Let's go ahead and talk about B, C, and D as well. Okay, so we have option B. These immense meadows, these interminable rivers, you are immense and interminable as they. Well, him calling the reader, in that case is us, because we are the reader here, immense is not stating that we have not fully understood ourselves. So we can get rid of B, that is not illustrating the claim. If we take a look at C, I should have made my way straight to you long ago. I should have blabbed nothing but you. I should have chanted nothing but you. Once again, that is not showing that, or is not illustrating that we have not fully understood ourselves. So we can get rid of C. Okay, now we get into D. And D is where perspective really comes into play. Okay, option D states, I will leave all and come and make hymns of you. None has understood you, but I understand you. So what many people will do here is they will see none has understood you, and they will translate that into thinking that D has to be the answer. Because if we scroll up, the claim is that Whitman's suggesting to the readers, who he's addressing directly, that they have not fully understood themselves. But this is where perspective comes into play. If I say to you, my viewer right now, no one has understood you, would you interpret that to mean that you yourself have not understood you? Probably not, okay? If someone says to me, no one has understood you, Hayden, I would not interpret that to mean that I myself have not understood myself, okay? So this is where perspective comes into play. Because he is addressing us directly, we need to recognize and interpret this as no one has understood you. That is not the same as saying that you have not understood yourself. 
because of the perspective here. Okay, so that is the problem with answer choice D. Okay, D is stating, I will leave all and come and make the hymns of you. None has understood you, but I understand you. Okay, so ultimately we can get rid of D. We see our answer has to be answer choice A. Here's how I recommend you approach questions on the digital SAT reading section that ask you to use data from either a table, graph, or any sort to support or weaken any sort of claim or hypothesis or conclusion. Okay, so I'm gonna illustrate this with question number 15. The way I would start is I'd start by reading through the passage. So I have Alicia Monte Sinos, Navarro, Isabel Storer, and Rocio Perez Barrales recently examined several plots within a diverse plant community in Southeast Spain. The researchers calculated that if individual plants were randomly distributed on this particular landscape, only about 15% would be with other plants and patches of vegetation. So one thing that will jump out to me here is the fact that it's randomly distributed. Okay, anytime that I see something's randomly distributed, I'm usually gonna pay attention to it. Um, that goes for the reading section as well as the math section actually. Um, but we'll keep reading. They counted the number of juvenile plants of five species growing in patches of vegetation and the number growing alone on bare ground and compared those numbers to what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed, Okay, which we obviously have up there. Based on these results, they claim that plants of these species that grow in close proximity to other plants gain an advantage at an early developmental stage. So here we have a claim. Okay, Anytime we have a claim, hypothesis, conclusion, anything along those lines, I will always mark it because okay, that makes it easier for me to come back and find it later. So which choice best describes data from the table that supports the claim? So we're looking to support this claim. If we take a look at the table now, and that is what I will do, okay, before going to the answer choices, I will actually go back to the table. Now I will note that this is a case where it can be somewhat of a personal preference for me personally. I would prefer to go back to the table, find what data is supporting this claim, and then look through the answer choices. For some people, they may want to go straight to the answer choices. I would recommend that you go to the claim or go from the, after reading the claim and after reading the prompt going to the table, I just find that it makes it easier to avoid getting misled by some of the answer choices, but um, you know, you can kind of make your own decision there. So let's go ahead and go through this. So we've got to support the claim that species that grow in close proximity gain an advantage on early developmental stage. We have juvenile plants found growing on bare ground and in patches of vegetation for five species. We got the five species, we got the number found in bare ground, found in patches of vegetation. We got the total, we got the percent found in patches of vegetation. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind here is that if they were randomly distributed, we'd expect that 15% would be with other plants and patches of vegetation. So we would expect that the percent found in patches of vegetation would be 15%. Okay, so 15%. And that's for individual plants. So it doesn't give a, a name on the species. So I would just expect 50% in all of these then, 15%. As we can see, we don't have that. We'd have above 50% in all of them, which is more than three times what would be expected. Okay, so that's really the evidence I'm looking for is pretty much stating um, pretty much all of this column of this table. Um, is obviously more than three times what was expected. So let's go down and look at our options. Okay, so we have option A. For all five species, less than 75% of juvenile plants were growing in patches of vegetation. Well, that is not supporting the claim. Okay, so we can get rid of A. We need to focus on the fact that it's three times what would be expected compared to random distribution. We've got B. The species with the greatest number of juvenile plants growing was H. Stowe. Stowe. Okay, we don't really care um, about one particular species versus the other. Okay, we used five species, if we look at back up at our text, but we're not really concerned with a comparison of the species. Okay, so we've got option C, we got for T. Liban libanitis and T. moradero, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was less than what would be expected if plants were randomly distributed. Well, we actually see that it's more than what would be expected if plants were randomly distributed. So this would fall into the bucket of wrong answer choices that is... Um, the incorrect, um, I guess in this case, it's a, a misinterpretation, okay, because it's actually stating, it's really just misinterpreting the data. It's stating that it's less than what would be expected, but it's actually more, okay? So this would just be a misinterpretation of the data. We've got option D now. For each species, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was substantially higher than what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed. Okay, we see that that's true according to the data. Okay, as you can see, by going back to the table first and finding what data from the table would support that claim, okay, I was able to have an idea of what I'm looking for before going into the answer choices. Here's a second example of how I recommend that you approach questions on the digital SAT reading section that ask you to use data for some reason, whether that's to support or weaken some sort of claim, or in this case, to complete an example. So first thing I would take a look at is the prompt. Okay, we've already gone over that. So from here, instead of going straight to the data, I'm gonna go ahead and go to where I have my passage. So we have some researchers studying indigenous actors and filmmakers in the United States have turned their attention to the early days of cinema, particularly the 1910s and 1920s, when people like James Young Deere, Dark Cloud, Edwin Carre, Lillian St. Cyr, 
known professionally as Red Wing, were involved in one way or another with numerous films. In fact, so many films and associated records of this era have been lost that counts of those four figures' outputs should be taken as bare minimums rather than totals. It's entirely possible, for example, that, okay, we have four example, so we need to discuss what we're getting an example of. Well, ultimately, we state that um, so many films and associated records have been lost that counts for these figures outputs should be taken as bare minimums rather than to rather than totals. It's entirely possible, for example, that blank. Okay, so we'd be looking to discuss how um, it looks like in our table, we've got number of films known and commonly credited. And then we have years active in the individual credited credited film output. Keep in mind, since this is the credited film output, we've discussed how that's a bare minimum, not a total. And then we're stating it's entirely possible. Okay, since we're saying it's possible that um, these are bare, since these are bare minimums, it would be possible that our numbers would be higher than what's in this table then. Okay, so um, which choice effectively uses data to complete the example? Okay, in this case, like on the last question, I prefer to go back to the ta data table, okay, and try to figure out how I can use that to, in this case, I need to complete the example. In the past example, it was supported claim. So to complete the example, it's much more difficult to actually come down with an idea of what you're looking for. But in this case, um, looks like we're just gonna be looking for an example that provides greater numbers than what's in here for all these for all these uh, these rows, because what's in these rows is really just to be bare minimums is what we're told, not the actual totals. So we've got option A: Dark Cloud acted in significantly fewer films than did Saint Lillian. Lillian St. Cyr, who's credited with 66 performances. Well, that's not providing an example. Okay, keep in mind, we need to provide that example because that's what we're told. We've got B, Edwin Carrie's 47 credited acting roles include only films made after 1934. Well, if we go up, we've got years active, 1912 to 1934 for Edwin Carey. Uh, his 47 acting roles include only films after 1934. Well, we've got 47 acting roles here. We see that that's from 1912 to 1934. So B is incorrect according to the data. So we can get rid of that. Okay, we can go down. We can look at option C. We have Lillian St. Cyr acted in far more than 66 films and Edwin Carre directed more than 58. So Lillian St. Cyr, we can find where she is. We have got 66 here. Okay, this is the amount that she's credited for. We know that we're looking for that being a bare minimum and that she actually did more than that. So this makes sense. Next, we have Edwin Carre directed more than 58. We see Edwin Carre uh, was credited as the director for 58. Once again, we're stating that he did more than that, which is in line with an example that these are bare minimums and not totals. Okay, so C looks perfect. We'll take a quick look as, at D as well. D states that James Young Deere actually directed 33 films and acted in only 10. Okay, we can find James Young Deere. We see that he's credited with 33, okay, and he's credited as the writer for uh, 10, so 33 actor and uh, writer for 10. Uh, so in this case, it's stating that he actually directed 33 films. Oh, okay, he's stated as the director for 35, so that'd be less than. So that is not an example. So that'd actually be the opposite of what we are looking for. So you could put that in the bucket of an opposite um, for the wrong answer choice, okay? So our answer there would have to be answer choice C. Okay, so the key thing I want you to take away from these last two examples is you have a question like this where you're asked to use data for you know something or another on the SAT reading section that I recommend that you would approach it would be you start by taking a look at the prompt. From there, go to the passage. Once you're done with the passage, figure out what you need from the data. Go back to the data. Once you're done going back to the data, have an idea of what you're looking for in your answer choice to either support, weekend, whatever you need, then go to your answer choices. In this section of the course, you'll see me solve over 150 practice problems from the released digital SAT practice test. For each question, I try to explain the strategy I'm using along with any tips, tricks, or advice I have for similar questions. I'm teaching these concepts through released practice questions because it allows you to not only learn the math required to be able to solve these questions, but also learn how to best apply them to the digital SAT. Here's how to answer this SAT math question in under 30 seconds. The question states the line graph shows the percent of cars for sale at a used car lot on a given day by model year. For what model year is the percent of cars for sale the smallest? Well, we see on our y-axis we have the percent of cars for sale and we just have to find where that's the smallest. We see that that's in the year 2014, so our answer is going to be answer choice C. Here's how to answer this probability question on the SAT. Question two states for a particular machine that produces beads, 29 out of every 100 beads it produces have a defect. A bead produced by the machine will be selected at random. What is the probability of selecting a bead that has a defect? In this case, we are looking for those that have a defect, which we know is 29 out of every 100. So we know that our probability of that must be in choice C, 29 out of 100. Here's how to answer this question about intersecting lines on the SAT. Question three states in the figure, line M is parallel to line N and line T intersects both lines. What is the value of X? Well, since M and N are parallel, line T is intersecting them, we know that X is going to be the same as the angle X I just drew next to that angle 33. Now we also know that a semicircle has 180 degrees in it. So all we have to do is 180 degrees minus 33 degrees, and that will give us our answer of 147 degrees as the angle X. So our answer is D. 
Here's how to find the y-intercept of this graph on the SAT. The question states, what is the y-intercept of the graph shown? All you gotta do is find where we're crossing that y-axis where x is zero, and we see that that is at eight, so our answer there is going to be zero, eight. So here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 60 seconds. The question states, the total cost f of x in dollars to lease a car for 36 months from a particular car dealership is given by f of x equals 36x plus 1,000, where x is the monthly payment in dollars. What is the total cost to lease a car when the monthly payment's 400? We know the monthly payment's are represented by x, so we can go ahead and substitute 400 in for x, and we will have 36 times 400 plus 1,000, and that will end up giving us our answer of $15,400, which is answer choice C. Here's how to solve this question about perimeters on the SAT. Question six states, each side of the square has a length of 45. What is the perimeter of a square? Well, we know a square's sides are all the same, so the perimeter will just be four times the side length, which we know is 45. We can go ahead and put four times 45 in our calculator, or you can just do it in your head, and you're gonna get 180 for your answer as the perimeter of the square. Here's how to solve this SAT math question that deals with factoring. Question seven states, what is the positive solution to the given equation? In order to solve this, we need to ultimately get it set equal to zero, so let's go ahead and do that by multiplying both sides by x plus six. Once we do that, we have x times x plus six. We'll also go ahead and subtract 55 from each side so we can set it equal to zero and now we have our equation. So let's go ahead and distribute this x to this other x to get x squared and then also plus 6x. So now we have x squared plus 6x minus 55 is equal to zero. Now let's go ahead and factor. So I'm looking for factors of negative 55 that will sum to have positive six. So when I do that, I can think we've got 11 and five. Um, I need to keep it positive. So I'm gonna have to have x plus 11 and I would have to have x minus five. Now we factor, we have to keep in mind that we can't just pick either one, we need to have the positive solution to the given equation. So we know that x plus 11 will ultimately mean that x could equal negative 11, but we can't choose that because that's negative. We need to have x equals five, so our answer there would be five. Here's how to translate this word problem into an equation and solve it on the SAT. Question eight states an object travels at a constant speed of 12 centimeters per second. At this speed, what is the time in seconds that it will take for the object to travel 108 centimeters? Well, this is pretty easy. The distance that you're traveling is 108 centimeters. You wanna know how long it's gonna take you. You are traveling at 12 centimeters per second. Okay, you're multiplying by your time in seconds. Okay, we'll have T represented as time. In order to solve for T then, all you gotta do is divide 108 by 12 to get your answer. When you do that, you're gonna end up with your answer of nine, which is answer choice A. Here's how to solve this question about comparing the mean of two data sets on the SAT. Question nine states, the list gives the values in data sets X and Y. Which statement correctly compares the mean of data set X with the mean of data set Y? Well, let's go ahead and find the means of both. We'll start with the data set X. So the mean is gonna be the sum of these numbers divided by four. So five plus nine plus nine plus 13. Now I see I have these same numbers in data set Y. Now I also have a 27 added on to data set Y. Now, since we've got these same four numbers in data set X as in Y, and then we are just adding in 27, we know 27 has to be greater than whatever the mean is in data set X because the maximum value in data set X is 13 and 27 is higher than that. So it's gonna have to bring that mean up. Therefore, we know that data set Y has to have a larger mean than data set X without even having to calculate the means just by looking at this. So we know our answer there has to be B. If you wanna calculate the means for this, you can, but you could also just recognize that 27 is larger than the maximum data set X. Other than that, they're the same. Therefore, data set Y has to be a larger mean. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 60 seconds. Question 10 states, a rocket contained 467,000 kilograms of propellant before launch. Exactly 21 seconds after launch, 362,105 kilograms of the propellant remained. On average, approximately how much propellant in kilograms did the rocket burn each second after launch? Well, our starting amount of propellant is 467,000. We then have to subtract how much propellant remained, and then we have to divide all of that by the amount of seconds that this took place, which is 21 seconds. Once we put that into our calculator, we're gonna end up with answer choice A, and that'll give us exactly, or approximately, how much propellant in kilograms the rocket burned each second after launch. Here's how to use ratios to move faster on the SAT math section. Question 11 states, if four X plus two equals 12, what is the value of 16 X plus eight? Whenever I see a question like this, I'm always looking for proportions. I see four X plus two, if I multiply that by four, I get 16 X plus eight. So all I gotta do is multiply 12 by four. 12 times four is going to equal 48. So my answer is 48. My answer there is B. This way I don't have to solve for X, so I get it done faster. Here's how to interpret a common situation on the SAT math section. Question 12 states, an object is kicked from a platform. The equation H equals negative 4.9 T squared plus 7T plus 9 represents the situation where H is the height of the object above the ground in meters T seconds after it is kicked, which number represents the height in meters from which the object was kicked. Okay, a common a question on the SAT deals with something falling uh, from some certain height, whether it's thrown off, kicked off, launched off, things like that. And the way that it's usually represented is in an equation like this. In this case, we're asked 
which number represents the height from which the object was kicked. Well, the height at which it is kicked is when it time is at zero, right? It, it's only kicked once the time is zero. So that means T would be zero, which makes this zero, which makes that zero, which means that nine is the height when it is first kicked. So our answer there has to be D. Here's the type of question where you should use Desmos on the digital SAT. Question 13 states that f of x is equal to 4x squared minus 50x plus 126. The given equation defines the function f for what value of x does f of x reach its minimum. If I saw a question on like, like this on the new digital SAT, I would use Desmos for it 100%. I would just check where the minimum is. So I'll go ahead and show you how you would do that. All you gotta do, pull up Desmos. You can do this on the digital SAT. It's built into the College Board's blue book. So you'd put in the equation, you'd look for where the minimum is. The minimum's at 6.25 for the X value of the minimum. So your answer there would be 6.25. So this is a great example of the type of question where it really does make sense to use Desmos on the new digital SAT. Here's how to set up and solve the system of inequalities question on the SAT. Question 14 states a small business owner budgets $2,200 to purchase candles. The owner must purchase a minimum of 200 candles to maintain the discounted pricing. If the owner pays $4.90 per candle to purchase small candles and $11.60 per candle to purchase large candles, okay, I'm using S for small candles, I'll use L for large candles, what is the maximum number of large candles the owner can purchase to stay within the budget and maintain the discount pricing? So we only have two candle sizes, so we can go ahead and determine the total number of our candles will be L plus S. I wanna quickly point something out. You saw as I read through this, I was writing out the system of inequalities as I go. If you encounter a question on the SAT math section that is three lines or longer, it is most likely going to end up being a question that involves either system of inequalities, two equations that you need to set up, um, possibly something to do with uh, converting units or something along those lines. But either way, my general recommendation is if a question is three lines or longer on the SAT math section, you try to write down units, variables, and obviously like the coefficients in front of certain units, um, any sort of constants, things like that. Basically, you want to start writing your equation as you read through the word problem, because otherwise, if I hadn't written down these two inequalities, I would have to go back and do a second read through. So this is a strategy that I use and that I recommend you use to save time. That being said, let's go ahead and solve for the number of large candles. One thing I want to point out here is you'll notice I'm solving for L right away, not S. That's because I don't give about S. I don't care about S at all right? We don't need S, we just need L. So that's all we're going to focus on solving. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and subtract, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to subtract L from each side because we want to isolate S. And the reason why is we want to substitute in for S something with L. Okay, so let's go ahead and get S by subtracting L from both sides. We get 200 minus L is going to be less than or equal to S. Now we can go ahead and substitute in. Okay, so let's go ahead and substitute that in for S. Okay, so we got 4.9 times S, which we know we can represent as 200 minus L. Okay, and keep in mind that we still have a plus 11.6L right here. So let's go ahead and distribute the 4.9 to the negative L into the 200. 4.9 times 200 is going to give us 980. Okay, so equals 980. And then we're gonna have minus 4.9L and plus 11.6L, which will give us plus 6.7L in total. Okay, because 11.6L minus 4.9L gives us that plus 6.7L. Now that all is still gonna be 2200. Over there, we'll subtract 980 from both sides, minus 980. That's gonna end up leaving us with 1220. 20 is going to be greater than or equal to 6.7L. Okay, from there, we would divide both sides by 6.7. So we'll go ahead and do that, divide both sides by 6.7. Okay, 1220 divided by 6.7. I'll go ahead and put that in my calculator. That's gonna be 182.09. Okay, 182. I'll just call it 0.1. Okay, it's 0.09. All right, now we have to see that L has to be less than or equal to that, okay? So in order to be less than 182.1, we would go to 182. We can't have 0.1 of something, okay? So our answer there, in this case, we can't because we have 0.1 of a candle, right? So our answer there would be 182. So we can go ahead and write that down and we'll circle that. So 182, there's our answer. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 30 seconds. Question 15 states in the linear function f, f of zero is equal to eight and f of one is equal to 12. Which equation defines f? Immediately I see I have that f of zero is equal to eight, which means that my y-intercept is eight. I see all of these are in slope intercept form and I see the intercept of C and B is not eight so I can get rid of them. Next thing I see is the difference between A and D is the slope. If I look at my slope, I'm going over one and I'm going up by four. So my slope is four. So my answer there has to be answer choice D. Here's how to interpret this SAT math problem. Question 16 states that the function f of w is equal to six w squared gives the area in the area of a rectangle in square feet. If its width is w feet and its length is six times its width, which of the following is the best interpretation of f of 14 is equal to 1,176? All right, well, ultimately this function is giving us our area. We know that W represents our width. So F of 14 means that our width is 14 feet. 
And then that 1,176 means that when our width is 14 feet, our area of our rectangle is 1,176 feet. That's answer choice A, so A is our correct answer there. Here's how to answer this SAT math problem about arc lengths by using ratios and proportions. Question 17 states that the circle shown has center O, circumference 144 pi, and diameters PR and QS. The length of arc PS is twice the length of arc PQ. So we'll call arc PQX. And the length of arc PS we know is twice that. So we'll call that 2X. I'll go ahead and mark those lengths here. Okay, the next thing we are asked is what is the length of arc QR? Well, arc QR is going to be the same length as arc PS. So I'm going to go ahead and focus on solving for PS just because it's easier for me to show on this video. So if we go ahead and draw this, we see that it's X plus 2X, so that's going to be 3X. We also know our circumference is 144 pi. If our circumference is 144 pi, our circumference is that whole line around the circle, right? It's all of this, that line right there. Okay, so if our circumference is 144 pi, then that semicircle, right, that semi arc, semi arc is going to be 72 pi. Okay, so then we know that 72 pi is equal to 3x, right, because it's the sum of that 2x and that x. Therefore, you would know that ps, which is the same as qr, okay, is two thirds, two thirds of that. Okay, so it'd just be 72 pi, just be 72 pi times two thirds. Okay, and when we put that in your calculator, or you can just do it in your head, you're gonna end up with 48 pi as the value for q to r. You could have also done it by doing that 72 pi is equal to 3x, okay, and then solving for x and then taking it in and multiplying it by two, but easier ways just to recognize that, hey, this is a ratio, right? It's two thirds, two thirds times 72 pi gets you 48 pi. It's a lot easier than going through and solving for x. So I wanted to put the x down there just so you guys could see and understand sort of how it breaks down, but ultimately it's a lot better if you can just recognize, hey, this is a ratio. We've got half, of this whole circumference is 72 pi. We are taking two thirds of that to get arc of QR. So answer there is B. Here's a couple tips for the SAT math section to help you be more efficient. I'm gonna illustrate them with question 18. Question 18 states a company that provides whale watching tours takes groups of 21 people at a time. The company's revenue is $80 per adult. So I'm gonna represent that as 80A and $60 per child, which I'll represent as 60 times C. If the company's revenue for one group consisting of adults and children was $1,440. Okay, so that's gonna be the sum of these, the value of the number of adults times the cost per adult plus the number of kids times cost per kid. How many people in the group were children? Well, we know that it consists of adults and children, so we can represent that as A plus C. As you can see, I did one read through and I have both my equations, so that's tip number one here. As you read through an SAT math problem, that is three or more lines. As you can see, in this case, it was six. That's why I knew that I wanted to use this sort of this sort of tip or trick. Anytime you've got an SAT math problem longer than three lines, try to write out the equation or the system of equations as you read through. That way you save time by not having to re do a reread through, right? Right afterwards to find your variables and things like that. Okay, that being said, let's go ahead and keep talking because there's more tips to come here. Now, keep in mind, we are asked to solve for how many people in the group were children. So you could go through and you could solve for A first and then get to C, but you shouldn't do that. You should go ahead and solve for C first. You want the most direct path to your answer on the SAT math section because it's a timed exam and you want to be efficient. So we're going straight for C. We're not, we don't want to get A. We don't need it. So we won't, we just don't want to even see it. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to substitute in a value with C for this A value there. The way we do that is by subtracting C from both sides to get 21 minus C is equal to A. Now we go ahead and sub substitute in. Okay, so it will be 80 times 21 minus C plus 60 C is equal to 14. We go ahead and distribute our 80 to our 21 and to our C. 80 times 21 is going to be 1680. And then we are also going to have minus 80 C plus 60 C is going to equal 14. Now we want to start isolating our C. So minus 80 C and plus 60 C is going to leave us with negative 20 C. Okay, and we're also going to go ahead and subtract 1680 from both sides. Okay, subtract 1680 from both sides. This is going to leave us with 240, or I guess negative 240 is equal to negative 20C. Now from here, uh, we're gonna go ahead and divide both sides by negative 20. Negative 240 divided by negative 20 is gonna leave you with your answer of C is 12. So our answer there will be answer choice C because we have 12 children. And as you can see, by solving for the number of children first, we didn't have to go back through and solve for the number of adults. We never have to know the number of adults. If you wanted to go back through and see, obviously you could just put in the number 12 there for, for C, but 
Uh, it's not necessary. You don't need to know the number of adults, so don't care about it. Don't need to focus on it. Just get the number you need to get to and move on to the next question. Here's how to find x and y intercepts quickly when you have an equation in slope intercept form. Question 19 states the function h is defined by h of x is equal to 4x plus 28. The graph of y equals h of x in the xy plane has an x intercept at a and 0 and a y intercept at 0b, where a and b are constants. What is the value of a plus b? Well, in this case, there's no way to just get to A plus B. Normally, if I see something like that, that's what I'd like to do. In this case, you have to actually find both A and B. So in this case, let's go ahead and start by finding A. We see that A is where our Y value is zero. Well, where our Y value is zero, we have 4X plus 28 is equal to zero. We subtract 28 from both sides. If we get negative 28 is equal to 4X, we divide both sides by four. Negative 28 over four is going to equal negative seven as the value of X. Now let's go ahead and solve for our B value. And keep in mind that X there uh, would equal that A value. Okay, so A is negative seven. Now let's go ahead and solve for what B is equal to. Okay, B is where our X value is zero. So we just put in zero there and we see that we ultimately are gonna get 28. Okay, so we're asked for the value of A plus B. So we just do 28 plus negative seven, which is the same as 28 minus seven. That's gonna leave us with 21. So our answer there is A. Here's an example of an SAT math question that's gotten way easier now that the SAT has gone digital. Question 20 states, one of the factors of 2X cubed plus 42X squared plus 208X is X plus B, where B is a positive constant. What is the smallest possible value of B? Now keep in mind, you need the smallest possible value of B. And that's important here because there's gonna be two possible answers. But I want to show you why this question is so much easier now that you have Desmos built into Blue Book on the, di the digital SAT. Before, you would have to factor this out, and that could be a bit difficult, and there's a lot of room for error when you're doing that. But now that you have Desmos in the Blue Book app when you're taking the digital SAT, you can just put it into Desmos. Now, you have to also understand how to work the problem with Desmos. So in this case, you know that you need the value x plus b. Now, what that means is that you're looking specifically in this case at the negative x values or the negative x values on, in regards to the x intercept, right? So let me go ahead and zoom in here. The reason that we're going to the negative section is because it can't be a positive number because these are ultimately our zeros. They're not our values for b, okay? Our zeros here, and as you can see, the first negative or the first zero there is at negative eight, okay? Now that does not mean negative eight is our answer because it's not. Okay, because you have to keep in mind that we're looking for the value of b and x plus b. And x plus b, since it's one of our factors, has to be set equal to zero, which means that x is actually going to equal negative b. Now we know our value for x, okay, our value for x is negative eight, which means that b has to equal positive eight. Okay, so our answer there will be eight. Now, you really need to make sure that if you are using Desmos, which I do recommend you do, you do take close account to the signs of values and you understand how to interpret these graphs. Because if you don't understand how to interpret these graphs, but you try to use them, it's not going to help you. So as you saw, when I looked here, I had to understand that I'm looking for the value of B, okay? To get to that, I need to understand how a factor works, right? The factor has to be set equal to zero. And then once I find this value of X, I have to remember to get that back to B. So make sure that when you do use Desmos on the digital SAT, which I do recommend you do because it helps a ton and makes you faster, less prone to error, that you do at least understand how to interpret these graphs. Here's what you need to know about questions that ask you about the number of real solutions to a quadratic equation on the SAT. I'm gonna illustrate this with question 21. Question 21 states in the given system of equations, A is a positive constant. The system has exactly one distinct real solution. What is the value of A? Whenever you have a question asking you about two real solutions, one real solution is no real solutions, or the number of real solutions, it's basically testing, do you know this crucial rule? And that rule is b squared minus 4ac, okay? Now, this works when you have an equation, a quadratic equation, that is set equal to zero, okay? So a quadratic equation looks like this, and it's gotta equal out to zero. Now, I'll show you how we get to there in regards to this question in a second, but first, I wanna explain this rule. So b squared minus 4ac, if this value is greater than zero, and that means that there are going to be two real solutions. Now, what if this value is equal to zero? In that case, there is one real solution. And what if this value is less than zero? Well, if b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, then that means that there are going to be no real solutions. Okay, so zero real solutions. Okay, I guess I should actually express that as zero because that's the way it is commonly shown on the SAT, zero real solutions. Okay, with this being said, I wanna go ahead and go over how we apply this in this question. Okay, so in order to get our b squared minus 4ac value, like I said, we have to set it equal to zero. In this case, it is not set to equal to zero yet. We have to substitute in this minus one and a half for y first. So then we would end up with minus one and a half 
is equal to x squared plus 8x plus a. Okay, from here, I'm gonna go ahead and add one and a half to each side so that we can get it set equal to zero. So we can use this, this rule of b squared minus 4ac. Okay, so then we have that much plus a plus one and a half. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to pick essentially a random variable, which I'm just gonna call, uh, we'll use j, no, no, I'm trying to pick one that doesn't sound like a, or look like a number. Let's use, a, we're gonna use z. Okay, and I'll try to make it very differentiated. Okay, I'm gonna let z equal a plus 1.5. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and substitute in z for a plus 1.5, and you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment here. Okay, so now we have our quadratic equation. It's set equal to zero. Now we can do b squared minus 4ac. Now you may be wondering, what's b, what's a, and what's c? Well, I'll go ahead and show you. Okay, our a value is whatever coefficient is in front of this x squared. Since there's no coefficient in front of it, it's one. Okay, so our a value is one. Our b value is going to be eight, it's whatever's in front of that X, okay? And our C value is the constant, which in this case we're representing as Z. All right, so B is eight, so that's gonna be squared. Eight squared is 64, okay? So B squared minus four times A, our A value is one, okay? So we don't need to show that, okay? And then times C, which we're representing as uh, Z to represent that A plus 1.5. All right, now we know that there has to be exactly one real solution, which means we have to set it equal to zero. Now it's pretty easy to solve. We're gonna go ahead and add four Z to each side. So we'll have four Z is equal to 64, We'll divide both sides by four to isolate z. So now we have z all alone. We know that z is equal to 64 over four, which is going to equal 16. Okay, so now z is 16. Well, now that we have z is 16, we can go back up here and we have 16 is equal to a plus one and a half. I'm gonna erase this so you can kind of see what I'm doing back up here. 16 is equal to a plus one and a half. I subtract one and a half from each side and I get 14.5 is equal to a. Okay, so there's what you need to know about the number of real solutions on the SAT math section along with this question as an example of how you can apply it. Here's how to quickly answer this SAT math question by understanding zeros. Question 22 states f of x is equal to x plus six times x plus five times x minus four. The function f is given. Which table of values represents y is equal to f of x minus three? Very important thing to hear is to recognize is that f of x is this equation. We have to do that minus three there, okay? So what we can actually call this is I'm just gonna scratch this out, I'll call it y, and then I'll just add that minus three at the end. It's the same thing. All right, so now we have our new equation y. The next thing that we see is that we have to find the table of values that represents it. The key thing that I'm looking for here is I wanna find where I have a zero in parentheses, which we're gonna have when x is, sorry, let me write that where you can see it. Uh, we're going to have that where x is at negative 6, because negative 6 plus 6 is 0. We're going to have that where x is negative 5, because negative 5 plus 5 is 0. We'll have that where x is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. I'm going to look for those x values in my table here. I see all of them are in here, okay? So I know they're all there. Anytime I have one of these, I'm going to have a y value of negative 3, because 0 times anything is going to end up being 0. So then I just end up with 0 minus 3. Okay, as we can see, a has to then be incorrect. B has to be correct because as all of these values of our zeros in this X side of the table and has negative three for all of them. So B is our correct answer. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question by understanding the equation for exponential growth. Question 23 states that for the function Q, the value of Q of X decreases by 45% for every increase in the value of X by one. If Q of zero is equal to 14, which equation defines Q? Well, Q of zero being 14 means that our Y intercept where x is zero is going to be 14, which means our initial value is 14. So we can get rid of a and b because their initial values are not 14. Next thing we need to recognize is our growth rate, okay, or our growth factor. We have q of x decreasing by 45% for every increase in the value of x by one. If we're decreasing by 45%, that means our growth factor is 0.55, okay? We're not getting bigger. Answer choice D would mean that we are increasing. We're decreasing, so that growth factor has to be less than one. So our answer there is C. Here's a trap to avoid on the SAT math section. Question 24 states the graph of y equals f of x plus 14 is shown. Which equation defines the function f? Many people will pick answer choice C on this question because they'll see the y-intercept is two and pick answer choice C, but that's not correct. And the reason why is because you have to pay close attention to the details on the SAT math section. This question states the graph of y equals f of x plus 14 is shown. And we're asked to define the function f, not the function y, not y equals f of x plus 14. So the function f has to be down, it has to have a y-intercept that is 14 below where it is on this graph. So if we go down 14 from two, we have to be at negative 12, which means our y-intercept has to be negative 12, and our answer has to be answer choice A, because that's the only answer choice with negative 12 as the y-intercept. So on the SAT math section, pay very close attention to details with what you're asked to answer with, and any equations that you're given, any equations or functions that you're given in the context of the question.
Here's how to solve this question about tangents. Here's how to solve this question about similar triangles and tangents on the SAT math section. Question 25 states the side lengths of right triangle RST are given. Triangle RST is similar to triangle UVW, where S corresponds to V and T corresponds to W. What is the value of tan of W? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is since I have RST as the triangle and they're similar, the tangent values are also going to be the same for the corresponding angle. So I'm gonna go ahead and find that W, what is it equal to in RST? Okay, so if I've got V and T correspond, let's see, S corresponds to V. All right, so S corresponds to V. Okay, I see that's the middle one, that's the middle one. Uh, and then T corresponds to W. Okay, I see that that's the last one, that's the last one. That means that R will correspond to U. Okay, but we've got tan of W. Okay, so that's gonna be T. All right, so we have to find tan of T. Okay, I can just write that as then tan of T. Okay, it's the same thing, because these are similar triangles. They're gonna have the same tan values for the same angle. All right, so now what is the value of it? Well, let's go ahead and draw out this triangle, okay? Because that's just gonna make it easier to visualize. We have a right triangle. We have, uh, we've got RST. So let's go ahead and just mark that RST. We know T to R is 52. We know S to T is 48, okay? And keep in mind, this is obviously not drawn to scale, okay? It's just a quick sketch because uh, we're only really worried about the actual values, not really the, the angle measures. All right, so now we wanna know the value of tan of W, or tan of T. All right, well, we know that the tan is the opposite over our adjacent. Okay, so our opposite from T would be 20 and our adjacent would be 48. So that's going to equal 20 over 48, which we can simplify down and we see we have to because they're 20, 48, it's not an answer choice. So if we're simplifying this down, we can go ahead and divide them both into four and that's gonna give us five over 12 as our answer. So that'd be answer choice B. Here's how to solve this SAT math question that deals with rearranging variables. Question 26 states, one gallon of paint will cover 220 square feet of a surface. A room has a total wall area of W square feet, which equation represents the total amount of paint P in gallons needed to paint the walls of the room twice. All right. So here's how I ended up with this equation. One quick note, you saw I started writing down variables and uh, sort of the coefficients in front of those variables as I read through. That's a strategy I recommend that you do anytime that you have an SAT math word problem that is three lines or longer, okay? Just because it helps you avoid having to reread as much. So just want to make note of that. That being said, let's go ahead and talk about how I got there. All right, so we have one gallon of paint is going to cover 220 square feet of the surface, okay? So we have 220 is the amount of square feet one gallon P is going to cover, okay? So this gets us the amount of coverage that we're getting. Now we know that that has to equal the area of the wall times two, because we're going to do it twice, right? We're gonna paint the walls twice. Okay, so now we have our equation. Now, we see that we need to solve for P. So we just have to find what P equals. Now, all of this question basically hinges on you setting up this equation correctly initially. If you don't set it up correctly initially, you're not gonna to get to the right answer. So you have to make sure that you understand how the units work, right? Because as you can see here, we are ultimately getting to an area by taking the amount of coverage we get per gallon of paint, multiplying it by the number of gallons. Now we get our area, we're setting that equal to an area as well. So checking if your units match is a good way to check your check your work as well. So I wanted to point that out. Okay, we're ultimately getting area equals area. All right, that being said, let's go ahead and solve for P now. We know that P is going to equal W times two all over 220 because we divide both sides by 220. Next thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and simplify. Okay, we can divide two by two and 220 by two. That's ultimately going to give us if we go ahead and cross both those out, we'll end up with 110 in that denominator. So P is equal to W over 110 in our answer. There'll be answer choice A. Here's how to solve this difficult SAT math question. Question 27 states the number A is 110% greater than the number B. Well, that means that A is going to equal 2.1 times B because it's 110% greater than the number B. Okay, keep in mind, pay attention to that, that greater there. That means it's gonna be 2.1 times B. All right, the number B is 90% less then 4.7, well, another way to say that is the number B is 10% of 47, okay? So that means that B is going to equal 0 0.1 times 47, which is going to equal 4.7. Now we're asked, what is the value of A? Well, this is pretty easy to solve for now, okay? In order to get A, we need to know the value of B, which we now know is 4.7. So we just do 2.1 times 4.7. If we put that into our calculator, we will get 9.87 as the value of A. So our answer is 9.87. Here's how to answer statistical inference questions on the SAT. Question one states that there are 55 students in Spanish club. A sample of Spanish club students was selected at random. That's important whenever you're doing statistical sampling. It must be random sampling in order to provide 
an accurate statistical inference for you to use later on. And asked whether they intend to enroll in a new study program of those surveyed. 20% responded they intend to enroll. Always pay attention to if it's they intend or they not to intend because sometimes they will put in something that has only two options and they will give you one of those being they do or the other being they do not. And you have to pay attention to what you're given. In this case, we're given that they do intend to enroll in the study program. Based on the survey, which of the following is the best estimate of the total number of Spanish club students who intended to enroll in the study program? In this case, this question is super straightforward. We have 55 total students. We're told that of those who responded, which was a random sample, 20% said they would intend to enroll. We're asked for those who would intend to enroll. So all we have to do is 55 times 0.2, and that'll give us 11. So our answer there would be A. Here's a tip to help you be more efficient on the SAT. Question two states, Jay walks at a speed of three miles per hour and runs at a speed of five miles per hour. He walks for W hours and runs for R hours for a combined total of 14 miles. Which equation represents this situation? Okay, well, as you can see, I've already got my answer without having to read through a second time. And the reason why is because I wrote down my variables as I read through. As you can see, it's a little bit messy because my focus is on reading, but I don't have to read through again. And the reason you want to do this is because if you were to read through this word problem without writing anything down, and then you get to the end and it says which equation represents the situation, you now have to go back through. You have to look for your numbers. You have to look for your variables. So what I do when I encounter a word problem on the SAT, and you can usually tell pretty much right off the bat if it's a word problem, because it'll be usually at least three lines or longer. In this case, it was four lines. You want to write down any numbers they give you and any variables they give you as you go through. And you want to try to sort of get it in the equation form that you're expecting. And this comes with a little bit of practice, but as you can see, once I saw we've got walking at three miles per hour, right? Running at five miles per hour. I'm guessing it's going to be a summation to get us distance. So I went ahead and I put the three here, the five here. And then once I got my variables, went ahead and attached them to the appropriate number that I got earlier in the question and then got the equation of not having to read through twice. So this is a great way to save time on the SAT and I highly recommend doing it. Here's how I recommend approaching questions about scatter plots on the SAT. Question three states, the scatter plot shows the relationship between two variables, X and Y. A line of best fit is also shown. Which of the following equations best represents the line of best fit shown? What I do in this situation is I take a quick glance at the answer choices to see what format they're in. In this case, I see they're all in slope intercept form, which is gonna make this question really easy. So let's start by finding our intercept. We see our intercept is positive right around three, which means we can go ahead and get rid of C and D because they both have negative Y intercepts. The next thing I'll take a look at is the slope. In this case, I see my slope is positive. If I look at answer choices A and B, I see only one of them has a positive slope, so my answer has to be answer choice A. Here's how to answer this question that deals with Y intercepts really quickly on the SAT. The question states the graph of Y equals F of X is shown in the XY plane. What is the value of F of zero? Well, the value of F of zero is just the Y intercept. So if we take a look at our graph, we see our answer is going to be three. So our answer is answer choice D. Here's how to answer questions about adding exponents on the SAT. Question five states which expression is equivalent to, and then we have this multiplication question, where M, Q, and Z are positive. What you need to understand in order to answer this question correctly is how to add exponents when you have the same base. So to illustrate this, let's look at m. m to the power of four times m is equal to m to the power of five. Because it's the same base, we add their exponents when we multiply them together. Same thing with q. We have q to the power of four times q to the power of five. That'll give us q to the power of nine. Same thing with z. In this case, we have z to the power of negative one times z to the power of three. In this case, what we have is z to the power of two because it's three minus one, or in other words, three plus negative one. And as we can see, our answer then has to be answer choice B. Here's how to find the median on the SAT. Question six states, what is the median of the data shown? We're going to start by getting rid of our minimum value, then our maximum value, then our next minimum value, then our next maximum value, then our next minimum value, then our next maximum value, then our next minimum value, then our next maximum value to find our answer of 79. Now, what if we had two values in the middle? And we didn't have an odd number of total of values. We had an even number. Well, in that case, let's say, for example, that we had 79 plus 81, as, or in this case, I guess we'll use 82 since that's the one uh, that's left of it. But it's all arbitrary. We've already answered this question, but I just want to show you what we do in that case. In that case, if we had 79 plus 82, we divide by two, we take the average, and we use that as the median. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 30 seconds. The question states what value of x is the solution to the given equation? Well, we got to isolate x then, so let's go ahead and subtract 40 from both sides. 95 minus 40 is going to leave us with 55 is equal to x. So the value of x that is the solution to the given equation is 55. Here's a tip to be way more efficient on the SAT. Question 8 states the solution to the given system of equations is xy. What is the value of x plus y? What you always want to do on the SAT is look for what you're asked to answer with. In this case, that's the value of x plus y. So does that mean we need to solve for x and y? Not necessarily. 
quickly and I'll show you why here. If I see I have stacked equations like this, I'm almost always going to look to add or subtract the bottom equation from the top equation. And sometimes that will also mean I need to multiply by some number. But in this case, I don't need to multiply by a number. And what I see immediately is I have 5x and 4x and I have to get x plus y. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually just going to add these equations together and that's going to give me x plus y because 5x plus negative 4x is going to leave me with x. And then I have plus y is going to equal 15 plus negative 2, which is equal to 15 minus 2, which is equal to 13. So our answer there is C and we don't have to solve for x and y because we were able to get the value of x plus y. Here's an example of how to interpret a word problem on the SAT math section. Question nine states a given function G models the number of gallons of gasoline that remains from a full gas tank in a car after driving M miles. According to the model, about how many gallons of gasoline are used to drive each mile? Well, we know that G of M is how much gas remains in the tank. Okay, presumably since before we have driven any miles, this number here is gonna end up being zero since M would be zero, we would start with 12.1 gallons of gas, which means that for every mile M that we drive, we are losing 0.05 gallons of gas. So our answer would have to be answer choice A. Here's an example of how to solve questions that ask you to rearrange variables on the SAT math section. In this case, we're asked the given equation relates the positive numbers B, X, and Y. Which equation correctly expresses X in terms of B and Y? Well, in order to get our answer, we have to isolate X. So let's go ahead and do that by multiplying both sides by Y to start. And then to get 11x to just x, we have to divide both sides by 11. And now we have isolated x. So we have y over 11 times 7b, which as we can see, 11 times 7 is going to give us 77. And we would have y over 77b. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in two different ways. Question 11 states the graph of the given equations in the xy plane intersect at the point xy. What is a possible value of x? Now, many people would go through and solve this by hand. So let's go ahead and do that. And then I'll talk about the other way you can solve this one. So you have y equals 76 and y equals x squared minus five. In this case, we can go ahead and plug in 76 for y. So we have 76 is equal to x squared minus five. The next thing we'll do is we'll isolate that x squared value. So we'll add five to each side and we'll end up with 81 is equal to x squared. From here, you should be able to recognize that your answers are gonna be positive and negative nine for the value of x. But I'll go ahead and show you how we do that. We can take the square root of both sides, which is going to give us plus or minus nine is equal to x. The reason why it's plus or minus is because x squared, if you put in a negative number, it will still become positive. If you put in a positive number, it will become positive because it's being squared. So our answer there would be b. Now, here's what I want to show you about this question. That's the way I just showed you is one way to do it, and it's perfectly fine. But there is another way to do it. This question is from the digital SAT, which means you'll have access to Desmos while you are taking the SAT. And this is another perfectly valid way to do it. You just put in both equations in Desmos, and you find where they intersect, which in this case we can see here is at negative nine. So both ways are valid. The way I would recommend approaching it is with a question as simple as this, you can do it by hand if you want to. And if you are very confident, for example, if you're someone who's consistently scoring over 1400 on SAT practice tests, in particular over 700 on the math section, and you come across this question, you think it's faster for you to do it by hand. That's fine. You can go ahead and do it. If you're someone who's scoring less than 700 on the SAT math section on practice tests, I'd use Desmos. In my opinion, now that you can use Desmos on the digital SAT, you should be using it fairly often for questions that involve graphing because it helps you avoid human error. So even on a question as simple as this, if someone wanted to use Desmos, I wouldn't fault them at all. And I wouldn't tell them not to. Desmos is a great tool for the digital SAT and you shouldn't be afraid to use it. Here's how to solve this SAT math question about the solution to a system of inequalities. The question states the point X and 53 is a solution to the system of inequalities in the XY plane, which of the following could be the value of X. So in this case, we need to solve for X and we already know that this point is a solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this 53 Y and we're going to, as, which is a Y value, and we're going to plug it in for Y. So pretty simple on how we're going to set this up. It's going to end up being 40, I'm sorry, 4 X plus 53 must be less than 18. Okay, now that we've got this set up, let's go ahead and isolate X and solve for it. So we'll subtract 53 from each side. That'll end up leaving us with negative 35 must be greater than 4X. From there, we wanna isolate X, as I said, so we divide both sides by four. Now we see that X must be less than negative 35 over four. Now what you should be able to recognize here is that 35 over four, pretty close to 36 over four, or in other words, nine. Okay, so we know that X has to be less than negative 35 over four, which means X cannot be negative five, five or nine because they do not pass that inequality. The only number that does here is answer choice A. Here's how to efficiently answer this SAT math question about percentages, as well as one thing you want to look out for on questions that are simple like this one. Question 13 states that out of 300 seeds that were planted, 80% sprouted. How many of these seeds sprouted? So it's pretty easy to get to our answer. That's going to be 0.8 to represent that 80%. We're going to multiply it by 300, and that is going to give us our answer of 240. Now, what you want to watch out for on questions that are as simple as this one is whether or not the SAT is going to put something like this. How many of these seeds did not sprout? Okay, and they would probably underline the word not, okay, because that would change the math, right? If you're calculating for the 
percent or the amount of seeds that didn't sprout, then you would end up with 60. So that is something you want to watch out for on questions on the SAT that are simple like this is whether or not there's something that could trip you up like that. Here's how to efficiently answer this SAT math question. Question 14 states the function f is defined by f of x equals 4x. For what value of x does f of x equal 8? Well, since we're asked to find the value where f of x equals 8, we go ahead and plug in 8 for f of x, which leaves us with 8 is equal to 4x. From there, we just want to isolate x by dividing both sides by 4. 8 over 4 is equal to 2, which means that the value of x would be 2, and 2 is our answer. Here's how to efficiently answer this SAT math question that deals with division and factors. Question 15 states, which expression is equivalent to 8x times x minus 7 minus 3 times x minus 7 all over 2x minus 14, where x is greater than 7? Immediately what I'm seeing is I have x minus 7 here and here. So what I'm going to see is if I have x minus 7 in my denominator, which in this case I see I do because I have 2x minus 14 and I can change that into 2 times x minus 7. So from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this division problem so you can see what I'm looking for a little bit more neatly. The way we rewrite this is 8x times x minus 7 all over 2 times x minus 7 minus 3 times x minus 7 all over 2 times x minus 7. And now that we've written this, it's very easy to see that these x minus sevens are going to cancel out, which makes this equation very, very simple. Okay, ultimately we have 8x minus three all over two, which once again, we can rewrite this as 8x minus three all over two, which we see as answer choice B. So to answer this question, what you really need to understand is one, how to factor so you can get that x minus seven out. And then second, how to sort of change between these similar um, sort of forms, right, of division, right? You can write 8x minus 3 over 2 like this, and you can also write it like this. So that's really what you need to understand for this question. Here's how to find the slope of equations in standard linear form and use that slope to answer questions very quickly. Question 16 states line P is defined by 2y plus 18x equals 9. Line R is perpendicular to line P in the xy plane. What is the slope of line R? In order to find the slope of line R, we need to first know the slope of line P. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is that we have 2y plus 18x equals 9. This is called standard linear form. It's when we have our y and our x on the same side being added together, and they are set equal to some constant. Now, because it's in standard linear form, we can use the equation m equals negative a over b, where a is the value or the coefficient in front of x, and b is the coefficient in front of y. So in this case, that would be m equals negative a, in this case our a value is 18, so negative 18 over 2, which is going to equal negative 9. Now, in order to get a perpendicular slope to negative 9, you have to do the negative reciprocal. So negative 9 is the same as negative 9 over 1. So to do the negative reciprocal, we have to change the sign from negative to positive, and then we have to flip the fraction to 1 over 9. So 1 over 9 will be our new slope of line r. So we can go slope of r which means that our answer has to be answer choice C. Here's an example of why you need to know the exponential growth formula for the SAT. Question 17 states, the given function F models the number of coupons a company sent to their customers at the end of each year, where T represents the number of years since the end of 1998, and zero, or and T is between zero and five inclusive. Uh, if Y is equal to F of T is graphed in the TY plane, which of the following is the best interpretation of the Y intercept of the graph in this context? Your Y intercept when you have an exponential growth formula like this is going to be where T is equal to zero, where the exponent is equal to zero. And when that exponent is equal to zero, 0 0.65 to the power of zero is just one, and you end up with this Y intercept of 8,000. Now in this case, we know that that is at the end of 1998, since that's our start year, that is where T is zero. So from that, it's very easy to find the answer. So let's go ahead and read through A through D and let's find the answer. A, the minimum estimated number of coupons the company sent to their customers during the five years was 1,400 and no. B, the minimum estimated number of coupons the company sent to their customers during the five years was 8,000. No, this is just the value at the beginning of the time. So this is the number of coupons that they sent at the end of 1998. Uh, and then C, the estimated number of coupons the company sent to their customers was 1,428. No, we know it's 8,000. 8,000 is our initial value. D, the estimated number of coupons the company sent to their customers at the end of 1998 was 8,000. Yes, D is our answer. Here's something you need to know about similar triangles for the SAT math section. Question 18 states that triangle XYZ is similar to triangle RST such that XY and Z correspond to RS and T respectively. The measure of angle Z is 20 degrees and 2xy is equal to rs. What is the measure of angle T? The answer is C, 20 degrees. Now, how do you know that right away? Well, this piece of information is completely irrelevant and you don't need to know it in order to know the answer is 20 degrees. And here is why. You are told that these are similar triangles. You are also told that Z corresponds to angle T. These two angles correspond to one another, which means that they must have the same angle measure. So this piece of information does not matter. 
Okay, all you need is that angle Z is 20, angle T must also be 20, and your answer is C. Here's what you need to know about systems of linear equations that have no solution on the SAT. Question 19 states one of the equations in a system of two linear equations is given. The system has no solution. Which equation could be the second equation in the system? First thing we need to know is our slope, which we see is going to be six. Okay, we see our y-intercept is going to be 18. Now, the reason we need to know these things is because in order for a system of linear equations to have no solution, they need to have the same slope, but a different y-intercept. Next thing I notice is answer choices A through D are all in standard linear form, which means that we can use the formula m equals negative a over b, where m is representing the slope. Now, if we do that for answer choice a, we see that answer choice a would be negative negative six, which would give us positive six over one, since one is the coefficient in front of y. So answer choices a and b, I see, are both going to have a slope of six. Now, they have the right slope, but which one of them has the correct y-intercept? And by correct y-intercept, it means the y-intercept that is different from the one that we are given. Because if they have the same y-intercept, there is infinitely many solutions. And as we can see, answer choice A has y being equal to 6x plus 18 if we were able to convert it to slope-intercept form. And in that case, it's the same equation as is up here. So A is incorrect because that would be the same equation and there are infinitely, infinitely many solutions to that. Now, B has a different y-intercept. Its y-intercept here is going to be 22. So our answer is going to be answer choice B has a different y-intercept by the same slope, so there is no solutions possible. Here's how to quickly solve this question about area on the SAT math section. Question 20 states, what is the area in square centimeters of a rectangle with a length of 34 centimeters and a width of 29 centimeters? This question is pretty easy. All you need to know is the area formula for a rectangle, and that's going to be the length times the width. These are both the same unit. They're both centimeters. That's one thing you do want to watch out for on the SAT is if you have different units for one side than the other, then you would have to convert units. In this case, we do not have to do that, and it is very simple. It is just 29 times 34. We are able to use the calculator on the section. This is the digital SAT, so you're going to be able to use your calculator on both of the sections for the math. So you just put it in your calculator, you're going to end up with 986 as your answer. Here's a bunch of tips that I can illustrate with this question to help you ace the SAT. Question 21 states the solution to the given system of equations is xy. What is the value of x minus y? Anytime that you're taking the SAT math section, you always want to pay very, very close attention to what you're asked to answer with. That is the key to moving faster and being as efficient as possible. Know what you want to answer with. In this case, they're asking for the value of x minus y. So what I would do is if I have a system of equations like this, I would look for if there's a way that I can do an addition or subtraction of this bottom equation from the top one in order to get the value of x minus y right away. And sometimes that may involve multiplying one of these equations by some number. Now, in this case, I don't see any way that I can quickly get to x minus y doing this. So it's not applicable here, but we still have the plus minus in order to get the value of x quickly. And I'll show you how we're going to do that. Okay. Like I said, sometimes you're going to have to multiply. In this case, I can see that I have y and 4y. So I'll just multiply this top one by 4 to get rid of my y. So I'll do subtraction here. Okay. So I distribute this 4 to the y. I get 4y minus 4y. Now my y's are gone. Okay. So I'm going to end up with 0 here. And then I'm going to have 4 times 4x. So 16x minus 15x will leave me with just x. And then 4 times 1, I'm going to have 4 minus negative 8, which is the same as 4 plus 8. That's going to give me plus 12. So I can see here that if I subtract 12 from both sides, I'm going to end up with x is equal to negative 12. Okay, so now that I've solved for x, I'll go ahead and solve for y. So if x is negative 12, I'll go ahead and erase up here so we can do this quickly. x is negative 12, I'll substitute that in here. So we have negative 12. And the reason I'm choosing this top equation is because we already have y isolated with no coefficients in front of it. So keep in mind that's strategic. Now that since I need y now, I'm not going to pick the y that has a coefficient in front of it. That doesn't make sense to do. We want to just go ahead and get y right away. So we plug in that negative 12, with the, multiply it by 4, we get negative 48. Negative 48 plus 1 is going to equal negative 47. Okay, so now we want the value of x minus y, so that's going to be negative 12 minus negative 47. Okay, so keep in mind, subtracting a negative, it's the same as adding. So we're going to have negative 12 plus 47, and that is going to give us our answer of positive 35. Here's what you need to know about calculating the number of real solutions for quadratic equations on the SAT math section. Question 22 states, how many distinct real solutions does a given equation have? Well, in order to solve this, we're going to use b squared minus 4ac because this is a quadratic equation. Now, if the value of b squared minus 4z is positive, then that means that there are going to be two real solutions. Now, if the value of b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero, then that means that there are going to be one real solution. And I should have said there is going to be one real solution. Don't at me in the comments. Okay, and then b squared minus 4ac, if that is less than zero, then that means that you're going to have no real solutions. Okay, now that we've gone ahead and gone over the value of b squared minus 4ac and what that means for the number of real solutions, let's go ahead and calculate it. So your b value is what's in front of the x, your a value is what's in front of your x squared, and your c value is your constant. Keep in mind, it must be set equal to zero for this to work. So b squared minus 4ac, our b value is 10, 10 squared minus four times five times 16. What does that equal out to? That is going to equal out to a negative 220 we know is less than zero. 
zero, therefore we must have no real solutions. So our answer is going to be D, zero. There are zero real solutions. Here's how to convert units on the SAT. Question 23 states a certain park has an area of 11,863,808 square yards. What is the area in square miles of this park? And one thing I wanna point out here is anytime you have something underlined on the SAT, it means you need to pay very close attention to it. In this case, it's because we're converting units from square yards to square miles. That being said, we are given what one mile is equal to in yards, and that's 1,760. So the key to this question is that you are dealing with square yards, not just yards, square yards, not cubic yards, square yards. That's the key to this whole thing. This makes it super easy as long as you understand that. What you're gonna do here is you're gonna take your 11,863,808 and you're gonna divide it by 1760 squared. And the reason why you have to square that 1760 is because you are dealing in units of square yards two square miles. So you have to square that conversion unit as well. Once you do this, you just put it in your calculator and you're going to end up with 3.83. So your answer there is going to be answer choice B. Here's how to use the circle equation to answer this question on the SAT. Question 24 states, which of the following equations represents a circle in the XY plane that intersects the Y axis at exactly one point? Well, first I'm going to quickly teach the circle equation to anyone who doesn't know it. So the circle equation we can write as this X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared is equal to R radius squared, where R is our radius. Okay. Now in this situation, we would have a center for the circle of H K. So as you can see, you want to pay attention to the fact that we have those minus signs, but our center is still at H and K. So now that we've gone over that, I'm going to quickly show you how I would approach this. The first thing I would take a look at is what my radius value is for all of these. Now, Keep in mind, 16 is the radius squared, which means that the actual radius here, your radius is actually gonna equal four, okay? And that's important because we're only intersecting the y-axis at one point. And if you're ever kind of in doubt on a question dealing with sort of circles and graphs, go ahead and draw it out, it's very useful. So I'll go ahead and draw that out to illustrate what I'm looking for here. So if I know my radius is four, if my x value is anything greater than four, and I'll put four here, for example, I see that my x value for the center, right, is gonna be eight for a and b. There's no way that I can reach that Y intercept, right? No matter where my Y is, there's just no way I can get there because my radius is only four. So I can get rid of A and B already, okay? I have to find somewhere where I'm either at four or I'm at negative four. And the only place that that happens, and keep in mind, I'm specifically referring to the X coordinate for your center here. And we see the only place that that happens is C. In answer choice D, we see that X's center is at zero. Now, if we had a center at zero, we'd end up with a circle that looks like this, right? And we're crossing that Y intercept twice. So our answer there has to be answer choice C. Here's a term that you need to know for the SAT math section. Question 25 states in triangles A, B, C, and D, E, F, angles B and E each have measure 27. We see that B and E are here. Okay, so they match up in that triangle. Angle C and F each have a measure of 41. So we see C and F, they also match up in this triangle. Which additional piece of information is sufficient to determine whether triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF? The key thing to understand here and pay attention to is the fact that we are asked about congruency, which means that they are the same triangles. We are not asked about similarity. Two triangles that are similar can have different side lengths, but two triangles that are congruent must have the same side lengths and the same angles. Now, we already know that these triangles are similar because if two out of these three angles are the same, that means the third angle is the same in them as well. So what we need to know then is if the side lengths are all the same. And the way that we can get that, we can't get that from just one side length because that's only from one of the triangles. Okay, we can't get that from another angle measure. We already know they're all the same. We do need more information because we need to know whether or not these side lengths are the same. And to do that, we need to get these side lengths of two corresponding sides, which we see we get here in BC. Larry, if we go up here, BC, right here, these last two letters in EF. Okay, so our answer there has to be C. And once again, make sure you understand the difference between congruency, which is when triangles are the exact same, and similarity, which is just when they have the same angle measures. This is one of the most difficult SAT math questions, and it has less to do with the actual math involved and more to do with the actual logic that's required to set up the problem. So with that being said, let's go ahead and go over it and let's simplify it down. So question 26 states that two data sets of 23 integers each are summarized in the histograms shown. For each of the histograms, the first interval represents the frequency of integers greater than or equal to 10, but less than 20. So the key thing that we need to understand here is that this line right here, right, this 30 number is included inside of here right? So it's really going, whatever is sort of inside of a box, keep in mind, it's it's sort of the zero through nine. It doesn't include that next zero. Okay. So with that being said, let's keep reading through. The second interval represents the frequency of integers greater than or equal to 20, but less than 30 and so on. What is the smallest possible difference between the mean of data set A and the mean of data set B? So as you can see, pretty much sort of a logical sort of question as for the setup of this, right? So to get the smallest possible difference between these two data sets, you want to keep a couple of things in mind. First of all, if you ever have histograms on the SAT, 
you want to pay attention to the shape of them. Now, if you have two of them, like you do in this case, you want to pay attention to the shape of each of them. And as we can see, the shape of them is the same. There's just a shift, right? So the actual shape is the same. As you can see, this one right here goes across into nine. This goes to seven. Uh, this goes to four. This goes to three. Same thing over here. We have three, four, seven, and nine. Right? And we have the same number of bars, obviously. So these are the same shape, but you want to also pay attention to your x-axis as well. And as we can see, data set B is shifted to the left 10 for each of these, right? So now, in order to set up the smallest difference in means, we would actually have to calculate the mean of each, right? But we don't just calculate the mean because we can't, right? It's a histogram. We know that these numbers fall in between these. So the key thing we need to recognize is in order to find the difference, we need to know which one's larger and which one is smaller. Now, this data set A, it has to be larger because all of these are shifted to the right, okay? So they can't all fall in the same number because as I pointed out, right, this 30, and this is true for all of these, you know, these, these uh, rectangles or these bars on the graph, it's not inclusive of, you know, this, for example, right, it's, it's 20 to 29. That doesn't include that 30, right? That 30 is its own. And that's what makes it so there has to be a difference here. Okay, so we already know that the answer can't be zero because like I said, there has to be a difference, um, you know, because we are dealing with the fact that it's 20 to 29, 30 to 39 and so on. So if we are shifting one of them, you know, to the, in this case, to the right, right, if you're doing from B to A, it would be to the right. If you're doing A to B, it would be to the left. There has to be some difference there. Okay, so with that being said, let's go and calculate that difference. Well, if we're going to calculate what the smallest difference is, we need the minimum value for data set A and we would need the maximum value for data set B because we are subtracting B from A. Okay, so let's start with getting the minimum value of data set A. Okay, so minimum value of data set A. Let me go ahead and go up here. Okay, so minimum value of data set A. What we would do to set this up is we would start by getting the lowest value from our first bar, right? So that's going to be 20. Okay, so we're getting our minimum value of A. So that'd be 20 times 3. Okay, and then we'll have to add on to that 30 times 4, and we'll have to add on to that 40 times 7, and then we'll have to add on to that 50 times 9. Okay, and then once we get that, we're going to have to divide by our total, which is going to be 3 plus 4, which is 7, 7 plus 7, which is 14, and then 14 plus 9, which is 23. Okay, so we're going to take all that, and we will divide it by 23. Okay, now keep in mind that we're going to also have that division by 23 over in data set B as well. All right, now we have to calculate our number for data set B, and I'm gonna have to scroll down a little bit just so you can see all of this getting written out. So go ahead and try to scroll down. Okay, so we're gonna have to set up a pretty similar thing, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and put in our subtraction sign, and I know it's not super great formatted, but that's okay. All right, so we're gonna have minus now. We have to do kind of the opposite thing that we just did in A. So in this case, we're taking our maximum values. Now, keep in mind that our maximum values are not inclusive, right? So this is a range of 10 to 19. Okay, so we have to take 19 there. So that'd be minus 19 times three plus 29 times four plus 39 times seven plus 49 times nine. Okay, and this is all also over 23. Okay, and then when we put this into our calculator, which is what you'd do, okay, I wrote this out. You would just be typing this in in your calculator. Okay, this is ultimately gonna get you your answer of one. So your answer there is going to be B, and that's how you solve this tricky SAT math problem. Here's something you need to know for the SAT, and that's how to extract numbers from underneath the square root. Question 27 states a triangle has legs with lengths of 24 centimeters and 21 centimeters. If the length of the triangle's hypotenuse in centimeters can be written in the form three times the square root of D, where D is an integer, what is the value of D? Well, in order to get in this form of three times root D, we need to first actually know what the hypotenuse's length is. So let's go ahead and solve for that. So we have a right triangle. We know we have lengths of 24 and 21 as our side lengths. We need to solve for hypotenuse, which we're going to represent as C squared. We're going to use Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to go ahead and do 24 squared plus 21 squared. That's going to equal C squared. Okay, we know that this is going to equal, let's put it in our calculator, and we're going to get 1017. Okay, so we'll take the square root of each side to isolate C. Okay, so we know that C is going to equal that square root of 1017. Okay, so now that we have that, I'm going to go ahead and write this out a little bit more neatly. We know C is equal to root of 1017. C is our hypotenuse. So that's what we're trying to solve for. Now, we need to ultimately rewrite this in a form where 3 is extracted. Okay, well, underneath the square root, in order to extract the value of three, we would have to have the value of nine underneath that square root. And the way we get that's just pretty simple, right? It's by three squared, okay? Since we have square root here, we'd be squaring three and we would get nine. All right, so now what we have to do is we have to do 10, 17 divided by nine, and that's gonna give us 113. And now what we do is we set 
this equal to 9 times 113, which as you can see, is still going to equal 1017 since we had 1017 over 9 equal 113. So because of that, we now have 9 underneath the square root, which means that we can extract 3 because, and I'll just write this over here, okay, because the root 9 times 113 is the same as root 9 times root 113. And what is root 9 equal to? Well, root 9 is equal to 3. Okay, so now we've extracted that 3, and we see we have 3 root 113, which is the same format as we got in this question. So we know the value of D has to be 113 as well. So our answer is 113. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 30 seconds. Question 1 states, what is the solution to the given equation? All we have to do here is isolate K by subtracting 12 from both sides. 336 minus 12 is 324, so we know that K will equal 324, and our answer is B. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question. Question 2 states the function F is defined by F of of x is equal to x cubed plus 15. What is the value of f of 2? In this case, all we have to do is plug in 2 for x, and we're going to get 2 cubed, which is equal to 8, and we have to add 15 to that. So 8 plus 15 will leave us with 23, so our answer is c. Here's how to interpret this SAT word problem. Question 3 states that Sean rents a tent at a cost of $11 per day plus a one-time insurance fee of $10. Which equation represents the total cost c in dollars to rent the tent with insurance for d days. We know our total cost is going to equal our one-time insurance fee of $10 plus our $11 per day, giving us our answer as answer choice C. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question about intersecting parallel lines. Question 4 states in the figure shown, line M is parallel to line N. What is the value of X? Well, we know that this angle of 26 is also going to be the same angle that is right here. Therefore, we know that we have this semicircle of X and angle that is 26 degrees, so we can do 180 degrees for that angle of the semicircle minus the 26 degrees, and then we're gonna get the value of X in degrees, which we know will equal 154. So our answer is answer choice D. So I'll go ahead and scroll down so you can see that. Our answer will be D. Here's how to be more efficient on the SAT math section. Question five states that John paid a total of $165 for a microscope by making a down payment of $37 plus P monthly payments of $16 each. Which of the following equations represents the situation? And as you can see, as I read through the problem, I wrote down the equation that I would eventually come up with. So we see that our answer there has to be C. Now I wanna talk about why this is a good strategy and when to use it. What I do is when I see an SAT math question with three lines or more, then as I read through the question, I'll start writing down any coefficients, variables, or key units that I will need to solve the question. So as you saw, when I saw that I had a total of 165, I knew I was probably going to sum up something else to get to that total of 165. So I wrote down 165 first. Then as I kept reading, I saw I had a down payment of $37. A down payment is a one-time payment. So there's not going to be a variable next to it. So I went ahead and wrote down 37. Okay. And keep in mind, I'm trying to add up to a total here. So I could probably insinuate that I'm going to have a summation after that. Then we have plus P monthly payments. So plus indicating I need to add plus P monthly payments of $16 each. In this case, P is our variable representing the monthly payments and our coefficient in front of that is $16 each, which is how I was able to write out this equation before I finish the question, okay? So this is a key strategy I recommend you use on the SAT when you have a word problem that is three lines or longer. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 60 seconds. Question six states that if y is equal to 5x plus 10, what is the value of y when x is equal to eight? Well, all we gotta do here is plug in eight for x. So we're gonna have five times eight, which is gonna give us 40. 40 plus 10 is gonna give us 50, and our answer will be 50. Here's how to interpret bar graphs on the SAT math section. Question seven states, the bar graph shows the distribution of 419 cans collected by 10 different groups for a food drive. How many cans were collected by group six. Well, let's first take a look at our y-axis. We see we have their number of cans. We need to know how many cans were collected by group six. So we find group six. We see that they collected 40 cans. So the answer there is 40. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question about probability. Question eight says the table gives a distribution of votes for a new school mascot and grade level for 80 students. If one of these students is selected at random, what is the probability of selecting a student whose vote for the new mascot was a lion? So a couple key things to look for on probability questions. Number one is look for the pool that you are selecting from. In this case, we are selecting one of the students at random. Keep in mind, sometimes they may ask if we are selecting a seventh grader, an eighth grader, a sixth grader, if we are selecting one of the students who voted for the Badger mascot. So you always want to pay attention to the pool that you are selecting from. In this case, it's just one of the students. So that means we're going to be pu pulling from this total right here. Okay. Now the key thing here is we are looking for uh, the probability that student voted for a mascot that was a lion, okay, so which we see is going to be this value here. So our total probability then is going to be 20, which is the part that we are selecting, which is these, those students who voted for a lion over the total that we are selecting from, which is all of the students. So 20 over 80 is going to equal one over four. So if we go ahead and scroll down, we're going to see that that'll be answer choice C. So C will be our answer there. 
Here's how to interpret slope in context for the SAT math section. Question nine states the graph represents the total charge in dollars by an electrician for X hours of work. The electrician charges a one-time fee plus an hourly rate. What is the best interpretation of the slope of the graph? Well, we know that he has a one-time fee, which is already represented by our y-intercept, and then the slope is representative of his hourly rate. Okay, so we have option A, the electrician's hourly rate, and that'll be the correct answer there. Here's how to solve this SAT math question that is really a proportions question, but disguised as a perimeters question. Question 10 states that square X has a side length of 12 centimeters. The perimeter of square Y is two times the perimeter of square X. What is the length in centimeters of one side of square Y? Well, a couple things to keep in mind here. One, these are both squares. Number two, the perimeter is gonna be the same equation for both of them, just with a different value for the side length. So if we wanna actually double the perimeter, all we have to do is actually double the side length. And because we know that, we know the answer is D, having to do very little math here. Keep in mind, we didn't actually have to calculate the perimeter for either square X or square Y because we're able to recognize that the equation for the calculation of the perimeter is the same. The only difference is the actual side length. So if we wanted to double the output of the perimeter or double the perimeter value in this equation, all we have to do is double that side length because the equations are set up the same. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question by understanding slope and y-intercepts. Question 11 states, what is the equation of a line that passes through the point 0, 05? Well, the point 0, 05 means that we have a y-intercept of five because that x-coordinate is zero. So that is where we are crossing the y-axis. And it's parallel to the graph of y is equal to seven x plus four in the x-y plane. Well, if we're parallel to the graph of y equals seven x plus four, that graph has a slope of seven. And since we're parallel to it, we also must have a slope of seven. So we know that our slope must be seven x. Okay, so slope equals seven x. We know our y-intercept must be five. Okay, so our y-intercept must be five. Therefore, we know that our equation has to be b y is equal to 7x plus 5. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question by understanding how to calculate slope and y-intercept quickly. Question 12 states in the linear function h, h of 0 is 41. We know that when we have h of 0, f of 0, g of 0, any function where we have that 0 as our x-coordinate, then we are getting our y-intercept. So in this case, our y-intercept is 41. Then we have h of 1 is 40 immediately. Uh, I'll go ahead and finish reading the question first. Which equation defines h? Well, immediately what I see here is that we are moving over 1. Okay, so if we go over 1, we see that we are going down by 1 from 41 to 40. Okay, so negative 1 over 1 is going to be our slope. Okay, so a negative one coefficient for our slope. So now we have our y-intercept of 41. We have our slope of negative one. It's very easy to find, define this equation. All right, so we're gonna have that negative x as our slope. So our b is incorrect because it doesn't have that 41 as our y-intercept. Okay, so a is our correct answer there. We've got negative x as the slope plus 41 y-intercept. Answer there has to be answer choice A. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question by understanding the equation for exponential growth. Question 13 states the function f of t is equal to 60,000 times two to the power of t over 410 gives the number of bacteria in a population t minutes after an initial observation. How much time in minutes does it take for the number of bacteria in the population to double? Well, we know that we are doubling when we have this two to the power of one. This two is our growth factor. This 60,000 is our initial amount. And this T over 410 is representing how often we are doing this doubling, okay? And we will double every 410 minutes, okay? Because at 410 minutes, we'll get our first double. And then if we go up another 410, then we'll get our second double, okay? In this case, we are asked for the amount of time it takes for the population to double only one time. So T would be 410 and our answer will indeed be 410. Here's how to translate graphs up on the SAT math section. Question 14 states the function f is defined by f of x is equal to x minus six times x minus two times x plus six in the xy plane. The graph of y equals g of x is the result translating the graph of y equals f of x up four units. Now keep in mind, our f of x graph is already defined up here. What is the value of g of zero? In other words, that's the y-intercept of g of x, okay? Now, keep in mind that g of x is f of x translated up four units. So we have to start by finding what the y-intercept is of f of x and then add another four units on top of that since g of x is a translation up four units of it. All right, so let's go ahead and solve for first the y-intercept of f of x. So we know that the y-intercept is where x is zero. So let's go ahead and plug in zero for x. So we'd have zero times or zero minus six and then zero minus two and then zero plus six. Okay, and this is all going to equal out to negative six times negative two, which will give us positive 12, positive 12 times six, which will give us 72. Okay, so now we have our y-intercept for our f of zero, right? Now, g of zero is what we need to solve for here. And we know that that's going to be up four units. So that means that g of zero will equal f of zero, which we know is 72, plus four, which means that g of zero will equal 76. And our final answer will be 76. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question. Question 15 states a candle is made of 17 ounces of wax. When the candle is burning, the amount of wax in the candle decreases by one ounce every four hours. If six ounces of wax remain in this candle, 
how, for how many hours has it been burning? Okay, so we know that we start out with 17 ounces. We know that we are going down by one quarter ounce every hour. So in this case, I'm having X represent hours. And the way that I got this minus one quarter X is by the fact that we're losing one ounce every four hours. That means every hour we are losing one quarter of an ounce. All right, so from here, the way I'm gonna set up my equation is actually setting it equal to how many ounces are remaining, okay? So the amount of ounces that are remaining, I'm gonna call F of X, okay? And that's gonna equal our initial amount minus how much we're losing every hour. And keep in mind, hour I'm representing as X here. All right, so now from here, we wanna find if six ounces remain. Okay, so that would mean that we have six remaining, and that's going to equal our starting amount minus one quarter X. Now we wanna solve for what time, for how many hours it's been burning. So we wanna solve for X now that we have this equation. We'll go ahead and subtract 17 from both sides. That's gonna end up giving us negative 11 is equal to negative one quarter X. From there, we will multiply both sides by negative four in order to get rid of this minus one quarter. Okay, so we multiply both sides by negative four. Negative four times negative 11 is going to give us positive 44 is equal to X. So our answer will be 44. Here's how to rearrange variables on the SAT math section. Question 16 states the given equation relates the numbers J, K, and M, which equation correctly expresses K in terms of J and M. All right, so we gotta solve for what K is equal to. So to do that, we're gonna isolate it by subtracting 14J from both sides. So we'll subtract 14J from both sides. Okay, so now this is gone. Next thing we have to do is divide both sides by five to isolate K. All right, so now we're gonna end up with K is equal to M minus 14J all over five. Okay, and keep in mind that we divided that by five. All right, so let's find which equation matches up with ours. We see that's gonna be answer choice A, so A will be our answer there. Here's something you need to know about similar triangles for the SAT math section. Question 17 states triangle FGH is similar to triangle JKL where angle F corresponds to angle J and angles G and K are right angles. If sine of F is equal to 308 over 317, what is the value of sine of J? Okay, well, we know that F and J are referring to the same angle. These are similar triangles. They have all the same angle measures. Because they have the same angle measures, the value for their signs are going to be the same when it's the same angle that is inputted in these parentheses, which we see it is, okay? J and F are the corresponding angles within these similar triangles, okay? As you can see up here, it says F corresponds to angle J. Therefore, they're gonna have the same sine values and our answer for the sine of J will also be 308 over 317. Here's how to efficiently set up and solve this SAT math question. Question 18 states the product of two positive integers is 546. If the first integer is 11 greater than, this than twice the second integer, what is the smaller of the two integers? Okay, so we wanna solve for the smaller of the two integers. Well, in this case, since we have greater and smaller, I'm gonna use G and S as my variables, okay? So G and S. We know 546 is gonna equal the product of these two variables, G and S. We also know that the first integer, which we're representing as, or actually, I guess, let's use F and S for the first and the second. Okay, so we're gonna use F and S. All right, so we know that the first integer is equal to 11 plus twice the second integer, okay? That's two S. Now we wanna solve for the smaller, so we wanna solve for S here. So to solve for S, I'm gonna go ahead and plug in F into this top equation, okay? We know F is also represented as 11 plus two S. So we're gonna end up with 546 is equal to 11 plus two S times S. We'll go ahead and distribute our S. And then we're gonna end up with 11 S plus two S squared. Okay, from here, we wanna set this all equal to zero so we can solve for S. So we're gonna subtract 546 from both sides to get zero is equal to two S squared plus 11 S minus 546. Now, this question is from the digital SAT, which means that you have access to Desmos within the testing environment, okay? It's through Bluebook, which is the sort of the software that they're using to test um, for you to take the SAT, the digital SAT. So at this point, what I would do is I would actually plug this into my graphing calculator. So I'm gonna show you what I did. So I put it in my graphing calculator, and now it's very easy to actually solve for where it equals zero because it equals zero where it crosses the X axis. And as you can see, there's two points, but we only are able to use one of them. And the reason why is because we have to remember that the product is of two positive integers. So yes, there are two values where S will equal, where this equation here will equal zero, but ultimately there's only one that is a positive value and that is going to be at 14. Okay, so 14 is gonna have to be your answer for the value of S. Okay, so our answer there is 14, which is answer choice B. Here's an example of an SAT math question where I would use substitution to solve the question quickly. Question 19 states, which point XY is the solution to the given system of inequalities in the XY plane? So I've got negative 14 for my X value. I'll go ahead and plug that in up here. Okay, negative 14 plus seven is ultimately going to give me a value of negative seven. My Y value zero is zero less than or equal to negative seven. No, so A is wrong. B, I go ahead and put in a zero for the value of X this time and a negative 14 for the value of Y. 
is negative 14 less than or equal to seven? Yes, it's true. Let me check my next point. Okay, I'd have negative 14 again for the value of y. I've got zero here. All right, is negative one less than or equal to negative 14? No, b's wrong. Next one, I jump up onto c. I plug in zero for x again. Okay, so I'm gonna end up with seven. I'm gonna end up with negative one. And then this time I have 14 for my value of y. Is 14 less than or equal to seven? No, it is not. So c is wrong. Our answer there would have to be d. I will check it just to make sure that I did this correctly. And as you should, if you get to a question like this, and you're, if you're using substitution on a question, I actually do recommend that unless you're in a massive time crunch, you do actually check the last answer choice just to make sure you didn't mess up. Because as you can see, I just did like mental math pretty much six times. So odds of making a mistake for me aren't high, but for the average test taker, like you could have made a mistake. Even I could have made a mistake. Uh, I definitely just came across really arrogant, but I'm just going to keep going. Anyways, I would plug in 14 for the value of X. So 14 plus seven, that's going to be 21. Uh, and then right here for the value of Y, zero is zero less than or equal to 21. Yes. Uh, plugging in zero again, plugging in 14 here, I'm going to end up with negative 28 minus one. Uh, so that's, that'd be negative 29. Okay, as we can see, negative 29 is less than or equal to zero, so our answer there would be D. So I guess the quick lesson here is if you're doing substitution, try to move quickly. Once you do eliminate three answer choices, you should still check the fourth one because there's a chance you made a mistake. So that's something I do on the SAT math section, even as someone who scored perfectly on back-to-back -back SAT math sections, I would still check that answer D just to make sure I didn't make a mistake on the mental math because as I said, I did six, basically six sort of situations of mental math before getting to answer choice D. So there is a chance that you know anyone could make a mistake there. So wanted to quickly go over that question on substitution. And with that being said, let's move on. Here's how to solve this difficult SAT math question efficiently. Question 20 states, what is the smallest solution to the given equation? To start, I'm going to get rid of these square roots by going ahead and squaring both sides. From there, I'm going to end up getting x minus 2 squared, which is going to end up equaling 30x plus 34. Now from here, I wanna ultimately get this set equal to zero so I can solve for x. So to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and expand x minus two squared. To do that, I use the FOIL method, so I'm gonna end up with x squared minus four x plus four is equal to three x plus 34. Now, like I said, I wanna get this set equal to zero so that I can ultimately solve for it. Okay, so setting equal to zero, I'm gonna get x squared minus four x, but I also have to subtract three x from both sides to get it set equal to zero. So that's gonna give me minus seven x total. And then I have that four, but I have to subtract 34, so that's gonna give me minus 30. Now from here, this is from the digital SAT. So you could plug this into Desmos and then solve uh, four x, but in this case, I wanna just go ahead and show you how you could also solve for this by hand, since that would be the little bit more difficult way to do it, but it could possibly be a little bit quicker depending on whether you're skilled at factoring like this. If you're not skilled at factoring, you can go ahead and use Desmos, like I said, perfectly valid way of doing it. But in this case, I'll talk to you about how to factor this. So 30, you want to think about what multiplies together to get negative 30 that adds to get negative seven. So immediately I would think negative 10 and positive three. So I would end up with X minus 10 and then X plus three. Okay. So that's set equal to zero. Now from there, I've got two possible solutions. One would be X is equal to 10 and one would be X is equal to negative three. Now keep in mind that we have to have the smallest solution to the given equations. Now the smallest solution here is negative three because it's obviously negative and the other value is positive. So our answer here would be negative three. Now, if you were to graph this out, you also still need to pay attention to the fact that you need the smallest solution to the given equation. So make sure on the SAT that you always pay really close attention to what you're asked to answer with, because if you don't, you're probably gonna miss points. Here's how to efficiently solve this multi-step SAT math question. Question 21 states that the regular price of a shirt at a store is $11.70. The sale price of a shirt or of the shirt is 80% less than the regular price. And the sale price is 30% greater than the store's cost for the shirt. What was the store's cost in dollars for the shirt? Okay, so we want to solve for the store's cost. Well, we know that the price, the regular price is 11.7. We know it's on sale for 80%. So let's go ahead and solve for the sale price because in order to get the store's cost, we need to first know the sale price. So the sale price is 11.7 times 0 0.2 because the shirt is 80% off. All right, so now we have the sale price. That's going to equal our sale price. So I'm just going to write that as sale. Well, we also know that the sale price is equal to, well, it's 30% greater than the store's cost. So we want to solve for the store's cost. So the store's cost times 1.3 is going to give us the sale price. Well, we already know the sale price and we want to solve for costs. We know that the sale price divided by 1.3 will equal our cost. We have our sale price up here, so we can go ahead and go like this, 11.2, or I'm sorry, 11.7 divided by 0. 2, or I'm sorry, 11.7 times 0 0.2. That is our sale price. We then divide that by 1.3 and we get our cost. Okay, so now we can go ahead and plug this into our calculator 
and let's see what we get. So we got 11.7 times 0 0.2 divided by 1.3. And that'll give us our answer of 1.8 is equal to the cost. So 1.8 is our answer there. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question about density. Question 22 states that a sample of oak has a density of 807 kilograms per cubic meter. The sample is in the shape of a cube where each edge has a length of 0 0.9 meters. To the nearest whole number, what is the mass in kilograms of this sample? All right, so we know our equation for density is mass over volume is equal to our density. In this case, we're told our density is 807 kilograms per cubic meter. Make sure we're paying close attention to units. In this case, it's it's kilograms per cubic meter. We also see we're dealing in meters and we're asked for our answer in kilograms. So we're not going to be dealing with any unit conversion. So that makes this a lot easier. Now we know that our mass is what we're trying to solve for. Okay. So we know our mass then is going to equal 807 times our volume. Now we have to solve for our volume. We know that it is from a cube, which has each length of 0 0.9 meters. Now keep in mind our equation for volume of a cube would be the cube's edge length cubed. Okay. Because all of these, all of these side lengths are the same in a cube. All right, so ultimately that's gonna be 0 0.9 cubed. All right, so now we've got our equation. Let's go ahead and put it into our calculator and we will get our answer. So we're gonna do 807 multiplied by 0 0.9 cubed and that'll give us our answer of 588 for the value of our mass. So our answer is answer choice A. Here's how to avoid a common misconception on the SAT. Question 23 states for X is positive, the function F is defined as follows. F of X equals 201% of X. Which of the following could describe this function? Many people would be tempted to pick increasing exponential here because they see this 201%, but that's not correct. The correct answer here is increasing linear. And the reason why is because if f of x is equaling 201% of x, it's going to scale linearly with x. And here's why. If you were to write this out as an equation, it would be f of x is equal to 2, 1 times x. Because think about it. If x is 1 and f of x is 200, and, and I'll just draw this as a table actually really quick. Okay, we'll do x is one and x is two and you'll, you'll kind of be able to see how this works. Okay, so our y value when x is one in this case would be two. Well, what's our y value when x is two then? Well, that would be 4.02. Now, what about when it's three? Well, then it'd be six point. And as you can see, each time we are increasing by 2.01. So this is linear increasing. Okay, so if you see a question like this on the SAT, don't fall for the misconception of it being exponential when it's actually linear. And if you want something to help you figure out if it is exponential or linear, try making a table with three values and that should help you figure it out. Here's how to solve this difficult SAT math question that deals with transformations left and right of graphs. Question 24 states the rational function f is defined by an equation in the form f of x equals a over x plus b, where a and b are constants. The partial graph of y equals f of x is shown. If g of x is equal to f of x plus 4, which equation could define g? The key thing to help you solve this quickly is to understand that when g of x is equal to f of x plus 4, that is a transformation of the graph of f of x to the left by 4 units. Okay, now if it was x minus four, it'd be a transformation to the right four units. But since we know it's a transformation to the left four units, this is gonna make this question a lot easier. Now, as you can see, I'm making a dot up here at the point negative 10 and negative one. And the reason why I'm doing that is because if you take a quick glance at your answer choices, it's gonna help you see that getting to the point of negative one for your y value or your g of x value should be pretty easy because all of your numerators are six. So in order to find that value, you have to find the answer choice that will get you to a g of x value of negative one, okay, because that's that y value, when x is negative 14. And you may be wondering how I get to that negative 14 number, but I'll quickly show you. Okay, if we're transforming this by going to the left four, okay, I'll go ahead and draw negative 11, negative 12, negative 13, negative 14, okay, then this dot has to shift over to that negative 14. Okay, so the new point will need to be at negative 14 and negative one. So as you can see, what I did is I just put those points in, and now I'm just gonna check my answer choices and find which one has that correct. I see in option A, that'd be six over negative 14, which does not equal negative one. I see in B, I'd have six over negative 10, which is also not equal to negative one. I see in C that I would have six over negative 14 plus eight. Negative 14 plus eight is a negative six. So that'd be six over negative six, which is equal to negative one. So I see C would be my answer. I can quickly check D. The D I see is actually just going to be G of X is equal to six. So that could never be the correct answer. Okay. So my answer there would have to be answer choice C.
Here's how to solve questions about adding fractions on the SAT math section. Question 25 states which expression is equivalent to, and then you've got kind of this mess of fractions that you're adding together with a bunch of variables. But I'm gonna simplify this down for you and show you how you can do this pretty easily. What you ultimately need to first get is a common denominator in both of these fractions. I see I have X minus eight here, which means I'm probably gonna be looking at X minus eight as one of the factors in this right here. So let's go ahead and see if we do have that as a factor. Okay, we see that X squared Y minus eight X Y can also be rewritten as, uh, let's see, X minus eight times X Y. All right, so that's gonna be the same. So from there, we see that this right here we don't really need to do anything to. But what we do have to do is with this y plus 12 over x minus eight. Okay, we ultimately need to multiply this by xy over xy, okay? So now we have to go ahead and distribute our xy to 12 and also to y. Once we do that, we're gonna end up with xy squared plus 12xy, okay? And since we have the same denominators here, we can go ahead and add this y times x minus eight. Well, we know that y times x is gonna give us another yx, so plus another xy, and then we'll also have a y times minus eight, which will give us a minus eight y. Okay, and keep in mind that this is still all over that denominator of x minus eight times xy. Well, let's go ahead and simplify this down. That's gonna end up being xy squared. Let me go ahead and write that a little bit neater. xy squared plus 13xy, since we are combining these two terms. Okay, and then we also have minus eight y, and keep in mind this is all still over that denominator of x squared y minus eight. All right, from here, we go ahead and find which answer choice matches this, and we see that'll be answer choice C, so C will be our answer there. Here's why you need to pay attention to details on the SAT math section. Question 26 states that the table shows the results of a poll. A total of 803 voters selected at random were asked if the candidate they would vote for in the upcoming were asked which candidate they would vote for in the upcoming election. According to the poll, if 6,424 people would vote in the election, by how many votes would Angel Cruz be expected to win? The key thing with the SAT math section in general is you need to know what you need to answer with. In this case, it is by how many votes Angel Cruz would be expected to win. So it's not how many votes Angel Cruz would get, it's not how many votes his competitor would get, it's by how many votes he would beat his competitor by. So it's the difference between the two. So because it's the difference between the two, what we ultimately wanna do is we wanna take this poll and we want to find the difference between those two. So we're going to do 483 minus 320. And we have to put that all over the number of people who are in the poll, which is 803. Okay. And the next thing we have to do is we have to multiply that number by the amount of people who are actually going to be voting in the election because we're wanting to write how many votes they are expecting him to win by, right? The difference in the expectations of what will happen with the actual number of people, which is 6,424. Okay. So I'll go ahead and multiply that by 6424. All right. Now we'll put this into our calculator and get the answer. So the answer is 1,304, which we see is going to be answer choice B. Here's how to use Desmos to be more efficient on the digital SAT. Question 27 states that the graph of X squared plus X plus Y squared plus Y is equal to 199 over two in the XY plane is a circle. What is the length of the circle's radius? With a question like this, there's a lot of room for error if you try to do it by hand. So I highly recommend using the graphing calculator that's available on the digital SAT to do this. So the graphing calculator on the digital SAT pretty much works just like Desmo. So I'll go ahead and give you a look at how I would set this up. It's really simple. All I would do is put in this equation into the graphing calculator. And since I'm looking for the circle's radius, I would first find two points that are really easy to calculate. So I see I have one here at the X coordinate negative 0.5 and the Y coordinate 9.5. And then I just find the opposite coordinate, right? So I just go straight down. And I see I have at negative 0.5, so the same X coordinate. My Y coordinate is negative 10 and a half. So that difference is from nine and a half down to negative 10 and a half. So that means that I know my diameter is 20. I'll go ahead and write that. We know that our diameter is 20. So 20 is equal to D. We know that our radius then has to equal 10. And we're asked for to answer with our radius. So that gives us our answer right there. The answer is 10. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math problem. Question one states, Isabel grows potatoes in her garden. This year, she harvested 760 potatoes and saved 10% of them to plant next year. How many of the harvested potatoes did Isabel save to plant next year? All you got to do is take your total amount of potatoes, multiply that by the percentage that she saved, which re represented as a decimal of 0.1. You're going to get your answer of 76, which is answer choice B. Here's how to find the y-intercept of this graph on the SAT. Question two states, what is the y-intercept of the graph shown? We find where it crosses that y-axis and we see that's at two. So our answer there will be zero, two, which is answer choice B. Here's how to convert units on the SAT math section. Question three states, what length in centimeters is equivalent to a length of 51 meters, where one meter is equal to 100 centimeters? Well, we know that we have 51 meters, which I'm gonna represent 
with meters as M for that unit. It's not a variable, but it's the unit. Okay, now we wanna get rid of meters. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply by the fact that we have one meter per 100 centimeters. Now notice how my number of meters is gonna cancel out and the unit that I'm gonna be left with is centimeters. So as we can see, 51 times 100 is gonna leave us with 5,100 centimeters. So our answer is answer choice C. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question about distance. Question four states a bus is traveling at a constant speed along a straight portion of a road. The equation D is equal to 30T gives the distance D and feet from a road marker that the bus will be t seconds after passing the marker how many feet from the marker will the bus be two seconds after passing the marker well all we have to do is plug in two for t since t represents the number of seconds after passing the marker and that'll give us our distance d that we are from the marker so d will equal 30 times two in this situation since we are doing the distance two seconds after passing the marker and that will give us 60 so our answer there will be answer choice c Here's how to simplify on the SAT math section by distributing a negative sign. Question five states, which expression is equivalent to 20W minus 4W plus 3W? What you'll do here is you'll distribute that negative sign to that 4W and to that 3W, and that'll leave you with 20W minus 4W minus 3W. And that's ultimately going to end up being the same as 20W minus 7W, which is 13W. So our answer there is answer choice B. Here's how to use proportions to solve this SAT math question faster. The question is if six plus X equals nine, what is the value of 18 plus three X? Immediately, I recognize that six plus X, if we multiply it by three, we get 18 plus three X. So all we gotta do is take this nine and multiply it by three, which will give us 27 as our answer. So if you see a question like this on the SAT, see if you can multiply it by something to get what's right here, and that will help you get to your answer faster without having to solve for your variable X. Here's how to quickly find the X coordinate of a vertex of a quadratic. If you take a look at this question, it states the given equation relates the variables X and Y. For what value of X does the value of Y reach its minimum? Well, in this case, we see we have a quadratic X squared minus 14 X plus 22. Now, what you have to do then is you have to take the value of negative B over 2A, and that will give you the X coordinate of your vertex. Now, in this case, we're asked for the value of X where Y reaches its minimum. Now, Y will reach its minimum at the X coordinate of the vertex. So all we gotta do is do negative B over 2A. Well, our B value is negative 14, so we have negative negative 14, which will give us positive 14 over two times A. We see in this case, our A value is just one. So 14 over two will give us a value of seven. So our answer there has to be seven. Here's how to find an equivalent expression for a question like number eight. Which expression is equivalent to 9x squared plus 5x? In this situation, I see I can pull out an x by factoring. So if I do that, I'm gonna end up with x times 9x plus five. Okay, let's see if we have that anywhere. Uh, we see we do have that as option A, so that'd be our answer. I'll quickly show you why B, C, and D are wrong as well. Okay, obviously five times nine gets us 45. That's not found anywhere. Nine times five again. Okay, that's not found anywhere. And then right here, we'd end up with an x cubed value. Okay, so as we can see, our answer there would have to be D. Okay, you can tell that just by factoring, but I wanted to go ahead and show you why B, C, and D are wrong as well. Here's how to quickly solve this question about finding angle measures in a triangle on the SAT. Question nine states in triangle ABC, the measure of angle B is 52, the measure of angle C is 17. What is the measure of angle A? Well, we know that the sum of all the angles in a triangle must add to 180. So all we have to do here is do 180 degrees minus 17 degrees minus 52 degrees, and that'll give us the value of angle A. And 50 plus 17 is gonna give us 69. 180 minus 69 will give us 111. So our answer there would be answer choice D. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question. Question 10 states the graphs of the equations in the given systems of equations intersect at the point x, y in the x, y plane. What is the value of y? All right, it's pretty easy to solve for y here. All you gotta do is go ahead and substitute x equals eight and for x. We know eight squared is 64. So we're gonna end up with y is equal to 64 plus eight, which we know is going to equal 72. So our answer there is D. Here's how to answer scatter plot questions on the SAT math section. Question 11 states, a scatter plot shows the relationship between two variables, X and Y. A line of best fit is also shown. Which of the following equations best represents the line of best fit shown? So immediately what I'm gonna look for is my Y intercept, which I see is right around 13 and a half. And then I'm also gonna look at my slope, which I see is negative. So I see that I have positive slopes and answer choices C and answer choices A, so I can get rid of them. I see I have the wrong y-intercept and answer choice D, so my answer there has to be answer choice B. Here's a trick to make your life easier on the SAT when dealing with square roots. Question 12 states the function f is defined by f of x equals eight times the square root of x. For what value of x does f of x equal 48? Well, let's go ahead and start by writing out our, our equation. So we're gonna have 48 is equal to eight root x. Now you could go ahead and square both sides, but I don't recommend doing that because you're going to end up with a really large number. Instead, what I recommend it doing is dividing both sides by eight to start. 48 over eight is going to leave you with six is equal to the square root of x. From here, now's a great time to go ahead and square both sides because you don't have to square the value of 48. Now you end up with 36 is equal to x. So your answer there is going to be C. Here's how to efficiently solve this geometry problem on the SAT. Question 13 states a circle has center O and points R and S lie on the circle. In triangle ORS, the measure of angle ROS is 88 
and what is the measure of RSO in degrees? All right, let's draw this out because it's gonna make it a lot easier to visualize. Okay, we've got this center O and we've got ROS, which is 88 degrees, so ROS. Key thing we need to understand here is that the side length from R to O and O to S are going to be the same length. Now, that's important because we can go ahead and put in this 88 degrees for this angle measure. Now, we wanna know what the measure of angle RSO is. So let's go ahead and draw this triangle. Okay, now as you can see, we have an isosceles triangle. Now, an isosceles triangle means that these two sides are the same, which also means that the angle ORS and the angle RSO are the same. So now, since we know all of the degrees in a triangle will sum, or I'm sorry, all of the angles in a triangle will sum to 180 degrees, we can do 180 degrees, we'll subtract the 88 degrees that we have in this angle here, and then we will divide it by two since we know that we have two of these angles that will have the same measure. Okay, and once we do that, we will get that angle RSO. So 180 minus 88 is gonna leave us with 92. 92 divided by two is going to leave us with 46 as our answer for angle RSO. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question. Question 14 states, what is the sum of the solutions to give an equation? Well, let's go ahead and distribute our X. Ultimately, we're gonna to wanna to set this equal to zero. So let's go ahead and just try to do that, right? So we'll distribute this X. We're gonna end up with X squared plus X minus 56 is equal to four X squared because we're gonna distribute that four X and then we will have minus 28x. All right, let's go ahead and set it equal to zero. To do that, I'm actually gonna subtract everything on my left side because I don't wanna deal with subtracting a four x squared because then I have a negative coefficient in front of my x squared value. And just a piece of advice, I would generally try to avoid having a negative coefficient in front of your x squared value, just something that, that I would usually recommend, right? And it's also easier to subtract, you know, just a coefficient of one than it is one of four. So anyways, that's why I'm choosing to do it this way. So we'll go ahead and do this. We'll have to add 56, okay? So we're gonna end up getting a 4x squared minus x squared. It's gonna leave us with 3x squared. We have minus 28x, which we also have to subtract another x. That's gonna end up leaving us with a minus 29x. And then we also have this plus 56, so plus 56. Okay, now from here, you have a couple of options. You could try to factor this out or you could just use Desmos. A situation like this, honestly, I would just use Desmos. You're dealing with 56, 29, three. You might be able to factor something out there, but it is really not necessary. So let's go ahead and use Desmos to solve this. So as you can see in the graph, we've got two solutions. And keep in mind, we have to answer with the sum of the solutions. So the first solution that we have is at 2.667. So in other words, if we convert that into thirds, that would be eight over three. Okay, so we have eight over three, and then we also have seven. Okay, if we convert seven into thirds, that'd be 21 over three. So eight plus 21 is gonna give us 29 over three as our final answer there. Okay, so 29 over three is the sum of the solutions. Now, once again, as always on the SAT math section, you have to be very pay very close attention to what you're asked to answer with. In this case, it is the sum of the solutions. So that's how we get to that 29 over three. So always make sure you're paying close attention to what you're asked to answer with on the SAT math section. In this case, the answer 29 over three. Here's a trick you can use to save time on the SAT math section. Question 15, it says, the solution to the given system of equations is x, y, what is the value of 5x? On the SAT, you always wanna pay attention to what you're asked to answer with. In this case, it's the value of 5x. We don't necessarily have to actually solve for x to get our answer, we just need to know the value of 5x. So the reason that's important is because if you see stacked equations like this on the SAT, you're typically gonna to look to add, subtract, or substitute something in in order to get to the value asked to answer with because like I said, you don't always actually have to solve for X and you don't always have to actually solve for X and Y. So in this case, what I'm actually gonna be looking to do is substitution because I see I have Y is equal to three X and I see I have a two X here. I know two X plus three X is going to give me five X. So when I substitute in that three X for Y, I end up with five X is equal to 12 and I know my answer has to be C and I never had to actually find the value of X. Here's how to solve this question about volume on the SAT. Question 16 states a cube has an edge length of 41 inches. What is the volume in cubic inches of the cube? One thing you wanna pay attention to on the SAT math section is units. In this case, you see they're both inches, so it's very easy. Okay, all you have to do is take your 41 inches for your edge length and raise it to the power of three. Okay, so 41 raised to the power of three, you put it in your calculator and you're gonna get answer choice D, 68,921. The reason we're raising it to the power of three is because a cube has a length, width, and height that are all the same, so the volume is just 41 cubed. Here's how to answer this question about population growth on the SAT math section. Question 17 states, the given function P models the population of Lowell T years after a census. Which of the following functions best models the population of Lowell M months after the consensus? The key thing to understand here is that this equation up here, P of T, is representing the population T years after the consensus. But we have to convert this into months after the consensus. So to do that, we need this T to turn into that T needs to turn into an M over 12. That way at 12 months, we have 12 over 12, which is one year, which would be the same as T being one, one year. 
So we can go ahead and get rid of A and B. Next thing we can look at is the difference between C and D. Now we have to keep in mind, we aren't needing to divide our growth factor at all. Because think about it, if we divide 1.06 over 12, we now have a decreasing population because that's gonna result in a value that's less than one. And that's not the case. We know our population is increasing every year. Okay, our growth factor remains the same. All we're changing is the unit of time. So we have M over 12 to account for the fact we are changing from years to months. Our growth factor remains the same and our initial population remains the same. And our answer is D. Here's a trick to use on the SAT math section to be way more efficient. If you take a look at question 18, it says the solution to the given system of equations is X, Y. What is the value of Y? On the SAT math section, especially whenever you see stacked equations like this, always pay really close attention to what you're asked to answer with. In this case, it's the value of y. Now, whenever I see stacked equations like this, what I'm usually gonna look to do is either substitute if I have something like y equals, and then something that doesn't include another variable. But in this case, they both have variables. There's an x and y in each of these equations. So instead of substitution, I am looking for addition and subtraction of adding or subtracting this bottom equation from the top one. Now, sometimes it'll require me to multiply the bottom and the top equation by some number. In this case, it does. I'm gonna multiply this bottom equation by three. And the reason why is because once I do that and I distribute this three to all of these numbers, I will end up with six X and then I can subtract my bottom equation from my top and I'll end up with six X minus six X. I'll be able to get rid of my X's. I'll have seven Y minus six Y and that will leave me with my value of Y. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to end up with six X minus six X. X's are gone. Seven Y minus six Y, which means that we have one Y left. And then we have 28 minus 30, which leaves us with negative two, and our value of y is negative two, and our answer there is a. So there's some advice on how you can deal with stacked equations on the SAT and work them to your advantage to be more efficient. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 60 seconds. Question 19 states the minimum value of x is 12 less than six times another number n, which inequality shows possible values of x. Well, we know that the minimum value of x, which means that x must be greater than or equal to this number, okay? And it's 12 less, so it's gonna be minus 12, six times another number n, so six times n. And as we can see, this perfectly matches up with answer choice B. So B will be our correct answer there. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question. Question 20 states, data set A consists of the height of 75 buildings and has a mean of 32 meters. Data set B consists of a height of 50 buildings and has a mean of 62 meters. Data set C consists of the heights of 125 buildings from data sets A and B. What is the mean in meters of data set C? Okay, so ultimately for this question, we need to calculate the mean of data set C. Well, we know that that is a composite of the data set A and B together. So what we need to do is we need to get the total amount of height in meters from data sets A and B combined. So to do that, we're gonna take the 75 buildings that are in data set A, multiply it by the mean of 32, and that'll give us that total height from data set A. We then have to add on to that the total height from data set B, which is gonna be those 50 buildings multiplied by those 62 meters of those 50 buildings. So from there, we then have to divide by that 125 buildings total. So here we're getting our total height in our numerator and the number of buildings in the denominator, and that will ultimately get us to our answer. Once we put it in our calculator, let's see what we get of 44. So 44 is our answer. Here's three different strategies that you can use to solve question 21 and stick around to the end because at the end, I'm gonna discuss how to know which strategies you should be using on certain questions when there's different ways that you can get to the right answer. All right, so let's go ahead and read through the question. The graph of 9x minus 10y equals 19 is translated down four units in the xy plane. What is the x-coordinate of the x-intercept of the resulting graph? So a couple of things that jump out right away. If we're looking for the x-intercept, we know that's gonna be where y is zero. We need to find the x-coordinate of that x-intercept. We're going down four units, and we also wanna make note that this is in standard linear form, not slope-intercept form. Okay, so let's start with the first and probably the most commonly used approach. That would be converting this into slope and intercept form, and then translating it down those four units. So let's go ahead and do that. If we're translating this into, if we're converting this into slope and intercept form, the way that I would approach it is we're gonna have nine X minus 10 Y is equal to 19. I would isolate Y. In this case, I would actually add 10 Y to the right and left sides, and I would subtract 19. So I'd end up with nine X minus 19 is equal to 10 Y. I divide both sides by 10, and I'd end up with nine over 10 X minus 19 over 10. All right, now keep in mind that we are ultimately going to translate this graph down four units in the xy plane. So if we're translating it down four units, we would subtract by 40 over 10, okay, is equal to y. Now we wanna find where our x-intercept is. Well, our x-intercept is gonna be where y is equal to zero. So we can now set this equal to zero. Now from here, I'm gonna combine this negative 19 over 10 and this negative 40 over 10 into negative 59 over 10. Then I'll add it to both sides and I'll end up with 59 over 10 is equal to nine over 10 x, okay? Now from here, 
All we gotta do is multiply both sides by 10 and we get 59 is equal to 9x. From there to isolate x, we see that x would equal 59 over 9. Okay, so 59 over 9 is our right answer. But that's just one of the ways to get there. Let's talk about the other two different ways to get there. Okay, so one of them is pretty similar to the way that we just did, but probably a couple less steps. Okay, and this is kind of for people who are a little bit more advanced in math who maybe are able to sort of pick up on something like this a little bit quicker. Okay, let's say that we have 9x minus 10y equals 19. All right, now if we are translating this down four units, okay, then that's the same as doing 9x minus 10y plus four in parentheses equals 19. Okay, and this just kind of saves a couple steps, right? We distribute that 10 over, we're gonna end up with 9x minus 10y, and then minus 40 is equal to 19. All right, so from here, once again, like I said before, our x-intercepts where y is equal to zero, so this would ultimately, and I'm just gonna kind of bring this up here, okay? We put in zero for y, we end up with 9x minus 40 is equal to 19. We add 40 to both sides, we get 59 is equal to 9x. We divide both sides by nine, and once again, we get that same answer of 59 over nine. Okay, so now there is also a third way to solve this, okay? I wanna make a point at the end that'll help you with other questions on the SAT too. So the third way is kind of a halfway point between this one and the other one, but it's more so like the, the first step that we did. So let me go ahead and pull up Desmos because this is for the digital SAT, so you do have access to Desmos in your testing environment. So the way that I would do this using Desmos is I would pretty much convert it into slope intercept form and then I would put it into Desmos and use that to get to the rest of the answer. So as you can see, if you do that, you look for where it equals zero and that's at 6.556, which is 59 over nine. Now the disadvantage of using Desmos is it's not gonna give you a perfect fraction, but most of the time it's pretty easy to figure it out. This is probably one of the more difficult cases where it's something being divided over nine and it's a little bit more difficult to discern what the fraction is. But most of the time it's usually something over three or over five or over four and it's pretty easy to do. But now that we've talked about the three different methods that you can use for solving this question, I wanna talk about how you know which method you should use just generally on certain questions because there are oftentimes certain shortcuts you can use and many times, maybe not many times, but some people may not know those shortcuts exist. So are they worth learning? When should you use them? How much focus should you put into using shortcuts versus using Desmos? I think it's something we really do need to talk about because with the digital SAT, everything is very different. And I think it really comes down to how comfortable you are using sort of shortcuts like the one I showed you in the second way of solving this, where you know that it's translated y plus four, right? If you don't know those shortcuts, you know, rely more on Desmos, convert things into slope intercept form. There's so many different, maybe not so many, but there's sometimes a couple different ways to get to an answer. And you ultimately need to use what you're most comfortable with. Now, is it good to still learn shortcuts? Yes, because it can save you time. So especially if you're someone who struggles with time, it's probably worth learning them. But if you're someone who can move really fast by converting things into slope intercept form and using Desmos, then do it. And maybe don't worry as much about learning these shortcuts. My job is to give you as many tools as you can to be successful, but ultimately you do need to pay attention to what you're most comfortable with. There are certain times where the method that I use I'll show you two different methods and you may choose one that I don't necessarily prefer to use. And that's okay, but you ultimately should be focused on what you're most comfortable with, what you're fastest with, what you're fastest and most accurate with. So you kind of got to make a judgment call for yourself. My job is to give you as many strategies as you can to be successful. If you find that some of them are a little bit too advanced for you, that's okay. Notice how you could get to this answer using slope intercept form and Desmos, right? So it's possible to still do highly well, extremely well in the SAT math section and not know every shortcut. But like I said, if you do struggle with time, it is worth knowing those shortcuts. So I guess to wrap all this up and to bring it to a conclusion, I'm gonna give you the tools and you know as many different ways to solve things as I can. I'll give you what I recommend. I'll try to give you strategies, but you also need to take into account your personal situation, how comfortable you are using certain strategies, and that'll help you do the best that you possibly can on the SAT. So there's my little rant for this question. Here's how to answer this question about the exponential growth formula on the SAT. Question 22 states two variables, X and Y, are related such that for each increase of one in the value of X, the value of Y increases by a factor of four. When X equals zero, Y equals 200, which equation represents the relationship? Well, this piece of information right here is giving us our initial value. When X is zero, Y is 200. So we need to have that Y equals 200. So we can go ahead and get rid of A and B because they both don't have the correct initial value. Now, as for our growth factor, we know our growth factor is four. It's stated pretty explicitly right here. 
for every increase in the value of x by one, we increase our value in y by a factor of four. Now we have to keep in mind, we are gonna raise this to the power of x because this is exponential growth. Every time we increase the value of x by one, we increase y by a value by a factor of four. That is exponential growth down to the definition. So we know our answer there has to be answer choice D. And there's a quick review on exponential growth for you. Here's how to solve one of the most difficult SAT math questions in a standard way and a way to finesse the question if you're not sure how to do the standard way. All right, so question 23 states, one solution to give an equation can be written as one plus root K, where K is a constant. What is the value of K? So the key part to this is you seeing that you have one plus the square root of K and recognizing that you're probably gonna be dealing with some sort of squares there. All right, so the next thing you really need to understand is how to ultimately get this into the point where you're completing a square, right? And if this sounds complicated, it kind of is, but at the end, I'll show you a way that you can finesse this. So just, just hang with me here. All right, so you're gonna start by adding nine to both sides. You'll end up with x squared minus two x is equal to positive nine. Now, what you ultimately wanna get and what your goal is here is since you saw you have this, you wanna get to a point where you have x something squared set equal to some constant. Okay, and the reason why is because I guess I'll just get to that kind of as I go through this, but you'll, you'll see why you want to get there. And that's what I'm trying to get to. All right, so we have x squared minus 2x is equal to 9. Now, like I said, I want to get to x something squared. Now, x squared minus 2x, I know x minus 1 squared isn't going to quite get me exactly x squared minus 2x. It would give me x squared minus 2x plus 1. So what do I have to do here? Well, I've got to add 1 to both sides. So if I add 1 to both sides, I'm going to end up with x squared minus 2x plus 1 is equal to 9 plus 1, which is 10. Well, now from here, I can set that equal to that x minus 1 squared. So now I'm where I want to be, okay? Because from here, I'm going to go ahead and take the square root of both sides. And now I have root 10. And now keep in mind that root 10 is plus or minus, okay? Because we are taking the square root of it. So it'll be plus or minus root 10. It's going to equal our x minus 1, okay? Now from here, we go ahead and add 1 to both sides. We get 1 plus or minus root 10 is equal to x, Okay, now if we look at the format for the solutions, right, we need to be writing it as one plus root K. Well, we see that one of our solutions here would be one plus root 10. Okay, so we know our answer for the value of K is 10. Okay, so our answer there would be B. Now, let's say you don't know how to do this, which honestly, like it's one of the most difficult SAT math questions, so it wouldn't be that surprising. Okay, if you don't know how to do this and you get to the SAT and maybe you are able to do it in practice, but on the SAT, you just kind of panic or you're running out of time, Here's an alternative method that you can kind of finesse to get to the right answer. All right, so I'm gonna use Desmos here. And keep in mind, the reason I'm using this is because on the new digital SAT, you pretty much have access to Desmos within Bluebook, the testing platform. So you'll be able to use this. So what I'm gonna do here is I plug in my equation. Now keep in mind, this is set equal to zero, right? I'll go ahead and circle that so you see what I'm referring to, right? We're set equal to zero. So we wanna find where we are equaling zero, okay? So where we are crossing our X axis. Now, if we take a look, we see that we cross our x-axis at 4.162. Now, what else do we know? And I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. Since we have that the solution must be one plus root k, and we know that our solution is equal to 4.162, because we see that on Desmos, we can do this. We've got 4.162, we subtract one from that, we get 3.162, and we know that that's gotta equal the square root of some number k. Now, since this is multiple choice, we can actually just plug in these numbers and get to our right answer. But I wanna talk about what if this was free response? You can still finesse it even if it was free response. And here's how. The way I would look at this is I know that the square root of nine is three. And I see that we need to get a little bit higher than that. So then what I would do is I would put in the square root of 10. And keep in mind, this might not work if you're dealing with numbers that are like the square root of 500, but that question typically wouldn't be asked on the SAT because that would be extremely complex. And if you already have a question as complex as this, you're probably gonna be dealing with a, with a K value that's not you know extreme, right? So I see 3.162, I know that nine, if I take square root of that, it's three, I go up one, I take square root of 10, and I get 3.162. So that's how you can finesse this, even if it's not multiple choice. Obviously, since it's multiple choice, you could just go ahead and plug in um, the eight, the 10, the 20, and see which one works, and you'd get 10. So I wanted to go ahead and show you this because it's a great example of how you can use the digital SATs. Desmo is basically being built in to your advantage. Um, and if you have a graphing calculator, it's the same thing. So hopefully this was helpful, and hopefully you understand better how you can finesse the SAT if you do forget how to do things you know, the normal way, quote unquote. Here's something you need to know about standard deviation for the SAT math section. I'm gonna illustrate this through question 24. The dot plots represent the distributions of values in data sets A and B. Which of the following statements must be true? 
And then we have two statements here, one being the median of data set A is equal to the median of data set B, and then two being the standard deviation of data set A is equal to the standard deviation of data set B. Now, whenever you have anything like a, a histogram or scatter plots or two data sets, you always want to compare the shape of them to each other, okay? Or the values of them to each other if it's the case that they are just listed out in numerical form. But in this case, we have the shape. So we want to compare the shapes of these two together. And as you can see, they are the same except for these two dots in data set A. We see that there's three dots here for 13, but in data set B, there's only one. Okay, so we we're looking at this as the only difference. Now, as far as the medians, we see that since everything else is the same, right, we would cross out these and we would end up getting a median of 13. And then over here in data set B, we'd also get a median of 13. So their medians are the same. Okay, so we know that one is true. Let's see if we can answer it just based on that. We know that one must be true. Uh, doesn't look like that will get us there on its own. So let's go ahead and look at number two. Standard deviation of data set A is equal to standard deviation of data set B. Well, we know that that can't be true. And here's why. Okay, even though these things have the sh the mostly the same shape, this difference of two more values being centered around the median is going to make it so that the standard deviation of data set A is lower than that of data set B. Okay, they can't be the same. In order for the standard deviations to be the same, they have to be the same, right? They have to be the same data sets for the most part. Generally on, on the SAT, that's that's pretty much the case, okay? Because they don't really get too in depth into the actual equation for standard of deviation. They pretty much just want you to be able to visually tell in terms of standard deviation. So yeah, what you need to know here is that since we're adding more concentration around the median, around the mean value, okay? We, that means that our standard deviation is gonna be lower in data set A, okay? So the answer here is that one is true, number two is false, okay? So that would be, which of the following must be true? The answer is A, one only. Here's how to solve this really difficult SAT math problem. The first way being how you can finesse it since it's a multiple choice. And the second way I'll show you how you can solve it on the off case that you come up with a question like this that is a free response answer. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Question 25 states an isosceles right triangle has a perimeter of 94 plus 94 root two inches. What is the length in inches of one leg of the triangle? Okay, so ultimately the length of one leg is pretty easy to find. And the reason why is it's an isosceles right triangle. So isosceles right triangle, I'm gonna draw this out as I recommend you do with questions about triangles and circles on the SAT. We've got these two side legs will be the same cause like I said, isosceles. Now that means it's gonna be a 45, 45, 90 triangle. Okay, therefore, we know that our hypotenuse will be x root 2, where x is the value of one of the legs. Okay, from here, let's go ahead and set up our equation. We know our perimeter is 94 plus 94 root 2. We know that that's going to equal 2x plus x root 2. Okay, we get that by taking x plus x plus x root 2. Okay, from here, I'm looking to solve for x, right? So I'm going to go ahead and factor out x from my right side. I'm going to get x times 2 plus root 2. Okay. Now, to ultimately solve for x, then I just divide both sides by this 2 plus root 2. Okay, so now I have isolated my x. This is over 2 plus root 2. Now, since this is multiple choice, what I would do at this point is I would just go ahead and put this right here in my calculator. I'd get whatever it is as a decimal, and then I would just check A through D and find the answer. That is the fastest way to do it since it's multiple choice. So that's what I would 100% recommend. And I would, without a doubt, with no question, that's what I'm doing if it's multiple choice, which it is in this case. So that's a strategy you should use on multiple choice. However, this question or one like it could come up as a free response question. And the way that they would do that, since it's dealing with a square root, is they would probably say they would do something like this. They would put like some variable underneath the square root and say, what's the value of D in the answer? Um, so I am going to show you how you solve this in case you come across one of these. That is free response. So let's continue this question. Okay. So we know that X is equal to this right here. Now we need to ultimately get this so it's actually a number, right? We need to get it so that it's something we can put in on free response. Now to do that, we have to multiply by two minus the square root of two. Okay, so we multiply by two minus square root of two. And the reason that we have to do this is because we have two plus root two here. And by taking the difference of these squares, it's gonna help us get rid of the square root that's in the denominator. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Okay, we're gonna have this two times two, and I'll do the, the denominator first. So we have this two times two, that's gonna give us four. Okay, we're gonna have four times, let's see, we're gonna have this plus root two times two, and we're gonna have this minus root two times two. So keep in mind, those are gonna cancel. That's why we're doing this. We're doing the difference of these squares. Okay, so that square root is now gonna get canceled out. Okay, one thing we will still have is this root two times this negative root two, which will give us a minus two, right? So we're gonna end up with a four minus two, minus two. Okay, now in our denominator, or I'm sorry, our numerator, we also have to do this, right? So we have to take the same thing and we have to FOIL it out. 
All right, so we got 94 times two. We know that's gonna be 188, so we got 188. We've also got 94 root two times two, so that's gonna give us plus a one root two. We've also got a 94 times negative root two, which will give us a minus 94 root two. Okay, and I know I'm running out of room there, so I'm actually gonna erase this and bring it up. Okay, so as you can see, I folded out. I brought it up here so you can see it a little bit better and it's a little bit bigger. Now from here, we can go ahead and see that we have 188 minus 188. Okay, so those are gonna cancel. So I'm just gonna go ahead and erase those. Okay, we still have this plus 188 square root two minus 94 square root two. That's gonna leave us with a positive 94 square root two. So now we have 94 square root two over two. 94 over two will leave us with 47. And now we are left with our answer of 47 root two. So that's how you solve it if it is free response. Okay, the key thing being right here, down in your denominator, you have to multiply by flipping the sign within that parentheses, okay, in order to get that difference of squares, okay? So that's the key to solving this if it is free response. Remember though, if it's multiple choice, do not do this. It will take way too long. Just put it in a calculator and then plug in A through D and find the right answer. Here's how to solve SAT math questions that deal with the number of real solutions. Question 26 states in the given equation, C is a constant. The equation has exactly one real solution. What is the value of C? Well, if you're unfamiliar with how to calculate the number of real solutions, you're going to use this formula called b squared minus 4ac, okay? And keep in mind, you use this when you have a quadratic equation like here set equal to zero, okay? And in this equation, your a value is what's in front of your x squared value, your b value is what's in front of x, and then your c value is your constant, which in this case is just being represented as c. Now, if b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero, then that means that there are two real solutions. That means there are two real solutions. In this case, we want one real solution. So when b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero, that's when we get one real solution, okay? Now, there is a third case, which is where b squared minus 4ac is less than zero. And in that case, there are no real solutions, or in other words, there are zero real solutions. Okay, now in our case, we know that we have to set this equal to zero since we're looking for where there is one real solution. Well, we know our A value is gonna be negative nine, we know our B value is 30, and we obviously have C. So B value is 30, we're gonna take that, we're gonna square it, so we'll have 30 squared minus four times A, we know our A value is negative nine times C, which we're just representing as C, and that's gotta all equal zero. 30 squared is gonna be 900, so we'll have 900 minus four times negative nine, which is gonna end up being positive 36, so a positive 36C is gonna equal zero. From here, we'll subtract 900 from both sides and we'll end up with 36C is equal to negative 900. And then from there, we'll divide both sides by 36 to get that C is equal to 900, or I'm sorry, negative 900 divided by 36. Okay, now negative 900 divided by 36 is going to give us negative 25. So we know our value for C must be negative 25. This SAT math problem may seem scary, but it's actually really easy. And today I'm gonna to explain why. Question 27 states in the given system of equations, P is a constant. If the system has no solution, what is the value of P? So this is a system of linear equations. And in order for a system of linear equations to have no solution, the slopes must be the same, but the y-intercepts must be different. Now, these are going to be in standard linear form. Now, they aren't really in it yet, but we're gonna put them in it and that'll make it a lot easier. So let's start with the top equation. Now, standard linear form is where you have a coefficient in front of your y and then a coefficient in front of your x and it's set equal to a constant. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll start with equation one, which I'm just gonna mark with a one right here. Now we have three over two y minus one over four x equals two thirds minus three over two y. Now we need to move this right here over here. And we're gonna do that by adding it. Since it's minus three over two y, we're gonna add three over two y to both sides. Now that's gonna end up leaving us with three over two y plus three over two y, which will ultimately simplify down to three y. So now we have three y minus one over four x is equal to two over three for our first equation. Now, like I said, we have to have the same slope. So let's go ahead and find the slope for this first equation. Well, when we have standard linear form, which is where we have a coefficient in front of our y and a coefficient in front of our x set equal to a constant, our slope is going to equal negative a over b, where, okay, and m is gonna represent our slope, where the a value is the value that is in front of our x, which in this case is negative one over four. Okay, so we're gonna end up with positive one over four because we have negative, negative one over four, which gives us that positive one over four. We're going to divide that by b, b value being three. So we're gonna divide that by three. Now, keep in mind when you are dividing by three, right? Divide by three over one, okay? We multiply by the reciprocal, right? So that'd be the same as multiplying by one third, okay? So that makes it a lot more simple. So we got one over 12 now. Okay, so now we know that our slope is one over 12. Now, like I said, we need to have the same slope in this next equation in order for there to be no solutions. All right, so let's get to that same slope. Once again, we wanna put it in the same form. So let's go ahead and bring this PY over by subtracting it. 
Okay, so we're gonna end up right here. This is gonna be our second equation, one half x. We have this plus three over two, which we can actually just go ahead and move to the other side. So we'll move it to the other side. Okay, but we're gonna have minus py. Okay, and then we have nine over two minus three over two. Okay, which is ultimately gonna leave us with six over two, which is three. So we'll just put that equal to three. Okay, so now we gotta solve for what p is. Well, we know we need to get the same slope. So we're gonna have one over 12. 1 over 12 must equal. Now we got negative a. Our a value here is 1 half, so that'd be negative 1 half. Okay, and then we have to divide that by our b value. So we have to divide that by this negative p. So we have to divide that by negative p over 1. Now, like I said, we can just change this division and multiplication by doing multiplying by 1 over negative p. So we'll multiply by 1 over negative p. Multiply it by 1 over negative p. Okay, so now we see that these negative signs are going to cancel. So we'll just go ahead and get rid of those negative signs. All right, so now we have ones in all of our numerators and then we have 12 is equal to 2p so we have 12 equals 2p we divide both sides by 2 and we're going to end up getting that 6 is equal to p so we see our answer there will be 6. so even though this problem looks really scary it's actually pretty simple it's just a matter of knowing how to set it up understanding standard linear form how to get your slope and the fact that in order for there to be no solution you have to have the same slope and a different y-intercept, which as you can see here, we do have different y-intercepts as well. Here's how to interpret bar graphs on the SAT math section. Question one states a group of students voted on five after-school activities. The bar graph shows the number of students who voted for each of the five activities. How many students chose activity three? In this case, we'll take a look at our y-axis. We see that that's number of students. Therefore, we wanna know the number of students who voted for activity three. We find that bar, and if we go ahead and go across, we see it's somewhere around 38 or 39, which we see is answer choice B. Here's how to answer this SAT math question about percentages in under 60 seconds. Question two states, what percentage of 300 is 75? All you got to do is do 75 divided by 300, and then that will get you your decimal to convert that to a percentage. You multiply it by 100, and that would get you 25%. So your answer is answer choice A. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 60 seconds. The question states, what is the solution to the given equation? In order to solve this, we need to isolate X. So we'll start by multiplying both sides by 25. Next thing we have to do is get x all alone. So we have to take the square root of x squared, which means we also have to take the square root of 36 times 25. This leaves us with x is equal to the square root of 36 times 25, which will equal out to 30. So we know our answer there is going to be answer choice B. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question. The question states three more than eight times a number x is equal to 83, which equation represents this situation. So one thing you'll note is as I read the question, I started writing down the equation. I noticed we have three more, that means three plus something, eight times a number, uh, which is represented as x, so plus eight x is equal to 83. We're asked for the equation, we've already got it, so three plus eight x equals 83. We see that we have that in answer choice D, so D will be our correct answer there. Here's how to interpret this word problem on the SAT. Question five states, Hannah deposited a fixed amount into her bank account each month. The function f of t equals 100 plus 25t gives the amount in dollars in Hannah's bank account after t monthly deposits. What is the best interpretation of 25 in this context? Well, we know f of t represents the amount in her bank account. This 100, since it doesn't have any variables next to it, is her initial amount, and then she's adding on $25 every month. So that that 25 is the amount that she's depositing every month. So we have option A, with each monthly deposit, the amount in Hannah's bank account increases by $25. Yes, that is a correct interpretation, so our answer is A. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question and a trick to check your work. Question six states, a customer spent $27 to purchase oranges at $3 per pound. How many pounds of oranges did the customer purchase? Well, we know that she spent $27, so that's $27. Now, we have to divide that by that $3 per pound. Okay, so that's $3 per pound. I'll represent pound as LB. Okay, now what we see here is that our dollars are going to cancel and what we're left with is 27 over 3, which is 9 pounds. Okay, so we have 9 pounds. And obviously you're seeing that this is the correct sort of equation to set up because we end with pounds. We want to know how many pounds of oranges the customer purchased. So that's one way you can check is by making sure you end with the correct units. Um, and as you can see, our answer there will be nine. Here's a tip to help you be more efficient on the SAT math section and how to apply it. So when you glance at question seven, you see it's gonna be more than three lines. Now, because it's more than three lines, I'm probably gonna be dealing with some sort of equation or system of equations or system of inequalities. So what I'm gonna do is as I read through it, I'm gonna start writing down coefficients and variables so that I can kind of get my equation on my initial read through, hopefully, which should save me time. So let's go ahead and read through. Let's see about nine storage bins that were each the same price. He used a coupon for $63 off the entire purchase. The cost for the entire purchase after using the coupon was $27, okay? And we know that he got $63 off and it's nine times some variable. We'll see if we get what that is. What was the original price in dollars for one storage bin? We're not giving it, so we'll just call that X. Okay, so now we have to solve for X. X is the cost per storage bin. 
Um, so all we gotta do here is isolate X, we'll add 63 to both sides. Okay, we're gonna end up with 90 is equal to 9X. We divide both sides by nine and that will give us X is equal to 10. So our answer there will be 10. So as you can see, by writing down our coefficients and variables on our initial read through, we're able to save time because we don't have to go back and find these coefficients and variables. We're able to get that equation set up immediately after our first read through, avoiding a second read through and saving us time. Here's how to turn a table into a linear function on the SAT. Question eight states for the linear function f, the table shows three values of x and their corresponding values of f of x. Which equation defines f of x? In this case, all my answer choices are in slope intercept form. So what I'll start by doing is finding the intercept. In this case, since I'm given the x coordinate of a zero, I know that my y intercept will be at 29, which means I can get rid of b and I can get rid of d. Next thing I'm looking at is slope. Okay, I see that when I go over one, I go up by three, which means my slope is going to be three X. So my answer there will be answer choice A. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question about similar triangles. Question nine states right triangle PQR and STU are similar where P corresponds to S. If the measure of angle Q is 18 degrees, what is the measure of angle S? Okay, so we know Q is 18 degrees. Okay, we also know then that T is going to be 18 degrees since these are similar triangles. Okay, now we want to solve for the measure of angle S. The measure of angle S is the same as the angle measure of P. So what we can do here, since this is a right triangle, Okay, we know that 90 is going to equal our angle measure S, so S plus our angle measure that is 18 degrees, so that would be angle measure T. Okay, so plus 18 degrees. 90 degrees equals S plus 18 degrees. That means that S is going to equal 90 minus 18. 90 minus 18 will leave us with 72 degrees. So 72 degrees will be our answer for the value of angle S. So our answer is B. Here's how to answer this question about scatter plots on the SAT. Question 10 states a scatter plot shows the relationship between two variables, X and Y. Which of the following equations is the most appropriate linear model for the data shown? In this case, since we're looking for a linear model, I'm gonna go ahead and find about where the y-intercept is. It's right around 10. I see my slope is going to be negative. So if I'll go down to my answer choices, anything with a positive slope I can get rid of. So that means answer choices, answer choices A I can get rid of and answer choice C I can get rid of because they both have positive slopes. Then I'm looking at my y-intercept. My y-intercept needs to be right around positive 10, uh, which I see I have in answer choice D. So D, we have that positive y-intercept somewhere around 10. And then we also have that negative slope of around one. So D will be our correct answer there. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question. Question 11 states the given equation describes the relationship between the number of birds B and the number of reptiles R that can be cared for at a pet care business on a given day. If the business cares for 16 reptiles on a given day, how many birds can it care for on this day? Well, we know that we can plug in 16 for R then. If we plug in 16 for R, we're gonna end up with five times 16, which will equal 80. So then we would have 80 is equal to 80, okay? Which means that the value of B has to be zero. Okay, so our answer is A. Here's a trick to help you move faster on the SAT math section. If we take a look at question 12, it asks, what is an equation of the graph shown? If I glance at my answer choices, I see all my y-intercepts are the same, so I'm really worried about my slope here. I see my slope is negative, which means I can get rid of anything with a positive slope. The next thing I see is I've gotta calculate the negative slope and see what it is. Well, I see that right here. I go down by two and I go over by two. Now, the key thing that they're testing you on is whether or not you're taking a look at what the units are, okay? Because if you look here, even though we only have one dash that we are changing, we are actually moving over to the right by two units. So the key thing here is to make sure that you're paying attention to what your units are on your x-axis and your y-axis. So as we can see, we are going down by two and we are going to the right by two, which means that our actual slope here is just negative x. Okay, so our answer there is C. Here's how to answer this SAT math question super quickly. Question 13 states, if X over eight is equal to five, what is the value of eight over X? Since we know that X over eight and eight over X are just flipped, all we gotta do is take this five over one, flip it to one over five, and that'll be our answer. Here's a trick to help you be way more efficient on the SAT math section. Question 14 states, the solution to the given system of equations is X, Y. What is the value of Y? The key thing to pay attention to on questions like this is what you're asked to answer with. In this case, it's the value of Y, which means there's a chance we don't have to calculate the value of X. If we take a look look at this system of equations. Whenever you see stacked equations like this, you want to look to add or subtract this bottom equation from the top one. And sometimes that might be mean that you have to multiply the bottom or the top equation by some number in order to get to the value you want to answer with, which in this case is y. So to get y, we want to get rid of x. So let's take a look at if we can do that. Well, if we multiply this bottom equation by four, we're going to end up with 24x. And then we can go ahead and subtract this bottom equation from the top equation. And then we'll be left with a y value and then a constant. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna have 24x minus four times six x, so minus 24x, our x's are then gone. Then we have y minus four y, because we have to distribute this four. So y minus four y is gonna leave us with negative three y is equal to 48 minus four times 72, which when we put in our calculator will give us negative 240. 
So from there, we isolate y by dividing both sides by negative 3. So we can go ahead and divide both sides by negative 3. And that's going to leave us with positive 80 as the value of y. So our answer there is 80. Here's a trick to solve this SAT math question way faster. Question 15 states line t in the xy plane is a slope of negative 1 third and passes through the point 9, 10. Which equation defines line t? First thing I'm seeing is I've got this slope of negative 1 third, which means I can get rid of answer choices a and b. And I'm left with c and d, the only difference with the two being their y-intercepts. Now, since I know that this is ultimately going down and I've got these points 9 and 10, if I plot that point just roughly, I know my y-intercept is going to have to be uh, somewhere above 10, right? Because we've got to be going down throughout this time. So because we have these points, that's why we know that. Thus, our answer cannot be C because C would require us to have a flat line in order to hit that point. So we know that that cannot be true and we know our answer there has to be answer choice D. Here's how to interpret exponential growth word problems on the SAT math section. Question 16 states the function f of x is equal to 206 times 1.034 raised to the power of x models the value in dollars of a certain bank account by the end of each year from 1957 through 1972, where x is the number of years after 1957. Which of the following is the best interpretation of f of 5 is approximately to equal to 243 in this context? Well, we know that that 243 is ultimately what the value of f of 5 is. Therefore, that 243 is the amount that is in the account after five years after 1957. So that would put us at 1962. Okay, so let's go ahead and find the answer choice that matches up with that interpretation. We have option A, the value of the bank account is estimated to be approximately $5 greater in 1962 than in 1957. No, B, the value of the bank account is estimated to be approximately $243 in 1962. Yes, 1962 is five years after, thus the F of five, and it's equal to that $243 in value. Here's how to quickly answer this SAT math question using proportions. Question 17 states, for a certain rectangular region, the ratio of its length to its width is 35 to 10. If the width of the rectangular region increases by 10 by seven units, how must the length change to maintain this ratio? Okay, so what we know here is that our length is going to equal three and a half times our width. And the way we get that is by having 35 over 10, right? If you were to rewrite 35 over 10, you get three and a half. All right, so now from here, we wanna know if we increase our width by seven units, how much will our length change? Well, we can just use this proportion right here. So all we would have then is three and a half times seven, which will equal 24 and a half. So we know that we must increase by 24 and a half. Since we are increasing our width, we must also increase our length in order to maintain that ratio or proportion. So our answer there is B. Here's how to break down hard SAT math problems to make them easy and simplistic. Question 18 states square P has a side length of X inches. Square Q has a perimeter that is 176 inches greater than the perimeter of square P. The function F gives the area of square Q in square inches, which of the following defines F? Okay, well, we know that ultimately the perimeter of square Q is going to be 4x plus 176. All right, that is equal to the perimeter of uh, square Q. Okay, now the key thing here is we need to understand what we have to solve for, and that's the area of square Q. So in order to find the area of a square, we need to know the side length. So in order to find the side length here, what we can do is we can take this perimeter and we can divide it all by 4. So if we go ahead and take 4x plus, so 4x plus 176, and we divide all of that by 4, that's going to leave us with x plus 44 as the value of the side length. Now, the area of the square then is going to be the value of the side length squared. So we know our answer there will be answer choice A. Here's how to quickly rearrange variables on the SAT. Question 19 states a given equation relates to the distinct positive real numbers w, x, and y, which equation correctly expresses w in terms of x and y. Well, in this case, all we got to do then is isolate w, as you can see in all our answer choices. So what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and divide both sides by 2. When we divide this side by 2, we see we have 2 times 7, which is going to equal 14. So we can go ahead and cancel both these 14s. Now we're left with x over y is equal to the square root of w plus 19. So we're going to go ahead and square this side so we can get that w out from underneath that square root. And since we're, double, since we're squaring that side, we also have to square this side. So what we're going to end up with then is going to be x over y squared is equal to w plus 19. To isolate w, we got to subtract 19 from both sides. So we're going to end up with w is equal to x over y, and that's all going to be squared minus 19. If we look at our answer choices, we see that that's going to be answer choice C. So C will be our answer for question 19. Here's something really simple about circles that you need to know for the SAT. Question 20 states point O is the center of a circle. The measure of arc RS on the circle is 100 degrees. What is the measure in degrees of its associated angle RS? Now, what you need to know here is that if you have an, an arc, for example, RS, and you have its associated angle, that associated angle is going to be the same degrees as the arc. So the answer here is just 100. 
And if you wanna see this sort of drawn out, I'll do that really quick. Okay, we have center O and we're drawing R O S. So R to O to S. Okay, we're told that the arc RS is 100 degrees. Well, that means that the angle also has to be 100 degrees. Here's how to quickly solve this difficult SAT math question. Question 21 states the expression, and then I'm not gonna say that, but you can read it, is equivalent to A X to power B, where A and B are positive constants, X is greater than one. What is the value of A plus B? Pay really close attention to here. This is free response. It'd be very easy for someone to answer with the value of A or B or A times B. We need to answer with A plus B. Okay, that being said, let's go ahead and solve. So what I see here is that I'm taking the fifth root and then the eighth root. So I've got a six, and then we've got fifth root of three raised to the power of five, which would leave us with just three, since that's five over five, which is to the power of one. Okay, so I'll just write that as power to one, so you understand that. Next thing we have is x to the 45 over five. Okay, so x to the 45 over five is the same as x to the power of nine. Okay, so we have x to the power of nine. Now we have to multiply that by this root eight times, or root eight, and then two to the power of eight, which is the same as two to the power of eight over eight, or two to the power of one. And then we have to multiply that by x to the power of one over eight. All right, so from here, it's pretty simple. We're gonna take this six times three times two, and six times three gives us 18, 18 times two gives us 36. Now we have 36, okay, so now we have 36. Now the next thing we've got is this x to the power of nine times x to the power of one eight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and convert this nine into something where the denominator is eight as well. So I'll do nine times eight, and that's gonna give us 72. So we'll have x to the power of 72 over eight. And now I can go ahead and add 72 and one to get me x to the power of 73 over eight. Okay, now we know that our value for A is going to be 36. Okay, so A will equal 36. And we know that our value for B is going to equal 73 over eight. So from here, what we have to do is we have to sum these two values together. Now, in order to sum these together, I need to convert this 36 into also being over eight. So I'll go ahead and convert that. So that's gonna be 36 times eight which will give us 288, 288 over eight. So now we have 288 plus 73, 288 plus 73 is gonna leave us with 361 all over eight. So our answer there is 361 divided by eight. Here's how to answer this difficult question about calculating the area of a triangle on the SAT. Question 22 states a right triangle has side lengths of two root two, six root two, and root 80. What is the area of the triangle in square units? Key thing we have to figure out here is what is the hypotenuse out of these three lengths because we know the formula for the area of a triangle is equal to one half the base times the height. So what I notice here is that I've got two root two, six root two. So this is obviously the greater. So we know one of our legs will be that two root two. Now between six root two and root 80, what I know is if I take six and I square, I get 36. Okay, so what I could do is I could rewrite six root two is equal to root 72. And I get root 72 because I take six squared that gives me 36 and then I multiply that by that too, okay? So I know that ultimately this root 80 is what will be high, the hypotenuse, so therefore I know that my base and my height values can be represented then as that two root two and then that six root two, okay? From here it's really easy because we see this two is gonna cancel with this two and we're gonna be left with A is equal to six times root two times root two, which we know will end up equaling six times two, which will equal 12. Okay, so our answer there would be answer choice B. Here's how to solve one of the most difficult questions on the SAT math section. And even though I think this question is kind of pointless and stupid, I'll still show you how to solve it. Question 23 states the expression 4x squared plus bx minus 45, where b is a constant, can be rewritten as hx plus k times x plus j, where h, k, and j are integer constants. Now, if you ever come across on the SAT them saying that something is integer constants, that probably means it's going to be required in order for you to solve the problem. So pay close attention to it. Which of the following must be? an integer. So once again, if they're telling you that something needs to be an integer, pay attention to that always. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by expanding this right here, this hx plus k times x plus j. I'm going to expand it out um, because as you can see, we're going to need to end up getting the values for you know h, uh, k, um, possibly j as well in order to get our answer. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to end up with 4x squared plus bx minus 45 is going to equal, and now we'll go ahead and Expand on this, so we'll have h x squared, h x squared, and then we'll have plus k x, and then we'll also end up with a plus j h x as well. So we're gonna have plus j h x plus k x, and then we'll have a plus k j as well from this k times j. Okay, so from here, let's go ahead and try to simplify this right side. Um, so we'll still have h x squared, but I see I have this common factor of x, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out. So we'll end up with plus x 
times jh plus k and then plus kj. All right, from here, let's start getting what things equal. We see that we're gonna have a negative 45 is equal to the value of k times j. The other thing that we'd see is that we have this, this bx, not necessarily anything we can really do with that at this point. We know that four is going to equal the value of h since we have four x squared and hx squared. So we also know that four would equal the value of h. Uh, from here, this is the point where it really becomes important to pay attention to the fact that h, k, and a j have to be integers. Um, because they have to be integers, I can then state that uh, k must equal negative 45 over j. If we see this, that negative 45 over j, then we know that that's an integer. If we also see that j is equal to negative 45 over k, we know that that would have to be an integer as well. And then obviously if we see you know, the value of just h. So let's go ahead and run through these. We have option a, b over h. Obviously we don't have the value of b, so that's not gonna be our answer, uh, at least you know, not at this point. b, uh, b over k, once again, I'm not really looking for the value of b. Uh, down here, 45 um, over h, we know h is four. 45 over four isn't an integer. Um, it is a decimal, but it's not an integer. Uh, and then we have c, 45 over k. Um, which we know would actually have to be our correct answer here. And I'll go ahead and explain why, right? Like I said, we have J is equal to negative 45 over K. We know that J is an integer. Just because there's a negative doesn't mean that it's not an integer, right? So uh, our answer there would have to be answer choice D because this ultimately has to be um, negative and then 45 over K has to be an integer. Keep in mind that if we have negative three, for example, that's an integer as well. So our answer there would be D and that's how you solve this really difficult SAT math problem. Here's how to efficiently solve this difficult SAT math problem. Question 24 states in the given system of equations, A is a constant. The graph of the equations in the given system intersect at exactly one point. Anytime you're told that a system intersects at exactly one point or exactly two points or that it never intersects, pay close attention to that. And the XY plane, what is the value of X? Always pay close attention to what you're asked to answer with as well. In this case, it is the value of X. Okay. So that means we might not actually have to solve for A. Okay. We just need to solve for the value of X. All right. So immediately what jumps out to me is I have Y equals and Y equals. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute this three X plus A over here for Y. And then I'm going to work to set it all equal to zero. And the reason why I want to set it all equal to zero is because I want to end up using B squared minus 4AC is equal to zero. Because if this value is equal to zero, then that means that we have one real solution. Or in other words, we intersect at exactly one point. So that's ultimately what I'm trying to get uh, in terms of the form. So I want to set it equal to zero. To do that, I'm going to have 2x squared. And then I have this minus 21x, but I also have to subtract 3x from both sides. So once I do that, that's going to end up leaving me with negative 24x. And then I have plus 64, but I also have to subtract a from both sides. So that's going to give me plus 64 minus a. Now what I'm going to do here is I just want to deal with a C value. I don't actually want to deal with 64 minus a. So I'm just going to go plus C and then I'll stay up here. That C is equal to 64 minus a. All right. From here, we know that our B value is negative 24. So we'll have negative 24 squared minus four times our A value, which is two times C. And we know that that's all has to equal zero for there to only be one real solution. Now, negative 24 squared is going to give us 576 when we put it in our calculators. We have 576 minus 8C is equal to zero. We can rewrite this as 576 is equal to 8C by adding 8C to both sides, which therefore means that C is going to have to equal that 576 divided by eight, which is going to equal a value of 72. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and erase the value of C here. I'm gonna put in 72, we'll put in that it equals zero as well. And then I'm gonna erase everything down here. Okay, so from here, we're gonna to look to factor out what we can and solve for the value of X. So I see that two is a common factor in all of these. So I'll factor out a two. I'll be left with X squared minus 12 X plus 36 is equal to zero. From there, I'm looking for numbers that multiply that to get uh, 36, that will have a sum of negative 12. Um, so from there, I'm looking at six as the value for that. So that would be X minus six times X minus six. Okay, now we factor this out. We see that X will have to equal six. So our value uh, for the value of X then would be six. So our answer there would be C. Here's something you need to know about isosceles right triangles for the SAT. Question 25 states an isosceles right triangle has a hypotenuse of length 58 inches. What is the perimeter in inches of this triangle? All right, so let's go ahead and write this out. Anytime you're given a triangle or a circle questions on the SAT, it's usually helpful to write it out. So we're given our hypotenuse. Now keep in mind that since this is an isosceles right triangle, we know that it's a 45, 45, 90 triangle, which has this special property where the side length X will be the same side length since isosceles. And then the value of the hypotenuse would be X times the square root of two. Now this is important because when we have our given hypotenuse of 58 inches, I would elect to rewrite this actually as, and I'll just write that this is equal to 
29 times root 2 times root 2. And you'll see why I'm writing that in a second here. So times root 2 times root 2. Now, the reason I'm choosing to write it like that is because then we know that our values down here would be 29 times root 2, since they just don't have that extra root 2 added on to them. And that, since they're isosceles, they're going to be the same. Now, from here, we want to find the perimeter. So the perimeter is pretty easy to do. We're just going to add in all these side lengths. We'd have 29 times root 2. And we'd actually multiply that by 2, since we'd be adding it to itself. So that's the same as multiplying by two, which is ultimately, um, I'll go over what that will equal out to in a second, but we also have to add on to that then our value of hypotenuse, which we know is 58. Okay. So from here we have 29 root two times two, that's going to end up leaving us with 58 root two plus 58 as a value of our perimeter, which we see is going to be equal to answer choice C. So C will be our correct answer there. Here's how to solve one of the most difficult questions on the SAT. Question 26 states in the X, Y plane, a parabola with vertex nine and negative 14 intersects the X axis at two points. If the equation of the parabola is written in the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are constants, which of the following could be the value of a plus b plus c? Now keep in mind, we always want to pay attention to what we're asked to answer with. In this case, that is the value of a plus b plus c. So we need to know the value of all three values. So first thing we know is our vertex. So if we're given our vertex on a parabola question like this, we're probably looking to use vertex form. Now vertex form would be y is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k, where our vertex is where vertex is h, k. All right, well, we know our vertex, so let's go ahead and substitute in. So we're gonna have y is equal to a x minus nine squared minus 14. Okay, from here, we wanna get these values a, b, and c, which means we need to get into the form of ax squared plus bx plus c. So to do that, let's go ahead and expand this x minus nine squared. So we're gonna get y is equal to a times x squared minus 18 minus 18 x. And then we would have plus 81 minus 14, or that'd be plus 81, um, yeah, plus 81 minus 14. All right, so now from here, we need to distribute this a. So we gotta distribute the a to the x squared to that negative 18 x and to that plus 81. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase what we have here. So we're gonna have y is equal to a x squared minus 18 a x plus 81 a minus 14. All right, so now from here, what I'm gonna look to do is get the values of a, b, and c. So let's start with a. So we know that a is going to equal just a, it is what it is. Now b is going to equal this value of negative 18 a x or negative 18 a since that, that x is included right here. So negative 18 a. Our c value is going to equal 81 a minus 14, so minus 14. All right, so from here, I wanna sum these all together. So a plus b plus c is gonna equal a minus a plus 81a minus 14. Now from here, what we're gonna to look to do is go ahead and combine these a terms. So what we'll have then is a minus 18a, which will give us negative 17a, negative 17a plus 81a will give us positive 64a. So we'll have 64a minus 14. Now, what I'm immediately noticing and that I wanna look at is we have to keep in mind that this intersects the x-axis at two points. Now, because we're intersecting the x-axis at two points, but we know our vertex has a y-coordinate that's below that x-axis, we know that we must open up. So our parabola must look like this, like a smiley face. We must open up to cross that x-axis. Well, that means that the a-value must be positive. So if our a value must be positive, then we're gonna have 64 times some positive number. Let's just pick 0 0.001 just as an example here. Okay, and then we have to subtract 14 from it. So we know that we can't ever get below negative four, we can't even reach negative 14, right? Because this is gonna be some positive number and we're subtracting that negative 14. So we can't get to negative 14, we can't get to negative 19, and we can't get to negative 23. Okay, we would have to have that value be negative 12. That's the only possible value. So our answer has to be D. Here's something you need to watch out for on the SAT. Question 27 states function F is defined by F of X equals negative A to the power of X plus B, where A and B are constants. In the XY plane, the graph of Y equals F of X minus 15 as a Y intercept of zero negative 99 over seven, where the product of, or the product of A and B is 65 over seven. What is the value of A? So a couple things you need to look out for here. Number one, what are you asked to answer with? In this case, it's the value of A. So that's the only thing we should really focus on solving unless there's something we need to solve before in order to get to the value of A. Next thing, we are given that the product of A and B is 65 over seven. So let's go ahead and write that. A times B is equal to 65 over seven. Now, the main thing you need to watch out for in order to avoid getting stuck on this question or getting it wrong is the fact that we have Y is equal to F of X minus 15. If you ever have a transformation like this on the SAT, you really need to pay attention to it because if you don't, you're probably gonna end up getting it wrong. So in this case, we have F of X is equal to negative A to the power of X plus B. Well, we know that Y then must equal a negative A to the power of X 
plus b minus 15. Okay, and that's a really important distinction. Now that we have the value of y, let's go ahead and substitute in our points. So we have this point of x being zero, so that would equal then negative a to the power of zero plus b minus 15 is going to equal that value of negative 99 over seven. So we have negative 99 over seven. Now from here, what we're gonna to look to do is solve for the value of b, and then we can use b in order to get the value of a using this equation up here. So to solve for b, we can go ahead and write this, and I'll try to write it out a little bit bigger up top. So as you can see, we had a to the power of zero and any number to the power of zero is one, so that leaves us with this negative one plus b minus 15. Now from here, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and add one or add seven over seven to both sides. Now once I add seven over seven to both sides, I'm left with negative 92 over seven is equal to b minus 15. I'll do the same thing with that 15. So I'll add uh, 15 times seven over seven to both sides. If I put my calculator here, 15 times seven, that's gonna give me 105. Okay, so if I add 105 over seven to both sides, that's gonna end up leaving me with b is equal to 13 over seven. All right, so now that I have my value of b, I can go back and I can solve for the value of a. Now, how can we do that? Well, if we go ahead and divide both sides by b here, we would get a is equal to 65 over seven times b. Okay, well, we know that the value of b is 13 over seven. So if we go ahead and plug that in for the value of b, 13 over seven, we see that these sevens are gonna cancel and we're gonna be left with 65 divided by 13, which is gonna equal five. So our answer for the value of a, which we're asked to answer with, always check that, is five. Here's how to quickly interpret this line graph. Question one states the line graph shows the estimated number of chipmunks in a state park on April 1 of each year from 1989 to 1999. In our y-axis, we see we have the estimated number of chipmunks. X-axis, we have year. Based on the line graph, in which year was the estimated number of chipmunks in the state park the greatest? What well, we see that the greatest or maximum point is right here, which we see is going to be in the year 1994. So our answer there is B. Here's a tip for unit conversion questions on the SAT. Question two states a fish swim a distance of 5,104 yards. How far did the fish swim in miles? What you're gonna do is you're gonna take your number of yards, 5,104, and we'll use Y to represent yards here. And we wanna multiply in a way that gets rid of the yards. We want our yards on the bottom. So we want that 1,760 yards per one mile with yards on the bottom. Now, as you can see, our yards will cancel and we left with our distance in miles which when we put this into our calculator will give us 2.9 miles. And as you can see, our only unit that is left is miles. Here's how to solve this SAT math question in under 60 seconds. Question three states, which expression is equivalent to 12 X cubed minus five X cubed. Key thing here is since you have X cubed and X cubed, you just do that 12 minus five, that's gonna leave you with seven X cubed and your answer there is gonna be C. Here's a tip for the SAT math section. Question four states, what is the solution X, Y to the given system of equations? If you see that you have five Y equals X, you can go ahead and take this X and you can substitute in that 5y. This will help you solve y, and then afterwards you can solve x. So let's go ahead and do that. 5y plus y will give us 6y is equal to 18. From there, we divide both sides by six, and we'll see that y is equal to three. Now, at this point, we have to go ahead and take, we can actually just take a look at our answer choices and see that our answer has to be a. And the reason our answer has to be a is that's the only answer choice with three as our y value. So as you can see, you don't always have to solve for both x and y. Sometimes you can solve for just one of the variables. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question. Question five states the point eight two in the xy plane is a solution to which of the following systems and equalities? Well, we have our x point of eight and our y point of two. So let's go ahead and check. Well, if we plug in eight for x, we have eight is greater than zero, that's true. Now is two greater than zero, that's also true, so our answer has to be A. Here's something you need to know about absolute value for the SAT math section. If you take a look at question six, it says, what is one possible solution to the given equation? Well, here we have the absolute value of X minus five is equal to 10. So the way that we're gonna set this up is first by doing X minus five is equal to 10. When we do that, we see if we add five to both sides, we'll get X is equal to 15. So one of the possible answers here is 15, but there is another possible answer. When you have absolute value like you do here, another way, or your other answer here would be negative X minus five is equal to 10. From there, you distribute that negative sign to your X and also to your minus five. That's gonna end up giving you negative X plus five is equal to 10. You would subtract five from both sides and you would get negative X is equal to five. And then from there, you would get that X is equal to negative five. So negative five could be your the other answer to this question. Here's how to efficiently solve this SAT math question. Question seven states, the function gives the total number of people on a company retreat with X managers. What is the total number of people on a company retreat with seven managers? Well, in this case, we just plug in seven for X. So we would have F of seven is going to equal seven times seven plus one. Seven times seven is 49, 49 plus one is 50. So our answer there is 50.
Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question by plugging and chugging. Question eight states, which table gives three values of X and their corresponding values of H of X for the given function? All right, so the first thing I'm gonna notice is that all of these have these X's of one, two, and three, so it's gonna be pretty easy to solve this. I'll start by plugging in one for X. If I put in one for X, I have one squared minus three. I know one squared minus three is going to give me a value of negative two. Therefore, I can get rid of A. B is still a possible answer because that is true. C I can get rid of, and then D is also a possible answer because that's true. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna jump to three just because I know it's really easy. Three squared minus three, well, three squared is nine, nine minus three would be six. So I see that I have three and six, which is true. If I look here, three and three isn't true, and three and three isn't true. My answer there has gotta be answer choice B. And the reason, just to point this out really quickly, the reason I chose three is because I saw that two and one here are both the same. Okay, because two and one were the same and B and D and those were the two that I had it narrowed down to, there was no point in checking them. I went ahead and moved on to using the X value of three. Here's something you need to know about when the exponent is zero for the SAT. Question nine states the function F is defined by F of X is equal to 270 times 0.1 to the power of X. What is the value of F of zero? Well, if we plug in zero for X, we have 0.1 raised to the power of zero. Now 0.1 raised to the power of zero is like any number raised to the power of zero. It's going to equal one. Therefore, you're gonna end up with 270 times one, which is just gonna equal 270 and your answer will be answer choice D. Here's something you need to know about margin of error for the SAT. Question 10 states to estimate the proportion of a population that has a certain characteristic, a random sample was selected from the population. Based on the sample, it is estimated the proportion of the population that has the characteristic is 0.49 with an estimated margin of error of 0.04. Based on the estimate and the margin of error, which of the following is the most appropriate conclusion about the proportion of the population that has the characteristics? A couple things I want to point out here. Number one, we are taking a random sample. It's very important we take a random sample because if we don't, we can't apply it to the general population. It has to be a random sample. In this case, it is, so that's perfect. Now, the next thing we need to note is that the estimated proportion of the population that has a characteristic is 0.9 with an associated margin of error of 0.04. So what that means is answer choice A. It's plausible that the proportion is between 0.49 and 0.53. And you get that by adding 0.04 to 0.49 and subtracting 0.04 to 0.49. So our answer there has to be answer choice A. Here's a tip to help you move faster on the SAT. If you encounter a word problem, you see it's more than three lines, try to write out the equation or system of equations or system of inequalities that comes up in the question as you read it on your first read through. That way you don't have to do a second read through when you're done reading the question. So let's go ahead and show an example. A moving truck can tow a trailer if the combined weight of the trailer and boxes is no more than 4,600 pounds. Well, that means that 4,600 pounds must be greater than or equal to the combined weight of the trailer and the boxes. Now, what is the maximum number of boxes this truck can tow in a trailer with a weight of 500 pounds if each box weighs 120 pounds? So we'll use uh, B for the number of boxes. Okay. Now, we have to keep in mind here that we just got to solve for B. So we'll just subtract 500 from both sides. That's going to end up leaving us with 4,100 must be greater than or equal to 120 B. We'll divide both sides by B, or I'm sorry, divide both sides by 120. Okay, 4,100 divided by 120. We can put that in our calculator. When you put that in your calculator, you're going to get 34 repeating. Okay, now keep in mind that B has to be less than that. So the maximum number of boxes would be 34. So our answer is A. This SAT math question is a great example of when it can be a great idea to use Desmos on the digital SAT. Question 12 states, what is the positive solution to the given equation? Well, what I would do here is I would take this and set it equal to zero. So I'd have negative 4x squared minus 7x plus 36 is equal to zero. Now from here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and put it in Desmos. And then I'm going to solve for what the positive solution is by looking at where it equals zeros, or in other words, where it crosses the x-axis. Now keep in mind, we need the positive solution. So the positive solution here we see is 2.25, or in other words, nine over four. So our answer there is gonna be answer choice B. Here's how to quickly answer this probability question on the SAT. Question 13 states, the table summarizes the distribution of color and shape for 100 tiles of equal area. If one of these tiles is selected at random, that's a key component here, what is the probability of selecting a red tile. Express your answer as a decimal or fraction, not as a percent. All right, so ultimately here, we are selecting a red tile. We see the total number of red tiles is 30, and this is out of a total of 100, so that'd be 30 over 100, which we'll calculate out as a decimal of 0.3, so our answer there is 0.3. Here's something you need to know about parallel lines for the SAT math section. Question 14 states, for the given function f, the graph of y equals f of x in the xy plane is parallel to line j. What is the slope of line j? Well, since they're parallel, they have to have the same slope, which means that line j must have a slope of two. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question that deals with proportions and differences. Question 15 states, a proposal for a new library was included on an election ballot. A radio show stated that three times as many people 
voted in favor of the proposal as people who voted against it. So we have three times the number that voted against it, which are represented as an A, is equal to the number who voted in favor of it. Social media post reported that 15,000 more people voted in favor of the bill or of the proposal than voted against it. Okay, so we also know that the number of people who voted in favor is equal to the number who voted against it plus 15,000. Based on these data, how many people voted against the proposal? So in this case, we want to solve for A. Well, we already have what F is equal to, so we can go and substitute in. So we would have F is equal to A plus 15,000, so A plus 15,000. From here, I'll go ahead and isolate A by dividing both sides by three. So I'll have A is equal to A over three plus 15,000 over three, which would simplify down to 5,000. Uh, from there, I'll go ahead and subtract A over three from both sides. A minus, I'll just write this out, A minus A over three is gonna e equal out to two A, so two thirds times A, which is equal, or, which is equal to 5,000 still. Next thing we'll do is we'll multiply both sides by three over two. So we'll multiply both sides by three over two. Okay, keep in mind that 5,000 times three over two will give us 7,500. So we'll have 7,500 then is equal to A. So our answer there is answer choice A. Here's something you need to know about intersecting parallel lines on the SAT. Question 16 states in the figure lines M and N are parallel. If X equals 6K plus 13 and Y equals 8K minus 29, what is the value of Z? So always pay attention to what you're asked to answer with. In this case, that is the value of Z. Well, to calculate the value of Z, we need to know what this angle right here is. Now we know that that angle has to be the same as the value of angle y and the value of angle x. So we can go ahead and just put y uh, as the angle measure there as well. So what we ultimately need to do is we need to get 180, which is the value of this semi arc, right? And we'll take that or that, you know, that angle measure, right? 180. We have to then subtract angle y and that'll give us angle z. So we need to solve for angle y first. Well, in order to solve for angle y, we know that x and y are equal to each other. So we'll set these two together and we'll solve for k and that'll give us the value of angle y. So we have 6k plus 13 is equal to 8k minus 29. Now from here, I'll go ahead and subtract 6k from both sides. Once we do that, we'll be left with 2k on our right side. We'll go ahead and add 29 to both sides. We can start isolating K even further. That's going to leave us with 42 is equal to 2K. We'll divide both sides by two and we'll get that K is equal to uh, 21. So K would equal 21. From there, we can go ahead and solve for the value of Y. All right. So we have K is equal to 21. So we have then the value of, uh, we'll solve for X just because it looks like it's a bit easier. So we'd have the value of X is going to equal six times 21 plus 13. Okay, six times 21 is gonna give us 126. 126 plus 13 is gonna give us 139. Then we have to do 180 minus 139 to get the value of Z, and that's gonna leave us with 41. So our answer there is C. Here's a trick to help you on the SAT math section. Question 17 states in the given equation, P is a constant. The equation has no solution. What is the value of P? In this case, asked to answer with the value of P. Always pay attention to what you're asked to answer with and pay attention to key information. For instance, the equation has no solution. Well, because it has no solution, we know it's set equal to a constant. We also know that we have X and a value that will ultimately be with X. So because of this, if there's any sort of number next to X, then we know that we're going to have at least one solution. So in order for there to be no solutions, we need to get this set equal to zero. So ultimately what we need then is negative three X plus 21 PX to equal zero. Well, in order for that to be the case, we can go ahead and add three X to both sides. We'll get that three X has to equal 21 times P times X. We see our X's will cancel and we'll be left then with three is equal to 21 P. In order to solve for P, we'll divide both sides by 21. We'll see that P is equal to three over 21, which we know is equal to one over seven. So our answer has to be B. Here's a trick you should know about quadratics for the SAT. Question 18 states the function f is defined by the given equation. For what value of x does f of x reach its minimum? Well, if you have a quadratic like this, your value of x at which f of x will reach its minimum or maximum will be the midpoint between the two x-intercepts. We see here our x-intercepts are going to be 10 and negative 13. And the way that we get those is by taking a look at x minus 10, setting that equal to zero, adding 10 to both sides. And then you see x equals 10. Same thing that you'll do for x plus 13. You subtract 13 from both sides when it's set equal to zero and get that x equals negative 13. Now, from here, we're going to take our two x intercepts. We are going to sum them together and then we'll divide by two to get the midpoint of them. And that'll be the value of x where f of x reaches its minimum. In this case, that's going to give us negative three over two. So our answer will be D. Here's a tip that's extremely helpful for the SAT. And that is the vertex form of a quadratic. And I'm going to illustrate this with question 19. The question states the function f of x is equal to one ninth x minus seven squared plus three gives a metal ball's height above the ground f of x in inches x seconds after it started on a moving track, where x must be between 10 and zero 
which are both inclusive. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the vertex of the graph y equals f of x in the xy plane? This question is way easier if you understand what this vertex form is. Well, vertex form at its simplest would be f of x is equal to a, which can be some coefficient, x minus h squared plus k, where your vertex, vertex is going to be h comma k. So as we can see in this case, our vertex would be at seven, for our x value. Okay, so I'll write seven. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just rewrite this. Okay, our vertex would be at seven and three. Okay, so that's gonna be where our vertex is. So understand vertex form is gonna help you a lot. Now, we have to keep in mind that seven is not any sort of height. Seven is just the time since it's that x value. Now, the actual height here is three. Now, the other thing we need to understand is whether this is a function that is opening up or down, and you get that from the a value. Okay, and our a value is positive, which means that our graph is gonna open up like a smiley face. Now, because that's the case, we know that that vertex will be a minimum. It'll be a minimum point or a minimum height. So if we look at our answer choice, we have option A, the metal ball's minimum height was three inches above the ground. We know that that'll be the correct answer because we ultimately have that minimum height at seven, three, three being the number of inches that is above the ground. Here's how to quickly solve this SAT math question about triangles. Question 20 states in triangle JKL, cosine of K is equal to 24 over 51 and angle J is a right angle. What is the value of the cosine of L? Well, with triangles and circles questions, I always recommend to go ahead and just draw them out because it is very helpful to visualize. Okay, in this case, we know that we have a right triangle. We also know that angle J is going to be the right angle. So we can go and put J here and then we'll put KL. Now we're asked for the value of cosine of L. Okay, we know that the cosine is our adjacent over our hypotenuse. All right, so in order to calculate this, we need to know the values of the hypotenuse and the adjacent one. Now we also know that the value of the cosine of K is 24 over 51. Okay, well, if the cosine of K is 24 over 51, we know our hypotenuse is 51. We know that the adjacent side length is 24. So from here, what we'll do is we'll do 51 squared minus 24 squared is equal to LJ, this line, squared. All right, now what we can do then is we'll just take the square root of all this and the square root of LJ squared, and that'll just give us the value of the length LJ. Okay, so once we do that, if we put that in our calculator, that is going to give us a value of 45 for LJ. So we have 45 here now. Now we're asked for the value of cosine of L. So we can go ahead and have the adjacent, which is 45 over our hypotenuse of 51. So 45 over 51, which can be simplified down if we divide both sides by three to 15 over 17, or you could also put it in your calculator. And if you do that, you're gonna get a value of 0.8. Okay, so answers are here and here. And you could also take uh, the value of 0 0.8823, and that would be accepted as well by the SAT. Here's how to solve this SAT math question that deals with an equation that has no real solution. In question 21, it says in the given equation, B is a positive integer. The equation has no real solution what is the greatest possible value of b? So a couple key things here. If you're told that an integer is positive or negative, always pay attention to it. Next thing we know that we have no real solution. So we're asked for what the greatest possible value of b is. What you need to understand here is that for a quadratic to have no real solution, the value of b squared minus 4ac must be less than zero. So from here, let's go ahead and get the values of b, a, and c, and we'll plug them in. So we know that our value of b here is just b, okay? It's just what's in front of the x. So we have b squared then minus four times a. We know our a value is going to be negative one. So I'll just change this to a plus four. And then I have it multiplied by c. Our c value is negative six, seven, six. All right, from here we have four times negative six, seven, six, and that'll give us a value of 2,704. So we're gonna have b squared then minus 2,000, or I'm sorry, yeah, 2,704. Okay, we know that this has to be less than zero. So from here, I'll go ahead and add 2,704 to both sides, and I'll end up with b squared must be less than 2,704. At this point, we take the square root of both sides to isolate b. So once we do that, we're gonna be left with b must be less than 52. Now, keep in mind, your answer for the greatest possible value of B is not 52 because we have to have a B value that is less than 52 and it has to be a positive integer. So the next highest positive integer that is less than 52 is 51, okay? So the maximum possible value of B is 51. Here's how to solve this tricky SAT math question. Question 22 states, if a new graph of three linear equations is created using the system of equations shown and the equation X plus four Y equals 16, how many solutions X, Y will the resulting system of three equations have? Well, let's start by going ahead and plotting this 
third equation. So we see we have x plus 4y equals negative 16. Now I'm going to go ahead and convert that into slope intercept form so it's easier to graph. So what I'll do is I'll start by subtracting x from both sides. That'll give me 4y equals negative x minus 16. From there I'll divide both sides by 4 and that's going to give me y is equal to negative x over 4 or in other words negative 1 quarter x and then I have that much minus 16 over 4 which is equal to minus 4. So I'll go ahead and plot that on this graph. Okay, so I have this minus four and then I'm going up by um, about a quarter per. So I'll just go ahead and go over uh, four and then I go up by one. All right, and if I go ahead and do that, I'll just kind of draw a rough line because we don't need it to be perfect. And as we can see, if we extend these lines, okay, here's where our crossings will be. Now, as you can see, there's not any single point where all three of these lines intersect. Now, there are points where two of the lines intersect, but there is no point where all three intersect at one time. So the answer here is zero. Many people would be tempted to pick something like one or maybe two, but the correct answer is zero because it's about where all three of these lines intersect at a single point and that never happens. Here's something you need to know about the formula for exponential growth on the SAT. Question 23 states the function f gives the value in dollars of a certain piece of equipment after X months of use. If the value of the equipment decreases each year by P percent of its value the previous year, what is the value of P? Now, keep in mind, we're talking about how much it decreases each year. Now, what you wanna take a look at is your growth factor here. Now your growth factor is 0.64, which means we are decreasing in value by one minus 0.64, which is 0.36, or in other words, 36%. So our answer here is C. And one thing I do wanna point out here is that many people might be tempted to take a look at this uh, X over 12 and think that that changes something here, but it doesn't, okay? You were ultimately decreasing each year still by that zero, or by 0.36, right? Since we have this growth rate of 0.64, which means we are decreasing by 36% every year. Here's something you need to know about medians and ranges for the SAT. Question 24 states the dot plot represents 15 values in data set A. Data set B is created by adding 56 to each of the values in data set A, which of the following correctly compares the medians and ranges of data sets A and B. Well, we know that if we add 56 to each of the values in data set A, we ultimately are just going to change these values, but we're not actually going to change the range, or in other words, the distance from the minimum to the maximum. We are just going to change what value the minimum is and what value the maximum is, but not what the range is or the difference between the two. So our range will stay the same. So we can go ahead and write that range is going to stay the same. I'll just represent that as range is equal. Now, the next thing we need to take a look at is the medians. Well, obviously, if we're adding 56 to each of these values, they will ultimately change. For example, 22 plus 56 would then become 78, and then we'd have 79. And then right here, we'd have 80, 81, and 82. So ultimately, obviously, our median then is going to increase significantly. Okay, so our median will increase, but our range will stay the same. Okay, so option A, we have the median of data set B is equal to the median. We know that's not true. Option B, we have the median of data set B is equal. We know that's not true. Option C, the median of data set B is greater than the median of data set A. We know that's true. And the range of data set B is equal to the range of data set, data set A. We know that is true. So our answer is C. Here's why you need to know the equation for a circle on the SAT. Question 25 states the equation X squared plus Y minus one squared equals 49 represents circle A. Circle B is obtained by shifting circle A down two units in the XY plane. Which of the following equations represents circle B. So first I want to show you what the circle equation is. The circle equation would be something like is the circle equation is this x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared where r is your radius, k is the center y value and h is the center x value. So in this case your center would be h k. All right, now that I've shown you the circle equation, let's go ahead and talk about how you can quickly answer this as long as you know the circle equation. Well, all you're doing here is you're just shifting circle A down by two units. So you're not affecting, you're not affecting the X value of the center and you're not affecting the radius. So those need to stay the same. And just on that, you can get rid of A and you can get rid of C. Now, as you can see, the next difference is going to be obviously the K value. Now you have to understand that if you're shifting the circle down by two units, you need to know that that minus K means your center is at K. So if you need your center to move down, then you have to ultimately add two, okay? Because if you wanna move that center down two units, you have to add two because there's that minus sign in front of K, all right? So then what you do is you take this minus one, you add two and you get Y plus one, so your answer there has to be answer choice D. Here's how to solve this very difficult SAT math question about surface area. Question 26 states that two identical rectangular prisms each have a height of 90 centimeters. The base of each prism is a square and the surface area of each prism is K centimeters squared. If the prisms are glued together along a square base, the resulting prism has a surface area of 92 over 47 K centimeters squared. What is the side length in centimeters of each square base? 
All right, well, we know that the surface area of each prism, and keep in mind it says they are identical rectangular prisms, we know the surface area of each is going to be k centimeters squared. So we know the total surface area, if they were kept separate, would be 2k centimeters squared. Okay, we also know that when they are glued together then, the total surface area of everything then becomes 92 over 47k, which is obviously less than 2k, right? So the difference there is what we want to find. So it'd be 2k minus 92 over 47k. Now we know that that's ultimately going to equal two times the area of each of those squares. So that would be two times S squared, where S is going to represent our side length of the square, which is what we want to solve for here. All right, so let's go ahead and get a value for K here, because we're going to need a value of K to then plug into another equation. So as far as what that other equation would be, let's go ahead and find what that is. So we know that we have a height of 90 centimeters on the rectangular prisms, and we know that the side length is going to be S. We'll represent that as S. So we then know that the surface area for the individual rectangular prism will then be represented as 90, which is the height, times our side length, which we're going to represent as S. So in other words, we can write that as 90S times 4, since we have four of those side lengths for each part of that rectangle. Okay, so 4 times 90S, and then we would have that much plus 2S squared, okay, because we also have to account for the square on the top and the bottom of the rectangular prism. And that's all going to equal K. All right, so if we can find the value of K, then we can substitute in. So let's go ahead and do that. 2K minus 92 over 47K will leave us with 2 over 47K. And then from there, we need to solve for K. So we'll multiply both sides by 47 over 2. Now, once we do that, we'll obviously end up with K then is going to equal, we'll have these two cancel out. So we'll have 47S squared. Okay, so let's write that neatly. K is equal to 47S squared. All right, now let's go ahead and substitute in for K. So we have 47S squared. Now I'm going to scroll down so that we can continue writing out this question. So from here, 4 times 90s will give us 360s. We have this plus 2s squared and we have this 47s squared. What I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to start moving everything over to this right side so we can get a steady equal to zero. Now the reason that I want to move everything over to the right side is so that I have a positive coefficient in front of s squared just because that generally makes questions easier. So let's go ahead and do that by subtracting 2s squared from both sides and subtracting 360s from both sides. Once we've done that, we see that zero is going to equal 45s squared minus 360s. From here, we can factor out 5s from uh, both that 45s squared and that negative 360s. So once we do that, we'll have 0 is equal to 5s times 9s minus, it looks like that's going to be 360 divided by 5 will give us 72. So from here, we'll go ahead and set this equal to 0 again. So now we're going to have 0 is equal to 9s minus 72. From here, we'd add 72 to both sides. Once we do that, we're going to have 72 is equal to 9s. We divide both sides by 9. 72 over 9 is going to leave us with 8, and we see that 8 will be our value for s, which we see is going to be answer choice B. So B would be our correct answer here for question number 26. Here's how to answer this difficult SAT math question about percentages. The question states 210 is p percent greater than 30. What is the value of p? Well, we know that we start with the value of 30, and then we want to multiply by 1, because if we don't increase at all, we still need to multiply by 1, plus the percent that we are going to increase by. So that would be p over 100. Now, we know that we ultimately need to equal that to 110. From here, we distribute our 30, which is our initial value, to 1 plus however much greater we are increasing, whatever that percentage is. So that will give us 30 plus 30 over 100, which can be represented as 0 0.3 times p. That's all going to equal 210. From here, we subtract 30 from both sides, and we're going to get that 0.3p is equal to 180. From there, we'll divide both sides by 0 0.3. 180 divided by 0 0.3 is going to leave us with 600 for the value of p. So the value of p is going to be 600. Now, one thing that you really need to pay attention to here is the wording. Okay, The wording is that it is p percent greater than 30. That's really important because you don't know if sometimes they'll say, hey, p is, uh, it's p percent greater than 30. Sometimes they'll say it's p percent of 30. Sometimes they will say uh, it's p percent less than 30. So always pay close attention to the wording um, with percentages questions, because if you don't pay attention to the wording of percentages questions, you're going to get it wrong. It's really, really important. Now what we're going to do is try to get you some practice for the digital SAT reading and writing section. So this will be digital SAT practice test two, module one. What we're going to do is I'll give you about 60 seconds to answer a question. Once that 60 seconds is up, I'll go through how I would approach and answer the question, and then we'll move on to the next question. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start the stopwatch, and you'll have 60 seconds to answer question number one starting now.
Okay, that 60 seconds is now up. So I'll go ahead and go over question one. So if we look at the prompt for this, it's which choice completes the text in the most logical and precise word or phrase. So this is going to be a reading type of question. So what I'm going to do is I'll start by reading through and I'll try to fill in this blank as I go through. So we have, as Mexico's first president from an indigenous community, Benito Juarez became one of the most blank figures in the country's history. Among the many significant accomplishments of his long tenure in office, Juarez consolidated the authority of the national government and advanced the rights of indigenous people. All right, so we have he has many significant accomplishments, so positive connotation, and then we have he advanced the rights of indigenous people. All of this is positive connotation. Okay, so I'd be looking at uh, one of the most um, uh, positive figures in the country's history, something with a positive connotation. So for now, I'll just fill in uh, one of the most, um, we'll just do positive. Okay, ultimately, it's kind of tough to fill that word in there with something because it's pretty broad as far as what it could be. Let's go ahead and take a look at our options. We've got option A, unpredictable. We, we have no indication that it was an unpredictable presidency. Um, if you look at option B, important, okay, important would make sense because we go on and discuss how he had many significant accomplishments and we discuss those accomplishments. If you look at C, secretive, there's nothing indicating that it was secretive. If we look at D, ordinary, there's nothing indicating it was ordinary. In fact, there is um, things that point to it being not ordinary. We state that there were many significant accomplishments of his long tenure in office and he advanced the rights of indigenous people. Really the key part here is that there were many significant accomplishments. So he, we would say that he was one of the most important figures in his country's history. So our answer would have to be B. All right, let's go ahead and move on to question number two. So once again, I'll give you 60 seconds to answer question number two, starting now. All right, so there's your 60 seconds. Now I'll go over question two and how I would approach it. Once again, we have which choice completes the text of most logical and precise word or phrase. So I'll try to fill in this blank before taking a look at the answer choices. We have due to their often strange images, highly experimental syntax, and opaque subject matter, many of John Ashbery's poems can be quite difficult to blank and thus are the object of heated debate among scholars. All right, well, we're stating basically three things, strange images, highly experimental syntax, opaque subject matter, that would make it difficult to understand. Okay, so the poems can be difficult to understand would basically be what I'd be looking to fill in that blank with. If we look at our options, we wouldn't state delegate. Okay, we're not stating that we're delegating any sort of um, work of the writing or the reading anywhere, so that wouldn't make sense. Compose, well, we're not talking about them being composed. Okay, they've already been composed. Okay, they can be difficult to blank and thus are the object of heated debate among scholars. It's not that they can be difficult to compose and are the heated debate among scholars. It'd be that they're difficult to understand. So the compose wouldn't make sense there. If we look at C, interpret, okay, they're difficult to interpret and thus are the object of heated debate among scholars. That would make sense. They're difficult to interpret because there are strange images, highly experimental syntax, and opaque subject matter. If you look at option D, renounce, we wouldn't say it's difficult to renounce them and thus they're object of heated debate among scholars. It's that they're difficult to interpret because of these three things listed at the start. So our answer would have to be C. All right, let's move on to question number three. We have, uh, once again, I'll put 60 seconds on the clock. Okay, starting now.
All right, that 60 seconds is now up. So let's go over question number three. Once again, same prompt. So the way I approach this is try to fill in the blank before taking a look at the answer choices. That way I avoid being swayed between answer choices and also getting stuck between two. Okay, so if you look at question three, the Cambrian exposure gets its name from the sudden appearance and rapid diversification of animal remains in the fossil record about 541 million years ago. During the Cambrian period, some scientists argue that this blank change, in case we need to describe the change in the fossil record, might be because of a shift in many organisms to body types that were more likely to be preserved. Well, we state that it's a sudden appearance and rapid diversification of animal remains in the fossil record. Okay, so rapid diversification, sudden appearance, this is all things that are indicating that this happened all at once. Okay, so we could argue, um, I'm trying to think of a word that would fit all at once, okay? If you are in a situation like this and you don't really know, you know, an exact word to place, it's okay to just have a general idea. Um, obviously, you wouldn't state this all at once change, but if you're kind of stuck as far as a, a exact word to place there, it's okay to just kind of have an idea in your head. And you may not even necessarily need to fill it out, but just at least have an idea in your head. So in this case, looking for something that's just indicating that it's it's all at once. If we look at our options, we have option A, catastrophic. Well, that would have a negative connotation. We're not looking for something with a connotation. We're looking for something that indicate that this is happening all at once. If you look at option B, elusive, elusive wouldn't make sense. Okay, elusive would be more so used to describe something that's sort of hard to hard to reach or hard to, to, to catch, basically. Uh, if you look at abrupt, okay, abrupt would make sense. Abrupt would be a sudden change, okay, so the sudden appearance and rapid diversification of animal remains. So abrupt would make sense. Okay, that would be a really, really good way to fill in that blank. So we can switch that to abrupt. Okay, and then we have option D, imminent. Well, we wouldn't say that it's an imminent change, it would be an abrupt change because it's happening all at once. Okay, so our answer there would have to be answer choice C. All right, let's take a look at question four. Okay, and once again, I will give you 60 seconds to answer question four starting now. Okay, that 60 seconds is now up, so I'll go over question number four. Once again, same prompt, so I'll be looking to fill in this blank. During a 2014 archaeological dig in Spain, Vincent Lowell and his team uncovered the skeleton of a woman from El Algar, an early Bronze Age society buried with valuable objects signaling a high position of power. This finding may persuade researchers who have argued that Bronze Age societies were ruled by men to blank that women may also have held leadership roles. While they're uncovering a skeleton from a woman, um, in an early Bronze Age society who was buried with valuable objects signaling a high position of power. Okay, so these researchers who believe that Bronze Age societies were ruled only by men would have to now acknowledge that women may have also held leadership roles. Okay, so I'd fill in this blank with acknowledge, which is a very large word, so I'm not going to write it in because I can't fit it there, but I'm looking for something that would basically mean acknowledge. We have option A, which is wave. Well, we wouldn't state that they um, would wave that women have also held these leadership roles. Okay, that doesn't fit there. If we look at option B, concede, okay, that would make sense, okay? In order for these men to acknowledge, you have to keep in mind that they argued that Bronze Age societies were ruled by men. Now they would have to acknowledge that women have also held leadership roles. In other words, they would also have to concede that women have also held leadership roles. They have one belief now, and now we have evidence that points to the fact that that belief is not true. And in fact, only part of it is, which is that the belief that men held these leadership roles exclusively, but now we have evidence pointing that women also did. So they have to concede that women also did. Okay, so B looks perfect. If we take a look at C, okay, that wouldn't allow them to refute that women have also held leadership roles because they already believe, um, right now they believe that women did not hold these leadership roles. Okay, now in light of this new evidence, this would not make them refute it. This would make them acknowledge it. So C would be the opposite of what we're looking for. And then we can't require anyone um, if we go ahead and read through the sentence, this finding may persuade researchers who have argued that Bronze Age societies were ruled by men to require that women may have also held leadership roles. You can't require anyone to believe anything, okay? You'd have to have them concede that women may also have held these leadership roles in light of this new evidence. Okay, so our answer there would have to be B. 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look at question five. Okay, once again, I'll give you about 60 seconds and then I will go over the question. So stopwatch starts now. Okay, that's 60 seconds, so now I'll go ahead and go over this question. Okay, so we've got same prompt as we've had before. So we'll start from the top. Within baleen whale species, some individuals develop an accessory spleen, a seemingly functionless formation of splenetic tissue outside the normal spleen. Given the formation's greater prevalence among whales known to make deeper dives, some researchers hypothesize that its role isn't blank. Rather, the accessory spleen may actively support diving mechanisms. Okay, I would fill this in with meaningless. Okay, it's not meaningless. It must serve some sort of function because the whales that dive deeper have, there's a higher prevalence of the spleen there, the accessory spleen. Okay, so it can't be meaningless. It would have to be um, something that actually helps them function. So if you look at our options, we have A, replicable, which wouldn't make sense here. B, predetermined. Okay, it can't be predetermined. If you look at option C, operative. Okay, we have to keep in mind that it is operative, but right here we have isn't, okay, that its role isn't operative. We know that we're making the argument actually that it does have a function, okay, and that it would actually help them operate in terms of diving down deeper, okay? So we would say that it isn't latent, okay? In this context, latent would basically just mean meaningless in this context, okay? So this is a words and context question. Be able to recognize that. In the context here, we'd be stating that this accessory spleen isn't meaningless. It must serve a function because there is a higher prevalence among um, whales that are diving deeper. There's a higher prevalence that they have this accessory spleen. All right, let's go ahead and go down to question number six now. Okay, once again, I'll give you 60 seconds. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start the clock right now. All right, that's 60 seconds, so now I'll go ahead and go over the question. So we've got question number six. Once again, same prompt. So according to a U.S. tax policy expert, state taxes are blank, other factors when considering an interstate move. Even significant differences in state taxation have almost no effect on most people's decisions. So that's key there. Differences in state taxation have almost no effect on people's decisions. Well, differences in employment opportunities, housing availability, and climate are strong influences. All right, so we would state that state taxes are blank other factors when considering an interstate move. We would probably state that are considered less than other factors. So something along the lines of considered less than other factors. So we've got option A, consistent. Well, we wouldn't state it's consistent with other factors. We know that it's considered less than other factors. B, representative of. Well, state taxes aren't representative of climate, housing availability, and employment opportunities. We got to get rid of B. If you look at C, overshadowed by. Okay, well, that would make sense. Considered less than and overshadowed by would make sense in this context because we'd be stating that in both of those, state taxes 
are overshadowed by these other factors, okay? And that's supported in the text when we state that significant differences in state taxation have almost no effect on most people's decisions. Differences in employment opportunities, housing ability, and climate are strong influences. So C looks perfect. We can take a look at a D, irrelevant to. We don't actually make the claim that state taxes are irrelevant to other factors when considering an interstate move, okay? We state that there's almost no effect, but not that it's completely irrelevant. Okay, so the best answer here would be C. The main focus here isn't whether or not state taxes are irrelevant, it's that they're overshadowed by these other considerations. So our answer would have to be C. All right, let's go on to question at number seven. Once again, I'll give you 60 seconds to answer question number seven, starting right now. All right, 60 seconds is up. So now I'll go ahead and go over this question. Okay, so we've got the author's claim, or in this case, we've got, once again, same prompt, which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase. The author's claim about the relationship between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens is blank, as it fails to account for several recent archaeological discoveries. Okay, we would assume then that the claim is um, weak, basically, since it fails to account for several recent archaeological discoveries. To be convincing, his argument would need to address the recent finds of additional hominid fossils, such as the latest then of Denis Sovan specimens and Homo longi. Okay, so I'd say that the uh, relationship or the claim is weak because it fails to account for several recent archaeological discoveries. We've got option A, disorientating. We wouldn't state that the claim is disorienting. Okay, disorienting would be basically like if someone got, you know, um, punched in the face, then, you know, that would obviously be disorientating. Disorienting. Uh, if we look at option B, tenuous. Okay, in this context, tenuous would basically mean weak. So that looks really, really strong. If you look at option C, nuanced, we wouldn't say that the author's claim is nuanced because it fails to account for several recent archaeological discoveries. Because it's failing to account for these discoveries, we would make we would call it weak, not nuanced. So we can get rid of C there. If you look at option D, unoriginal, we will, whether or not it's original or unoriginal um, isn't really affected by whether or not it fails to account for new discoveries. Okay. That is what makes it weak or strong. It'd be strong if it accounts for the new discoveries, and it would be weak if it doesn't. And in this case, it does not. Okay, so our answer would have to be answer choice B. All right, let's move on to question number eight. Once again, I'll give you 60 seconds to answer eight, and then I'll go through it. So let me zoom out a little bit so you can see the entirety of the question. All right, so time starts now. All right, that 60 seconds is now up. So I'll go ahead and go over the question. Okay, so we've got question number eight. Fong, Texas from Georgia, Douglas Johnson's 1922 poem, Benediction. Okay, in this case, we state that our prompt is which choice best states the main purpose of the text. So I'll look to identify the main purpose before taking a look at the answer choices. Let's go ahead and go through. We have go forth, my son, winged by my heart's desire, great reaches yet unknown, await for your possession. I may not, if I would, retrace the way with you. My pilgrimage is through but life is calling you. Okay, so what jumps out to me is this part here, my pilgrimage is through. Okay, obviously, just kind of as a summary here, uh, we have someone basically talking 
to their son saying, hey, go forth, uh, winged by my heart's desire. Okay, so she wants her son to go forth. Um, sounds like explore or adventure, stating my pilgrimage is through. In other words, this person's probably old, possibly on their deathbed or close to um, sort of leaving this earth. Um, and they're stating that life is calling you. So it, really, it kind of seems like a uh, wait for your possessions, basically encouraging their child um, that the world is is up to theirs to go and sort of capture, not necessarily um, a way of conquering, but just in the sense of, you know, you can go and, and make what you want of the world. So obviously we have um, this parent expressing that they want their, their child to go and explore and have adventure in their life is what I would say the main purpose is. We have option A to express hope that a child will have all the same accomplishments as his parent did. Okay. Well, in fact, we actually see it's the opposite. Okay. I may not, if I would retrace the way with you, my pilgrimage is through life is calling you great reaches yet unknown await for your possession. Okay. In this case, we're not stating that, you know, whoever is writing this wants their child to have the same things or the same accomplishments as they did. In fact, they're encouraging them to, to go explore, presumably beyond what the parent um, has already done or has already seen. If we look at option B to suggest that raising a child involves many struggles, we really don't mention any struggles here, so that wouldn't really make sense. If we take a look at C, to warn a child that he will face many challenges throughout his life. Once again, through this, we don't really see any indication of struggle or challenges being mentioned. Okay, so we can get rid of C as well. If we take a look at option D, we have to encourage a child to embrace the experiences life will offer. Okay, and once again, that kind of goes back to that main purpose that I was talking about, where we have a parent encouraging their child to go adventure, to go explore, to go embrace the experiences that life will offer. Will offer. Okay, so D would be perfect there. Okay, so for question nine, I'm gonna go ahead and give you 60 seconds starting now. Okay, that 60 seconds is now up, so I'll go ahead and go over number nine. The following text, or I guess I'll start with the prompt. Okay, so starting with the prompt, we have which choice best describes function of the underlying sentence in the text as a whole. Okay, so I'll take, as I go through this, I'll look to identify uh, the sentence that comes before, what function it serves with the sentence that is underlined, and then also how that connects with the sentence that comes after what's underlined. So the following text is adapted from Indian Boyhood, a 1902 memoir by Ohieza. A Santi Dakota writer in the text of Hieza recalls how women in the tribe harvested maple syrup during his childhood. Now the woman began to test the trees, moving leisurely among them axe in hand and striking a quick blow to see if the sap would appear. The trees like people have their individual characters. Some were ready to yield up their lifeblood while others were more reluctant. Now one of the birchen basins was set under each tree in a hardwood chip driven deep into the cut which the axe had made. From the corners of the chip at first drop by drop, then more freely the sap trickled into the little dishes. All right, so it's basically all about the women sort of harvesting the sap from the trees. Okay, we see that they test the trees to see if the sap would appear. And then after this, we have sort of this representation of lifeblood as the sap. So when we state that some are ready to yield up their lifeblood, we're basically stating that some are ready to give sap while others were more reluctant. Or in other words, some were not ready to give sap. Um, and then we talked about how birch basins are set under each tree, hardwood chip driven in, deep into the cut to which the axe made. So in terms of the function of the underlying sentence here, Basically, it just looks like it's talking about how some of the trees were giving sap, some were not. Okay, so a little bit tough to sort of decipher without taking a look at A through D. So let's go ahead and take a look at A through D now. So we have option A, portrays the range of personality traits displayed by the woman as they work. Okay, that's way off from pretty much everything in the text. Okay, we know that it's really just focused on the fact that um, some of these trees that the women are, are chopping into are giving sap and some are not. If we look at option B, it foregrounds the beneficial relationship between humans and maple trees. Okay, we're not really focused on the beneficial relationship between humans and maple trees, so that doesn't make sense. If we look at C, demonstrates how human behavior can be influenced by the natural environment. It does not demonstrate that. If we take a look at option D, it elaborates on an aspect of the maple trees that the women evaluate. Okay, the aspect being ones, whether or not it's ready to give sap or whether it's not ready to give sap. 
Okay, so that would be one of the aspects that the women evaluate on the maple trees. Okay, so D would be perfect there. Okay, so text one is a little bit cut off, but as you can see, there is, I'm gonna go ahead and start the clock. I'm gonna give you, in this case, I'll give you about 90 seconds to answer this question since it's a bit longer. Okay, that 90 seconds is now up, so I'm gonna go ahead and go over this question. So we have a case where we have text one and text two. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start at the prompt. We have based on the text, how would Berenfeld and colleagues text two most likely respond to the conventional wisdom discussed in text one? So as I read through text one, I wanna identify the conventional wisdom and I'll mark it with a CW for conventional wisdom. Ecologists have long wondered how thousands of microscopic phytoplankton species can live together near ocean surfaces competing for the same resources. According to conventional wisdom, one species should emerge after outcompeting the rest. So I'll mark that CW. So why do so many species remain? Ecologists' many efforts to explain this phenomenon still haven't uncovered a satisfactory explanation. So now we want to know how the authors of text two would respond to that conventional wisdom. Ecologist Michael Berenfeld and colleagues have connected phytoplankton's diversity to their microscopic size. Because these organisms are so tiny, they are spaced relatively far apart from each other in ocean water and moreover experience that water as a relatively, as a relatively dense substance. This in turn makes it hard for them to move around and interact with one another. Therefore, says Berenfeld's team, uh, direct competition among phytoplankton probably happens much less than previously thought. Okay, so we would address the conventional wisdom that species should emer that one species should emerge after outcompeting the rest by stating that they are not in competition with each other as a result of the water density. So we have option A by arguing that it's based on a misconception about phytoplankton species competing with each other. Okay, yes, the misconception being that they actually aren't going to be in competition with each other because of this water density. Okay, we state that direct competition among phytoplankton has, happens much less than previously thought. Or in other words, we could also state that it happens much less than is thought by this conventional wisdom. Okay, so A looks really, really strong. We can take a look at B, C, and D as well. B states by asserting that it fails to recognize that routine replenishment of ocean nutrients prevents competition between phytoplankton species. Well, we're not focused on the routine replenishment of ocean nutrients. Okay, we're focused on actually the, the water density. Okay, so B doesn't really make sense there. If we take a look at C by suggesting that their own findings help clarify how phytoplankton species are able to compete with larger organisms, we're talking about competition uh, between these species. We want one species to emerge, so it's not about competition with larger organisms. We actually also state that they're insulated from competition. Okay, that direct competition probably happens much less than as previously thought. So we want to focus on that aspect. If we look at D, by recommending that more ecologists focus their research on how competition among phytoplankton species is increased with water density. Okay, well, they're not recommending that more ecologists focus their research on this. Okay, so we can get rid of D as well. Okay, so our answer would have to be answer choice A. All right, moving on to question number 11. I'm going to give you guys about 60 seconds for this question.
Okay, that 60 seconds is now up, so I'm gonna go over question number 11. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to my prompt to start. We have according to the text, why would a helicopter built for Earth be unable to fly on Mars? Okay, so a helicopter built for Earth, why can't it fly on Mars? In 2014, Amelia Kwan and her team at NASA set out to build a helicopter capable of flying on Mars. Because Mars' atmosphere is only 1% as dense as Earth's, the air of Mars would not provide enough resistance for the rotating blades of a standard helicopter for the aircraft to stay afloat. Okay, so this is ultimately why a helicopter built for Earth would not be able to fly on Mars. We'll just quickly keep reading to see if there's any more context we need. For five years, Quan's team tested designs in a lab that mimicked Mars' atmospheric conditions. The craft the team ultimately designed can fly on Mars because its blades are longer and rotate faster than those of a helicopter of the same size built on Earth. All right, so as far as why a helicopter built on Earth can't fly on Mars, it's because Mars' atmosphere is only 1% as dense as Earth's, and the air of Mars wouldn't provide enough resistance to the blades. So we've got option A, because Mars and Earth's have different atmospheric conditions. Yes, that's perfect, okay. In particular, because Mars' atmosphere is only 1% as dense as Earth. Okay, we can quickly take a look at B, C, and D as well. Okay, B would state that because the blades of helicopters built for Earth are too large to work on Mars, we know that the helicopter that's built for Mars actually has larger blades than those on Earth, so that would be the opposite. We take a look at C, because the gravity of Mars is much weaker than the gravity on Earth, we never discuss gravity on either planet. If we look at D, because helicopters built for Earth are too small to handle the conditions on Mars, okay, well, that's just not factually correct. Okay, according to the text, and the text is very, very clear on this, it's because Mars and Earth have different atmospheric conditions. All right, let's go ahead and go on to question number 12. Okay, once again, I'm going to give you guys about 60 seconds for this question, okay, starting right now. All right, that 60 seconds is now up, so I'll go ahead and go over question number 12. In West Africa, Jalis have traditionally been keepers of information about family histories and records of important events. They have often served as teachers and advisors, too. New technologies may have changed some aspects of the role today, but Jalis continue to be valued for knowing, protecting their people's histories, okay? And I should have gone to the prompt first, okay? We're looking for the main idea, okay? So I, I should have gone to this prompt first instead of started reading, but we're looking for the main idea. All right, so main idea here, it looks like, is we describe the role of the Jalis, which is... Uh, being keepers of information about family histories and records of important events, serving as teachers and advisors. And then from there, we kind of shift into stating that new technologies have changed some aspects of the role. So if I was to state the main idea, it would be describing what the JLS um, do, what they are, right? Which is there are people who uh, are keepers of information about family histories and records of important events. And I would also then state that uh, new technologies are changing some aspects of the role, but that they're still keeping their main responsibilities the same, okay, and being valued for knowing and protecting families' history. So we have option A, even though there have been some changes in their role, okay, as a, this, as a result of new technology, so that part makes sense. So I'll put a T there for the first part for true. Jails continue to preserve their community's history. Okay, that part's true as well. Okay, so we'll put a check mark by A. We can take a look at B, C, and D. B states, although JLS have many roles, many of them like teaching best, there's no textual support that they like teaching best. C, JLS have been entertaining people within their communities for centuries. Well, we need to keep in mind, we need the main idea of the text. Okay, option C focuses too much on the first half and it doesn't address at all the second half. If we look at option D, technology can now do some of the things JLS used to be responsible for. This is the opposite of C. This is focusing too much on the second half and not enough on the first half. Okay, and there has to be A. Keep in mind, it's the main idea, not just what's the idea of the last half or the first half. All right, let's go on and go on to question number 13. So once again, I'm going to give you 60 seconds for question 13 starting now. And I will zoom out so you can see the rest of this question.
All right, 60 seconds is now up. So I'm going to go ahead and go over question 13. So I start with the prompt, which choice best states the main idea of the text. So I'll try to come up with the main idea before I go through my answer choices. We've got in 1934, physicist Eugene Wigner posited the existence of a crystal consisting entirely of electrons in a honeycomb-like structure. The so-called Wigner crystal remained largely conjecture. However, until Fang Wang and colleagues announced in 2021 they'd captured an image of one. The researchers trapped electrons between two semiconductors and then cooled the apparatus, causing the electrons to settle into a crystalline structure. By inserting an ultra-thin sheet of graphene above the crystal, the researchers obtained an impression, the first visual confirmation of the Wigner crystal. Okay, so all this is basically about confirming that the Wigner crystal exists. Okay, so if you look at option A, researchers have obtained the most definitive evidence to date of the existence of the Wigner crystal. That looks perfect. We can take a look at B, C, and D as well. B states researchers have identified an innovative new method for working with unusual crystalline structures. Okay, this is way too narrow. Okay, for one, I'm not, I don't even need to know whether it's true or not because it's focused way too narrowly on one section of this text and not on the main idea, which is about confirming the existence of the Wigner crystal. If we look at C, graphene is the most important component required to capture an image of the Wigner crystal. Well, graphene, I believe, is only mentioned at the end here, stating that uh, by inserting an ultra thin sheet of graphene above the crystal, the researchers obtain an impression, first visual confirmation of the Wigner crystal. That's way too narrow. Okay, we need the main idea, not a narrow part from one sentence. If you look at D, it's difficult to acquire an image of a Wigner crystal because of the crystal's honeycomb structure. Once again, this is too narrow. Okay, we need to focus on the main idea, not just one or two sentences within the text. So our answer would have to be A. All right, here's question number 14. I'll give you guys, uh, I'll give you guys 90 seconds for this one. Okay, the 90 seconds is now up, so I'm going to go ahead and go over this question. So we're going to start by taking a look at the prompt. So which choice best describes data from the graph that support the researcher's conclusion? So I need to first identify the researcher's conclusion, and then I look for the data in the graph that supports it. So let's start with the text. Considering a large sample of companies, economics expert Maria Guadalupe, Julie Wolf, and Raghuram Rahan assessed the number of managers and leaders from different departments who reported directly to a CEO. According to the researchers, these findings suggest that across the years analyzed, there is a growing interest among CEOs in connecting with more departments and their companies. Okay, so our conclusion is that there's a growing interest among CEOs in connecting with more departments and their companies. So I'm looking specifically at department leaders here, not necessarily managers. Okay, so I'm looking at this black part of these graphs. I see that we are increasing substantially. Um, through, uh, from 1991 to 1995, and then from 1996 to 2001, and then from 2001 to 2008. Okay, and this is the average number of individuals directly reporting to the CEO. We go from about 3.2 or so up to about 6.8. Okay, so pretty much a double. If you look at option A, we have the average number of managers and department leaders reporting directly to the CEO didn't fluctuate from 1991 to 1995 to the 2001 to 2008 period. That's not true according to the data. If we look at B, the average number of managers reporting directly to their CEO was highest in the 1996 to 2001 period. That's not true according to the data. If we look at C, average number of department leaders reporting directly to their CEO was greater than the average number of managers reporting directly to their CEO in each of the three periods studied. We're not concerned with comparing managers to departments. We can get rid of that. If we look at D, average number of department leaders reporting directly to their CEO rose over the three 
periods studied? Yes. Okay. Keep in mind, we need to ultimately support the researcher's conclusion, which is that among CEOs, there's a growing interest in connecting with more departments in their companies. So we're really not concerned with the managers, mostly just the department leaders. So our answer there would have to be D. All right, let's go ahead and move on to question number 15. And I'll zoom back in so you guys can see this a little bit uh, closer. Okay. So for number 15, um, I'll give you guys another um, 90 seconds for number 15. Okay. So start the clock now. Okay, so that's been a minute 30. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over question at number 15. So once again, I'm gonna start with my prompt. Which finding, if true, would most directly undermine Foster's hypothesis? So I need to identify the hypothesis and then we'll look for an answer that undermines it. When digging for clams, their primary food, sea otters damage the roots of eelgrass plants growing on the sea floor. Near Vancouver Island in Canada, the otter population is large and well-established, yet the eelgrass meadows are healthier than those found elsewhere off Canada's coast. To explain this, conservation scientists Aaron Foster and colleagues compared the Vancouver Island meadows to meadows where otters are absent or were reintroduced only recently. Finding that the Vancouver Island meadows have a more diverse gene pool than the others do, Foster hypothesized, so now we have the hypothesis, I'll mark that with an H, that damage to eelgrass roots increased the plant's rate of sexual reproduction. This in turn boosts genetic diversity, which benefits the meadow's health overall. Okay, so we need something that undermines that hypothesis. We have option A. At some sites in the study, eelgrass meadows are found near otter populations that are small and have only recently been introduced. Okay, so we have eelgrass meadows are found near otter populations that are small and have only recently been reintroduced. That's not undermining the hypothesis. Okay, so we can get rid of A. We take a look at B. At several sites not included in the, in the study, there are large, well-established sea otter populations, but no eelgrass meadows. Okay, well, this is not going to undermine the hypothesis. This also really wouldn't confirm the hypothesis either. Okay, this is just neutral, so we can get rid of it. If we look at C, at several sites not included in the study, eelgrass meadows health correlates negatively with the length of residence and the size of sea otter populations. Well, we know that our hypothesis would be that as the otter populations would increase, that would create more damage to the eelgrass roots which would increase the plant's rate of sexual reproduction, which would boost genetic diversity and boost the meadow's health. So if the meadow's health is correlating negatively with their length of residence on the side of otters, that goes directly against the hypothesis and would undermine or weaken the hypothesis. So C is perfect there. We can take a look at D as well. At some sites in the study, the health of plants unrelated to eelgrass correlates negatively with the length of residence and size of otter populations. Okay, so health of plants unrelated to eelgrass. This is the key part. It's the plants that are unrelated to the eelgrass. Our hypothesis is specific to the eelgrass. So talking about the health of plants that are unrelated really isn't going to undermine the hypothesis. So our answer would have to be answer choice C. All right, question 16. I'm going to give you guys 60 seconds starting now.
Uh, that 60 seconds is now up, so I'll go over number 16. We have which choice most logically completes the text as our prompt. So I'll take a quick look at the sentence. Thus, those who primarily view Zelda as an inspiration of F. Scott's writings, and then something that comes after. So scholars have noted that F. Scott Fitzgerald's writings were likely influenced in part by his marriage to Zelda Fitzgerald, but many don't recognize Zelda as a writer in her own right. Indeed, Zelda authored several works herself, such as the novel Save Me the Waltz and numerous short stories. Thus, okay, so this is basically a transition word kind of indicating that because of what came before, thus what came after. So what came before is Zelda basically being her own writer. So not just someone who influenced her husband's work, but uh, had writings in her own right. Okay, so... Thus, those who primarily view Zelda as an inspiration for F. Scott Fitzgerald's writings, I'm guessing what comes after would be something stating basically that they're missing the, the um, sort of incredible writings that she had herself. So with option A, overlook the many other factors that motivated F. Scott to write. Okay, once again, that's not really in line with thus as the transition here. Okay, because we're using thus there, we need to focus on what came before it, okay, which is the fact that she was a writer herself. So not overlooking the other factors that motivated F. Scott. If we look at B, risk misrepresenting the full range of Zelda's contributions to literature. Okay, those contributions would be the works that she wrote herself, which we actually discussed in that previous sentence. Okay, so B looks super strong. We can take a look at C and D as well. C may draw inaccurate conclusions about how F. Scott and Zelda viewed each other's works. Okay, that's really never discussed in the text. If we look at D, tended to read the works of F. Scott and Zelda in an overly autobiographical light. That one's just a pretty random answer choice. Okay, our answer there would have to be answer choice B. All right, I'm gonna give you guys 90 seconds to answer question at number 17, which is on the left side of the screen. Okay, that 90 seconds is now up, so I'm going to go over this question. We have, which choice most logically completes the text? So I'm going to take a quick look at the sentence that we'd be completing. They have, they found that tortoise hatchlings showed a significant preference for the image, suggesting that what? Okay, so the tortoise hatchlings show significant preference for an image. Among social animals that care for their young, such as chickens, monkeys, and humans, newborns appear to show an innate attraction to faces and face-like stimuli. Elizabetta Versace and her colleagues used an image of three black dots arranged in the shape of eyes and a nose or mouth to test whether this trait also occurs in testudo tortoises, which live alone and do not engage in parental care. This is a contrast from social animals that care for their young, so that would be parental care up there. All right, so we've got which live alone, do not engage in parental care. They found that tortoise hatchlings showed a significant preference for the image, suggesting, suggesting what? Well, we have that the animals that have parental care and that are social animals, they also showed this innate attraction to the faces and face-like stimuli, and so do these ones that don't have parental care. So this attraction does not um, depend on parental care or not is basically what I'd be looking for. If you look at option A, face-like stimuli are likely perceived as harmless by newborns of social species that practice parental care, but is threatening by newborns of solitary species without, without parental care. Well, we see that it's not threatening. Okay, so this is really just an incorrect interpretation of what was stated. Okay, we know that it's actually stated that it is, they are perceived as non-threatening. Okay, they actually um, like them, right? It states that if we go up, uh, 
whether this trait they found towards hatchling showed a significant preference for the image. Okay, so obviously not threatening. If we take a look at B, researchers should not assume that an innate attraction to face-like stimuli is necessarily an adaptation related to social interaction or parental care. Okay, yes, we should not assume that it's dependent upon social interaction or parental care because we have these, these tortoises which do not have this parental care or social interaction. They also have this innate attraction. So it does not depend on social interaction or parental care. Let's take a look at C and D as well. C states researchers can assume that the attraction to face-like stimuli that is seen in social species that practice parental care is learned rather than innate. We can't assume it's learned because those that don't receive parental care also have this innately. If you look at D, newly hatched T tortoises show a stronger preference for face-like stimuli than adult tortoises do. Well, there's just, that's not discussed at all, okay? So that's very, very random. Okay, so our answer would have to be answer choice B. All right, question 18, I'm gonna give you 60 seconds for starting now. Anyone who wants to take another 30 seconds here, go ahead and do that. This is a bit of a longer question. All right, let's go ahead and go over question number 18 now. So I ended up giving you guys another about 30, 35 seconds because this is a little bit of a longer question. So let's go over, over it. Okay, so we have which choice most logically completes the text. If we take a look at this last sentence, we have thus some scholars have concluded what? Okay, so we need to figure out what the conclusion would be from this text. Compiled in the late 1500s, largely through the efforts of indigenous scribes, Contreras Mexicanos is the most important collection of Poetry and classical Nahuatl, the principal language of the Aztec Empire. The poems portray Aztec society before the occupation of the empire by the army of Spain, and marginal notes in Contreras Mexicanos indicate that much of the collection's content predates the initial invasion. Nonetheless, some of the poems contain inarguable references to beliefs and customs common in Spain during this era. Thus, some scholars have concluded what? Right, we know that most of the poems, or the bulk of it, is sort of predates um, the invasion of the army of Spain. Okay, but still there are some pieces of, if we go up, marginal notes indicate that um, much of the collection predates the initial evasion. Some of the poems contain an arguable references to beliefs and customs common in Spain during this era. Okay, so we're ultimately suggesting that there must have been something that was most likely added after this evasion to um, this, this book or this collection of poetry. So we have option A, while its content largely predates the invasion, which is true according to the text, Contreras Mexicanos also contains editions made after the invasion. That would make sense since there are inarguable references to beliefs and customs common in Spain during this era. Okay, so that looks true as well. So A looks super strong. We take a look at B, C, and D as well. B states, although those, those who compiled Contreras Mexicanos were fluent in Nahuatl, they had limited knowledge of the Spanish language. Okay, that's not what we would conclude based on this text. We take a look at C. Before the invasion by Spain, the poets of the Aztec Empire borrowed from the literary traditions of other societies. Okay, there's really no support for this anywhere. Okay, ultimately, we know that it states that um, the poems portray Aztec society before the occupation of the empire by the army of Spain. The marginal notes indicate much of the collection's content predates the initial invasion. Okay, there's no, nothing suggesting that the poets of the Aztec empire borrowed from literary traditions of other societies. There's nothing suggesting that they even have access to literary traditions from other societies. We look at D, the references to beliefs and customs in Spain should be attributed to a coincidental resemblance between the societies of Spain and the Aztec empire. Okay, there's nothing to really support that either, okay, because if we go up, it states that much of the collection's content predates the initial invasion. Nonetheless, some of the poems contain arguable references to beliefs and customs 
in common and customs common in Spain during this era. Okay. The key part here is much of the collections content predates the initial invasion. Okay. That would suggest that there is some of it that came after the invasion, or in other words, was added on later as we see in answer choice A. Okay. So it's not strictly that all the content was pre-invasion. It states much of it was pre-invasion, but not all of it. Okay. So our answer would have to be A. All right. For number 19, I'm going to give you guys 60 seconds starting now. All right, let's go ahead and go over question number 19. Okay, so I'm going to start with the prompt, which choice most logically completes the text. Okay, we have the results of the study, therefore. Okay, so I want to know what the results of the study are and what they're pointing to as some sort of conclusion here. So we have in a study of the cognitive abilities of white-faced monkeys, uh, Cebus and Mator, researchers neglected to control for the physical difficulty of the tasks they used to evaluate the monkeys. The cognitive abilities of monkeys given problems requiring literal, little dexterity, such as sliding a panel to retrieve food, were judged by the same criteria as were those of monkeys given physically demanding problems, such as unscrewing a bottle and inserting a straw. Okay, so ultimately we have a problem with the study, okay? It's that they, the researchers neglected to control for the physical difficulty of the tasks they used to evaluate the monkeys. Basically, this means all of the data is pretty much thrown out the window. Okay, when you fail to control for the physical difficulty on these tasks, you're not going to get any sort of accurate study on the cognitive abilities of Cebus and Matur. So basically, the results of the study are that it's really messed up. So if we take a look at option A, uh, it could suggest that there are differences in cognitive ability among the monkeys, even though such differences may not actually exist. Okay, that'd be perfect. Okay, because we may see that there, you know, shows up in the data that there's some difference in cognitive ability, specifically because some of these tasks are much easier than others, and that's not being controlled for. Okay, so A is absolutely perfect. We can take a look at B, C, and D as well. B states are useful for identifying tasks that the monkeys lack the cognitive capacity to perform, but not for identifying tasks that the monkeys can perform. Well, we actually would be able to use it for identifying tasks that the monkeys um, can perform, because obviously we do still have uh, the data on that. Okay, we do know which tasks they are able to perform because we do have that data. So we wouldn't say that it's not useful for that. So we can get rid of B. If we take a look at C, and also just keep in mind that if you have a question like this, you really need to be looking for, you know, what's the biggest takeaway? Okay, so the biggest takeaway here is that because we failed to control, um, therefore we may have false conclusions that could arise in the data or false, you know, evidence. Okay, so if we take a look at C, should not be taken as indicative of the cognitive abilities of any monkeys, monkey species other than C and mature. Well, it shouldn't even be indicative of the cognitive abilities of C and mature because, once again, that data is not going to allow us to make any conclusions because we didn't control for the physical di difficulty of the tasks. If we look at D, reveal more about the monkey's cognitive abilities when solving artificial problems than problems in the wild. Well, it's not even revealing really anything about solving artificial problems because, once again, we did not control for the different difficulty of the tasks. Okay, so our answer there would have to be in choice A. All right, so we've now made it to the writing questions. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and give you 45 seconds to answer question number 20. All right, that 45 seconds is up, so now I'm going to go ahead and go over question 20. 
So I'm going to take a look at the prompt. We have which choice completes text or conforms to conventions of standard English. If we look at our options, we've got enter, to enter, having entered, and entering. Okay, so off the bat, to me, this is looking like a question where it's going to be a non-finite versus finite verb choice. So if we take a look, we have to survive when water is scarce, embryos inside, African turquoise, killfish, eggs. Keep in mind that inside is a preposition, so we can get rid of this prepositional phrase. We know our subject will be embryos. So if embryos blank, a dormant state known as diapause. Okay, our options are of to enter. Well, to enter would be a non-finite infinitive. Okay, so we can get rid of B. We need to have a finite verb in order to have a complete sentence. Okay, so we need a verb that is doing the action of the embryos. Okay, so embryos enter a dormant state known as diapause. We'll have to be our answer here. I'll touch on C and D as well here. Okay, C and D are both non-finite participles. Okay, we need a finite verb in order to have a complete sentence. So our answer has to be A. All right, let's go ahead and move on to question number 20. One. Okay, for question number 21, I'm going to give you guys about 45 seconds as well, starting right now. Okay, that 45 seconds is now up. So we have which choice completes the text or conforms to conventions of standard English. If I look at my options here, I've got has doubled, had doubled, doubles, and will double. So I'm looking basically at what tense I'm in. So let's go ahead and go through, paying attention to our tense formed in 1967. So already we're starting off in the past tense to foster political and economic stability within the Asia Pacific region. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations was originally made up of five members. Once again, we have was originally. Okay, so dealing in the past tense. We have Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. By the end of the 1990s, the organization blank its initial membership. So we have option of has doubled. Okay, well, has doubled does not indicate that this has already happened in the past and that it has finished. So we can get rid of A. If we look at B, we have the past perfect of had doubled, okay, which would indicate that this has happened in the past. By the end of the 1990s, the organization had doubled its membership. Okay, so it's happened in the past and it is done and over. If we look at option C, doubles, that's present tense. And then we have option D, will double, which is future tense. Okay, we know that we are dealing in the past tense. This has already happened. Okay, by the end of the 1990s, the organization had doubled its initial membership. So our answer would have to be B. Okay, for question number 22, I'm going to give you 45 seconds starting now. Okay, that 45 seconds is now up, so let's go over number 22. So I take a look at my prompt. We've got the standard prompt of which choice completes the text so it conforms to conventions of standard English. In this case, if I take a look at my answer choices, I've got differences in punctuation, so I'll probably be looking at figuring out what's an independent clause, what's a dependent clause, if I have any phrases. Okay, so let's go ahead and read through. We've got the intense pressure found in the deep ocean can affect the structure of proteins and fish cells, distorting the protein's shape. The chemical trimethylene and oxide TMAO counters this effect ensuring that proteins retain their original configurations. Okay, so that's an independent clause prior to any sort of punctuation. So basically right there, we get an independent clause. Next we have TMAO is found in high concentrations in the cells of the deepest dwelling fish. Well, that's also an independent clause. Okay, so connecting them with a period is fine. If we look at our other options, we have no punctuation, which isn't okay. We need to have something connecting these two independent clauses. We can't only use a comma without one of the fanboys, so we can get rid of C. If we look at D, we have and, but we don't have a comma, so our answer there has to be A to connect these two independent clauses. All right, for question number 23, I'm going to give you 45 seconds starting now.
All right, that 45 seconds is now up, so I'll go over question 23. Once again, we have the prompt, which choice completes text for conforms and conventions of standard English. If I look at my options, I've got experience, had experience, experiences, and will be experiencing. So it looks like I'm dealing with tense, so that's what I'll be looking for as I read through. Food and the sensation of taste are central to Monique Truong's novels. In the Book of Salt, for example, the exiled character of Ben connects to his native Saigon through the food he prepares. While in The Bitter and the Month, the character of Linda, blank, a form of synesthesia, whereby the words she hears evoke taste. All right, so I'm looking at parallelism here. I've got exiled character of Ben connects, is the verb there, to his native Saigon through the food he prepares, so dealing in the present tense. Well, in bitter in the month, in bitter in the mouth, the character of Linda, we also need to have present tense here as well, a form of synesthesia, whereby the words she hears evokes taste. Okay, so I'm looking for present tense. So I'm going to get rid of A and B. I can also get rid of D. Okay, my answer would have to be C. We need to maintain that present tense parallelism. All right, moving on to question number 24. I'm going to give you guys 45 seconds for this question as well, starting right now. All right, that's 45 seconds right there. So let's go and go over question 24. Inventor, or we'll start with the prompt, which choice completes text so it conforms to conventions of standard English. I look at my options. We look for the differences. Differences are in threads, whether or not it's possessive. Now, keep in mind, these all have a period at the end of them. Okay, so it's not going to end up being possessive. So just based on that, I can get rid of A and D. And then if I look at the differences, it's do we have multiple screws or do we have only one screw? Okay, and it's the screws thread. So it is possessive. We just need to know how many screws we have. So we have inventor John Friedman created a prototype of the first flexible straw by inserting a screw, so singular screw, into a paper straw and using dental floss, binding the straw tightly around the screw's threads. And then when the floss and screw were removed, once again, singular screw, the resulting corrugations in the paper allowed the straw to bend easily over the edge. All right, so we know there's only one screw, okay? So we can't have screws with an S and then an apostrophe. It would just be screw, apostrophe, S, threads, okay? And threads obviously can't own anything since there's a period right after it. So our answer there would have to be C. All right, I'm gonna give you 45 seconds for question 25 starting now. All right, time's up, so let's go and go over question 25. So we've got which choice completes text what conforms to conventions of standard English, and then we've got differences in punctuation and possibly having and after materialism. So in her analysis of Edith Wharton's House of Mirth, 1905, scholar Candace Wade observes that the novel depicts the upper classes of New York society as consumed by, by the appetite of a soulless materialism. Okay, so that we start out with an independent clause up to materialism. Then we have an apt assessment given that the House of Mirth is set during the Gilded Age, a period marked by the rapid industrialization, economic greed, and widening wealth disparities. Okay, well, an apt assessment is ultimately a supplementary noun phrase that's describing okay, the, this part right here, basically the, the observation, right? Scholar Candace Wade observes the novel depicts the upper classes of New York society as consumed by the appetite of a soulless materialism, an apt assessment, okay, which is referring back to the assessment that is made by Candace Wade. Okay, so we have a supplementary noun phrase. We can't connect that with a semicolon, so we can get rid of A. We can't connect it with just an and, okay, we would use a comma, okay, we would connect that supplementary noun phrase with a comma. Okay, we do need to have some sort of punctuation, so our answer there has to be C. We connect that supplementary noun phrase to the main clause using a comma. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and give you guys 45 seconds for 
question number 26, starting right now. Okay, 45 seconds is now up, so I'm going to go over question 26. Once again, we have to conform to conventions of standard English. I see we have pray and rather with some different punctuation. One thing that I'd be looking for anytime I have a transition word next to where I might be ending or starting an independent clause is do I need that transition word to be within the first clause or within the second clause? Um, so in this case, we'll be looking for rather. Okay, so whether we have a contrast in the first clause or the second clause. Next thing we need to look at is punctuation. Okay, so do we need a semicolon basically, because we have semicolon here and here versus no semicolon in A and B. Let's go ahead and read through. To humans, it does not appear that the golden orb weaver spider uses camouflage to capture its prey. All right, so that's an independent clause and we're not contrasting anything within that independent clause to anything that came before or anything like that. So we wouldn't want to put rather within that independent clause. So looking at the differences between C and D here, we can go ahead and get rid of C because we don't want rather to be within this same independent clause. Now let's read on and see if we have another independent clause after this. We have the brightly colored, we have the brightly colored arachnid seems to wait conspicuously in the center of its large circular web for insects to approach. So that is another independent clause. Okay, now keep in mind that that's a contrast to what came before, okay? Because we have to humans, it doesn't appear the gold orb weave, weaver spider uses camouflage to capture its prey. And then we have rather the brightly colored arachnid seems to wait conspicuously in the center of its large circular web for insects to approach. Okay, so we do have a contrast, okay? And this contrast begins in the second independent clause. So since we do have independent clauses, we can't just connect them with commas. Okay, so our answer there would have to be D. We want that transition after the semicolon. We do need to use a semicolon here to separate these independent clauses. Okay, I'm gonna give you 45 seconds to answer question number 27, starting now. Okay, that 45 seconds is now up. So let's go ahead and go over question 27. So in terms of our prompt, we have which choice completes the text or conforms to conventions of standard English. If I look at my options, I'm looking at do we have possession from playas to sediment? And also is playas singular or plural? And then the next difference is does rocks own mysterious migration? Okay, and also how many rocks are there? So let's go ahead and look through 27. In Death Valley's National Parks racetrack playa, so playa singular, and because ply is singular, I can actually go ahead and get rid of D and A. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay, so now we're between B and C. Difference being is rocks possessive. Okay, so let's read on. We have in a flat, dry lake bed are 162 rocks, some weighing less than a pound, but others almost 700 pounds that move periodically from place to place, seemingly of their own volition. Race track like trails in the rocks. Uh, race track like trails in the rocks mysterious or in the playa's sediment mark the rocks mysterious migration okay so it's the rocks mysterious migration so it is possessive so we can get rid of answer choice b and our answer would have to be answer choice c okay i'm gonna give you guys 45 seconds now to answer question number 28 starting now
Okay, time is up. Let's go ahead and go over question number 28. So once again, for our prompt, we need to conform to the conventions of standard English. If we look at our options, we've got gingerbread and then different forms of punctuation, and then option C with no punctuation. So let's go ahead and read through. In crafting her fantasy fiction, Nigerian-born British author Helen Oyenmeni has drawn inspirations from the classic 19th century fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. Her 2014 novel, Boy Snow Bird, for instance, is a complex retelling of the story of Snow White, while her 2019 novel, Gingerbread, offers a delicious twist on the classic tale of Hansel and Gretel. Yeah, there's no need for any punctuation here. Okay, ultimately we have our subject, her 2019 novel, Gingerbread, and then we have our verb offers. So when you have your subject right next to your verb, there's no need to have punctuation between them. Okay, so options A, B, and D are all just trying to mess with you. You don't need any punctuation there. You're just having your subject, and then the verb follows immediately after. You don't need punctuation. Answer there is going to be C. Okay, I'm going to give you guys 70 seconds for question number 29. Okay, time is up. Let's go and go over at number 29. So the way I would approach this is take a look at my prompt. In this case, we have the student wants to explain an advantage of the microbes. So as I read through the notes, I want to look for what the advantage is of the microbes. We're researching a topic of students taking the following notes. NASA uses rovers, large remote vehicles with wheels to explore the surface of Mars. Na NASA's rovers can't explore regions inaccessible to wheeled vehicles. Rovers are also heavy, making them difficult to land on the planet's surface. Microbes, robotic probes that weigh as little as 50 milligrams, can be deployed virtually anywhere on the surface of Mars. Okay, so an advantage would be they can be deployed almost anywhere on the surface of Mars compared to rovers, which cannot, because there are areas that are inaccessible to wheeled vehicles. Micro probes have been proposed as an alternative to rovers. Okay, so we need to explain an advantage. We have option A, despite being heavy, rovers can't land successfully on the surface of Mars. We, that's not explaining an advantage of microprobes. Option B, microprobes, which weigh as little as 50 milligrams, could explore areas of Mars that are inaccessible to NASA's heavy-wheeled rovers. Yes, that is explaining an advantage of the microbes. We can go in microprobes. We can go ahead and take a look at C and D. We've got NASA currently uses its rovers on Mars, but microprobes have been a a proposed alternative. Once again, that's not explaining an advantage of the microprobes. And then D, though they are different sizes, both microprobes and rovers can be used to explore the surface of Mars. That's not expressing an advantage of the microprobes. Okay, so our answer there would have to be B. Okay, I'm going to give you guys uh, 25 seconds. Or I'm not, tw sorry, not 25. I'm going to give you guys 60 seconds for question number 30, starting now. Okay, 60 seconds is now up. Let's go and go over question number 30. So I'm going to take a look at my prompt. A student wants to introduce Paradise to an audience unfamiliar with the novel and its author. 
Okay, key part here is audience unfamiliar with the novel and its author, so I'll need to introduce uh, both the novel and the author. So we've got, uh, which well, research on topics students make the following notes. Uh, a. G. was awarded the 2021 Nobel Prize in Literature. G. was born in Zanzibar in East Africa and currently lives in the United Kingdom. Many readers have singled out G's 1994 book, Paradise for Praise. Paradise is a historical novel about events that occurred in colonial East Africa. Option A. A. G. who wrote Paradise and later was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature was born in Zanzibar in East Africa and currently lives in the United Kingdom. That doesn't really introduce paradise. We can get rid of A. If we take a look at B, many readers have singled out AG's 1994 book, Paradise, a historical novel about colonial East Africa for praise. That doesn't introduce AG, so we can get rid of B. If we look at C, a much praised historical novel about colonial East Africa, Paradise was written by AG, winner of the 2021 Nobel Prize in Literature. So we introduce G with or AG with this right here. And then we also introduce the book by saying that it's about colonial East Africa and that it's received much praise and it's a historical novel. So in this case, we're introducing them both. If we take a look at D, we have Paradise is a historical novel that occurred in colonial East Africa, AG's homeland. That's not introducing who AG is. So our answer there would have to be answer choice C. All right, now for question number 31, I'm going to give you guys 60 seconds starting right now. All right, that's 60 seconds is now up. So let's go and go over question number 31. So I'm gonna take a look at my prompt, which choice most effectively uses information from the given sentences to emphasize the relative sizes of the two capitals population. So key thing here, we wanna emphasize the relative sizes of the capital's population. So we've got Ulaanbaatar is the capital of Mongolia. The city's population is 907,000. It contains 32% of Mongolia's population. Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam. Its population is about 8 million. Um, and it contains 8.14% of Vietnam's population. We have option A, Mongolia's capital is Ulaanbaatar, which has 900,000 people, and Vietnam's capital is Hanoi, which has about 8 million people. So the problem with this is it doesn't emphasize the relative sizes of the two capitals' populations. Keep in mind the relative sizes are this 8% of Vietnam's population and that 32% of Mongolia's population. We take a look at B, the populations of the capitals of Mongolia and Vietnam are 900,000 and 8 million respectively. Once again, that does not talk about the relative sizes. If we take a look at C, even though Hanoi population about 8 million is larger than Ulaanbaatar population about 900,000, Ulaanbaatar's accounts form more of its country's population. So this does talk about the relative size. If we take a look according to the data, is Ulaanbaatar account for more of its country's population relatively? Yes, it does. So that looks factually correct as well. If we take a look at D, comparing Vietnam and Mongolia, 8 million is 8.14% uh, of Vietnam's population. And um, okay, this isn't even talking about the capitals. This is just stating these numbers, which it's meaningless without talking about the capitals because in our prompt, we state that we want to emphasize the relative sizes of the two capitals populations. We want to mention that it's the capitals populations given in D, which we don't. So our answer there would have to be answer choice C. All right, let's go ahead and move on to question number 32. Okay, for this question, I will give you guys 60 seconds as well, starting right now.
All right, 60 seconds is now up. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this question. So we're gonna start with the prompt. A student wants to explain how the house of wisdom preserved the world's knowledge. Okay, so as we go through, we wanna focus on how the house of wisdom preserved the world's knowledge. So specifically methods, if we can see any. We've got one of the histories, one of history's greatest libraries with the house of wisdom in Baghdad, Iraq. It was founded in the eighth century with the goal of preserving all the world's knowledge. Scholars at the house of wisdom collected ancient and contemporary texts from Greece, India, and elsewhere and translated them into Arabic. Okay, so this would be how. Writings included those of Greek philosopher Aristotle and the Indian mathematician Aribata. The House of Wisdom used Chinese paper making technology to create paper versions to be studied and shared. So this would also be discussing how. So these two are, are how they did it. We've got option A. House of Wisdom was known for bringing together knowledge from around the world, including from Greece, India, and China. Okay, what they're known for isn't explaining how they did it. So we can get rid of A. If we look at B, founded in Iraq in the eighth century, the House of Wisdom employed many scholars as translators. Okay, that's also not telling us how they did it. It's telling us what they did, employing people as translators, but it's not telling us how they actually preserved the world's knowledge. Okay, keep in mind we need to explain how they preserved the world's knowledge. Always pay attention to that prompt. For Look at C. Writings from the Greek philosopher Aristotle and the Indian mathematician Aryabhata were preserved at the House of Wisdom. Once again, that does not explain how they're preserving the world's knowledge. If you look at D, the House of Wisdom collected writings from different countries and created paper versions in Arabic to be studied and share. That is explaining how they are preserving the world's knowledge. So the answer would have to be D. Okay, now we've got our last question, question number 33. I'm gonna to have to uh, scroll down. It looks like, um, I'm just gonna scroll down. I'll cut off a little bit on the top, but it's just the generic part, so it's okay. Okay, so here I'm gonna give you guys 60 seconds to answer this question as well, starting right now. This one's a little bit long, so I decided to give you guys 70 seconds instead of 60. Uh, but that being said, let's go ahead and go over it. So first thing I'm gonna do, take a look at my prompt. Student wants to make a generalization about the kind of study conducted by Glickman, Brown, and Song. So what I'm focusing on here is we need to make a generalization about the kind of study that was conducted. All right, so let's go ahead and read through our notes. We have British Museums, John Lennon and Paul McCartney shared writing credit for numerous Beatles songs. Many Lennon McCartney songs were actually written by either Lennon or McCartney, not by both. The exact authorship of specific parts of many Beatles songs, such as the verse for In My Life is Disputed. Mark, Glick, Mark Glickman, Jason Brown, and Ryan Song used statistical methods to analyze the musical content of Beatles songs. They concluded that there is 18.9% probability that McCartney wrote the verse for In My Life, stating that the verse is consistent with Lennon's songwriting style. All right, so ultimately, what's the kind of study that's conducted? Well, it's using statistical methods to analyze musical content of Beatles songs. So we want to generalize it so we wouldn't really want to apply it specifically just to the Beatles. We want to generalize it as they use statistical methods to analyze um, musical content or if there's nothing about musical content then just that they use statistical methods to, to study something. So if we go down, look at our options, we got option A. Based on statistical analysis, Glickman Brown and Song claimed that John Lennon wrote the verse of In My Life. Okay, well, that's too specific. We need to make a generalization about the kind of study. Okay, so while we do introduce the kind of study here, we're not generalizing it. So you can get rid of A. If we take a look at B, there's only an 18.9% probability that Paul McCartney wrote the verse for In My Life. John Lennon is the more likely author. That doesn't even introduce the type of study. So we can get rid of B. If we look at C, it is likely that John Lennon, not Paul McCartney, wrote the verse for In My Life. Once again, that does not mention the study. So far, the only ones that have mentioned the study would be a, if we take a look at D, researchers have used statistical methods, so now we are talking about the study here, to address questions of authorship within the field of music. So this is providing that generalization about the kind of study, okay? The kind of study being statistical methods, and then the generalization being we're using it to address questions of authorship within the field of music, which is what occurred here, but now we are generalizing it to music as a whole and not just the Beatles. So our answer would have to be D. Okay, now I wanna get you guys some practice on the digital SATs math section. So what I'm gonna do is I'll give you a certain amount of time for each of these questions. Once that time's up, I'll go over the questions. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with question number one. I'm gonna give you guys 20 seconds for this one, starting now.
All right, 20 seconds is up, so let's go and go over it. So what is 10% of 470? All you gotta do is 0.1 for that 10%, and then multiply that by 470, and that'll get you 47. So our answer there would have to be answer choice B. All right, let's move on to question number two. Okay, for question number two, I'm gonna give you guys 20 seconds as well, starting now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over it. Okay, so we've got which equation has the same solution as a given equation. If we take a look at our answer choices, we have 4x equals. So we just want to isolate 4x. So we'll subtract 6 from both sides. 18 minus 6 will leave us with 12. So we have 12 is equal to 4x. So our answer there would have to be answer choice C. All right, let's move on to question 3. Okay, for question number 3, I'm going to give you guys uh, 20 seconds as well, starting right now. All right, so that 20 seconds is up, so let's go and go over it. So we've got total cost of dollars to rent a surfboard consists of a $25 service fee, so that service fee is a one-time charge, and a $10 per hour rental fee, so plus 10 times H. The person rents a surfboard for T hours, so we can substitute T in for H, and intends to spend a maximum of 75. So this total cost must be less than or equal to 75 to rent the surfboard, which inequality represents the situation. We see that that have to be answer choice D. All right, let's go ahead and move on to question number four okay for question number four i'm going to give you guys 20 seconds as well starting right now all right 20 seconds is up so let's go and go over number four so you got the function uh, g is defined by g of x equals x squared plus 9. For which value of x is g of x equal to 25? We'd have 25 is equal to x squared plus 9. Subtract 9 from both sides. That gets you 16 is equal to x squared. From there, we're going to take the square root of both sides to isolate the value of x. Square root of 16 would be 4. So we have 4 is equal to the value of x. We're asked to answer the value of x. So our answer would have to be answer choice A. All right, moving on to question number 5. For question number 5, I'll give you guys 20 seconds as well, starting now. All right, time's up. So let's go over question five. Each face of a fair 14-sided die is labeled with a number from one through 14 with a different number appearing on each face. If the die is rolled one time, what is the probability of rolling a two? Well, only one of these faces has a two. So if we we're only rolling it once, the probability of rolling a two would be one out of the 14 different sides. So our answer there would have to be answer choice A. All right, moving on to question number six. For question number six, I'm gonna give you guys, or was that? Oh, six is right here. Okay, so question number six, I'm going to give you guys 20 seconds as well, starting now. All right, 20 seconds is now up, so let's go and go over the question. Okay, so we've got a printer produces posters at a constant rate of 42 posters per minute. So we can do 42 posters per minute, so P per M. At what rate in posters per hour does the printer produce posters? Anytime something's underlined, pay attention to it. So we need to convert this to hours. So we'll multiply by the fact that we have 60 minutes per every one hour. Our minutes are going to cancel out, and we'll be left with our amount of posters per hour. So we can put this in the calculator. It's just 42 times 60, and that'll give us 2520. Okay, so our answer there would be 2520. All right, question number seven. So for question number seven, I'm going to give you guys 20 seconds as well. Okay, starting right now.
All right, 20 seconds is up, so let's go and go over the question. Okay, so we've got function f is defined by the equation f of x is equal to 7x plus 2. What is the value of f of x when x is equal to 4? So we just plug in 4 for the value of x. 7 times 4 is 28. 28 plus 2 leaves us with 30. So the value of f of x when x is equal to 4 would be 30. Once again, you take the 4, multiply it by that 7, get to 28. 28 plus 2 gives you 30. Okay, question number 8. I'm going to give you guys uh, 30 seconds for this one, starting now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over the question. So we've got teachers creating an assignment worth 70 points. The assignment will consist of questions worth one point and questions worth three points, which equation represents a situation where X represents the number of one point questions. So we have one X and Y represents the number of three point questions. So plus three Y. Okay, so our total amount of points is 70 and that's got to equal the number of one point questions plus the number of three point questions times three points. Okay, so if we look at our options, we have to have answer choice D. All right, moving on to question number nine. Okay, for question number nine, I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds as well, starting now. Okay, time's up, so let's go over number nine. Right triangles LMN and PQR are similar, where L and M correspond to P and Q respectively. Angle M has a measure of 53 degrees. What is the measure of angle Q? All right, so we can go ahead and draw this out. Okay, we've got L and M correspond to P and Q. So we know L is corresponding to P, M corresponds to Q. We're asked for the measure of angle Q. We know that the measure of angle M is gonna be the same as the measure of angle Q. And we're told that the measure of angle M is 50 degrees, 53 degrees. Therefore, the measure of angle Q would also be 53 degrees. So the key thing to identify here is the fact that since we have um, L and M corresponding to P and Q means M corresponds to Q. So we don't actually have to do any math here. We know that they have to be the same because they're similar triangles. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds for question number 10, starting now. Okay, time's up. Let's go and go over question number 10. So we've got the solution to the given system of equations is xy. What's the value of x? We've got stacked equations. So I'm going to look to add, subtract, or substitute. In this case, we have y is equal to negative 3x. I want to get to the value of x as fast as I can. So I'll substitute in this negative 3x because then I have 4x minus 3x, which would leave me with just x. So then I have x is equal to 15. So what's the value of x? It'd have to be 15. So our answer there would have to be c. Okay, moving on to question number 11. For this one, I'm going to give you guys... Uh, 30 seconds as well, starting now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over the question. We've got which of the following equations is the most appropriate linear model for the data shown in the scatter plot. I'm going to take a look at my y-intercept. I see it's somewhere between 9 and 10. I'll take a look at my um, slope. My slope's negative. Okay, so if I look at my options, I can get rid of C and D because they have positive slopes. I can get rid of A since it's got a negative y-intercept. We know our y-intercept's positive, so our answer would have to be B. All right, let's go and move on to our next question. Okay, for our next question, I will give you guys uh, 30 seconds as well. Okay, so you get 30 seconds starting right now.
All right, time's up. Let's go and go over the question. So we got the graph of y equals f of x is shown, where the function f is defined by f of x equals ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, where a, b, and c are d are constants. For how many values of x does f of x equal zero? Well, f of x will equal zero where we cross our x-intercept, or where we touch, sorry, I should say where we touch our x-intercept. Okay, so if we look at our zeros, we've got one right here, we've got one right here, and we've got one right here. So we have three zeros. Okay, once again, I want to repeat that you have f of x equals zero where you touch that x-axis. Okay, we touch the x-axis in three different points, so we have three zeros, so our answer there would have to be C. Okay, moving on to question number 13. For question number 13, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds as well, so 30 seconds starting now. All right, so that's about 30 seconds. So let's go ahead and go over question number 13. We've got Vivian bought party hats and cupcakes for 71. So we've got our total cost is 71. We've got each package of party hats costs $3. So I'll mark that as $3 per package of hats. So I'll just use H for hats. And each cupcake costs $1. So I'll use plus C for cupcake. Vivian bought 10 par packages of party hats. How many cupcakes did she buy? Well, let's go ahead and substitute in 10 for H because that's how many packages of hats she bought. Okay, we need to solve for the amount of cupcakes she bought. Well, 3 times 10 is 30, so we'll do 71 minus 30. 71 minus 30 will leave us with 41 is equal to the number of cupcakes. So our answer would have to be 41. All right, moving on to question number 14. Okay, for question number 14, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds to answer that one as well, starting now. All right, 30 seconds is up, so let's go and go over it. We've got what is one of the solutions to the given equation. In order to get my solution, I'm going to look to factor this. Okay, so I'll do z. Uh, we have looking at numbers that multiply to negative 24. That'll add to 10. Okay, so numbers that multiply to negative 24 would be uh, negative 2 and then positive, uh, positive 12. Okay, that would be how we could factor this. So we'd have z plus 12 and z minus 2. As you can see, negative 2 times 12 gets us negative 24. And then we have plus 12z minus 2z, which gets us that plus 10z. And then we have z squared as well. All right, so as far as possible solutions here, you'd have z is equal to 2 as one of the solutions. And the other solution you could have would be z is equal to negative 12. Now keep in mind, in this case, you're just asked for one of the solutions. So I would just answer with 2 here. Okay, you could also have answered with negative 12. Um, sometimes they'll ask you to answer the positive solution or the negative solution or something like that. So always pay attention to that. But in this case, they're just asking for one of the solutions. So you could have negative 12 and you could have positive two. All right, going on to question number 15. For question number 15, I'm going to give you guys uh, 40 seconds on this one starting now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over the question. So we've got bacteria growing in a liquid growth medium. There were 300,000 cells per milliliter during an initial observation. Number of cells per milliliter doubles every three hours. So we've got our initial amount, 300,000. That's doubling. Okay, so doubling means our growth factor is two. That's happening every three hours. Okay, so denominator in our exponent's three. And the numerator will be how many cells per milliliter will there be 15 hours after the initial observation. So 15 over three would be that exponent. 15 over three we know is equal to five. So we could rewrite this as two to the power of five. Okay, so now we just put this into our calculator and that will give us 9,600,000. Okay, so that would be answer choice D. 
All right, moving on to question number 16. Okay, so for question number 16, I'm gonna give you guys uh, 30 seconds on this one. Okay, so 30 seconds starting now. All right, time's up, let's go and go over the question. So which expression is equivalent to, and then we've got this uh, equation here. So if we look at our options, okay, we can see that we're ultimately gonna be pulling out six X squared, Y squared in all of these. So let's go ahead and do that. If we pull out six X squared, Y squared from this number here, we'd be left with X to the power of six. Okay, so we're gonna have X to the power of six as one of our factors. Then if we take a look at, if we pull out six X squared, Y squared over here, we'd have to multiply it by two to get that 12. So we'd end up with, x to the power of six plus two, and then getting multiplied by six x squared y squared. Okay, so if you look at our options here, we can go ahead and see what matches up with that. We see b doesn't match up, neither does a, neither does d. Our answer there has to be answer choice c, x to the power of six plus two times six x squared y squared. Okay, moving on to question number 17. Okay, for question number 17, I'm gonna give you guys, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, there we go. All right, for question number 17, I'll give you guys um, 40 seconds for this one. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over the question. Okay, so we've got a neighborhood consists of a two hectare park and a 35 hectare residential area. The total number of trees in the neighborhood is 3934. Equation 2x plus 35y equals 3934 represents the situation, which the following is the best interpretation of x in the context. Well, we know we have our total number of trees. Okay, so we ultimately need to sum this. We've got a two hectare park. So this x then must be the number of trees per hectare in the park. Okay, so average number of trees per hectare in the park. That'll be answer choice A. So A would have to be our answer there. All right, let's go ahead and move on to question number 18. Okay, for question number 18, I'm going to give you guys um, 45 seconds for this one, okay, starting right now. Okay, and I'll zoom out so you can see the whole thing. All right, there's question 18. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over the question. Okay, so we've got graph shows relationship between number of shares of stock from company A, which is represented as X, and company B, which is represented as Y, that Simone can purchase, which equation could represent the relationship. All right, well, I see my Y-intercept is going to be at 40. Okay, keep in mind, we also want to check that we've got zero and zero here, which we do. Okay, we see that our X-intercept is at 60. Our slope is going to be uh, negative 40 over 60, which is the same as negative two-thirds. Okay, so let's go and look at our options. We got option A, Y is equal to 8X plus 12. We can get rid of that because it has a positive slope. Same thing with C. C also has a positive slope, so we can get rid of it. Next thing we're looking at is B and D. Okay, so for B and D, one thing that we can do here, it looks like, um, looks like they would have different Y intercepts. So we could use that um, as one of the ways to do it. So let's actually go ahead and do that. So we could do 480 over 12 will get us the value of our Y intercept. Okay, so let's go ahead and do 480 over 12, and that would be 40. Okay, and then if we look at option D, we would have 480 over eight, which would give us 60. 
Okay, and we know that our y-intercept is at 40, so our answer would have to be answer choice B. Okay, moving on to question number 19. Okay, for question number 19, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and I'll give you guys 30 seconds for this one. So 30 seconds starting right now. All right, time's up, so let's go ahead and go over the question. We've got circle A has a radius of 3n, and circle B has a radius of 129n, where n is a positive constant. The area of circle B is how many times the area of circle A? All right, well, to get the area of a circle, we would do pi r squared. So we'd have pi times our radius, which is 3n, all being squared, divided by, or hang on, it says area of circle B. Okay, so circle B is 129n. Okay, so got how many times the area of circle A. So how many we have the area of circle B is how many times the area of circle A. We need the radius then of circle B to start and we'll square that and we put that all over the radius of pi times radius squared. Okay, our radius here is 3n squared. Ultimately that would equal out to pi um, times 129 squared times n squared all over pi. So as you can see our pi's will cancel out so we can just get rid of them. And then we'd have 3 squared times n squared. The n squareds will also cancel out. So then it's just 129 squared over 3 squared. So you can put that in your calculator. Once we do that, that will ultimately give us a value of 1849. So that would have to be answer choice D. Okay, moving on to question number 20. All right, for question number 20, I'm going to give you guys, uh, we'll do 30 seconds for this one as well. Okay, so 30 seconds starting right now. All right, 30 seconds is now up, so let's go and go over the question. So we've got the frequency table summarizes the 57 data values in the data set. What is the maximum data value in the data set? Okay, keep in mind we need the maximum data value in the data set, not the value with the highest frequency. So some people would be inclined to answer 11 because it has the highest frequency, but that's not the question we're asked. We're asked what's the maximum data value in the data set. We see that the maximum data value would be 14. Okay, so our answer would have to be 14. All right, moving on to question number 21. For question number 21, I'm gonna give you guys uh, 45 seconds for this one. Okay, so 45 seconds starting now. All right, time's up, so let's go and go over the question. Okay, so we've got a circle in the xy plane has a diameter with endpoints 2, 4, and 2, 14. An equation of the circle is x minus 2 squared plus y minus 9 squared equals r squared, where r is a positive constant. What's the value of r? All right, so we need to solve for our radius here. Okay, if I'm given two different endpoints, for a diameter, I know that I can solve for the diameter and then just divide by two to get my radius. Now, what I look for if I'm given two endpoints like this is I'm gonna look for if the x values are the same or the y values are the same. In this case, the x values are the same, which means that if we were to plot this, okay, we'd have two and four, and we'd have uh, two and 14, okay? And these are just gonna be just a straight line down, okay? So let me just redraw that dot, okay? Just be a straight line down. Okay, and as you can see, the difference there is 10. Okay, so our diameter is 10, so we can write 10 is equal to the diameter, therefore the radius then would have to be five. 
Okay, so our answer would have to be five. So the big tip I have for you here is if you're given endpoints like this for a circle, try to see if the X values are the same or the Y values are the same because that makes it super, super easy. All right, that being said, let's go ahead and move on to question number 22. All right, for question number 22, I'm gonna give you guys 40 seconds for this one starting right now. All right, time's up. Let's go ahead and go over question number 22. So we've got angle measure, uh, the measure of angle R is two pi over three radians. The measure of angle T is five pi over 12 radians greater than the measure of angle R. What's the measure of angle T in degrees? Anytime something's underlined on the SAT math section, pay attention to it. Okay, so in this case, we've got angle T, five pi over 12 radians greater than the measure of angle R. So we have to add in the measure of angle R. To add a fraction like this, I need the same denominator. Okay, so I'll go ahead and multiply the numerator and denominator of this fraction by uh, four to get to 12. So that would give us eight pi over 12. Okay, this would ultimately give us a value of 13 pi over 12 radians. To convert radians to degrees, what we're gonna do is we'll take that 13 pi over 12 radians, multiply it by the fact that we have 180 degrees per pi radians. We see our pi's are gonna cancel out. 13 over 12 times 180 will give us 195 degrees. So our answer would have to be answer choice C. Okay, and I just noticed that part of my uh, camera's blocking. So let me scroll down. So as you can see, once again, 13 pi over 12, multiply it by 180 degrees over pi radians, gets rid of our radians and we're left with 195 degrees. All right, let's go ahead and move on to question number 23. Okay, so for number 23, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds for this one, starting now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over question number 23. We've got a certain town has an area of 4.36 square miles. What is the area in square yards of this town? So to convert from square miles to square yards, what we have to keep in mind is that this conversion is for only miles and yards. So to do square miles to square yards, we have to keep in mind that we have to square this value. So what we do is we have 4.36 square miles. Now we have to multiply that by 1760 squared. Okay, and if you are someone who gets confused when dealing with converting units, I'll show you a way that you can check your work kind of as you go. You have 4.36 miles, okay? You wanna, or square miles, let me write that as square miles, square miles. Okay, so actually I'll just write that as miles with a, a two as the exponent. Okay, now we wanna get to square yards. So to do that, we'd wanna multiply by the number of square yards we have per square mile. So we can write yard squared per mile squared. Okay, now our conversion unit is just one mile through 1760 yards. So we'd actually have to do 1760 squared, yard squared, and then we'd have to have a one per one mile squared. Okay, so as you can see here, you're gonna have to do 4.36 times 1760 squared. When you put that in your calculator, you're gonna get 13505536. And you can also see that your square miles cancel here and you're left with square yards. Okay, so your answer there's gotta be answer choice of D. We can go ahead and move on to our next question. And once again, I kind of noticed that my camera's blocking it, so there you can kind of see it more clearly. All right, let's go down to number 24. Okay, for this question, I'm gonna give you guys, uh, we'll do 60 seconds, or actually we'll do 75 seconds for this one. This one's a little bit, a little bit longer. So 75 seconds on this one, starting right now.
All right, time is up. So let's go and go over question number 24. So we got for line H, table shows three values of X and their corresponding values of Y. Line K is the result of translating line H down five units in the XY plane. Anytime you have translations or transformations, always pay attention. What is the X intercept of line K? Well, let's start by getting our equation for line H to start. So we see that we are going over by five. So our denominator for our slope would be five and we are going up by 30. Okay, so 30 over five, we can simplify that down to positive six. So we know our slope for line H is 6x. So we've got y is equal to 6x. Let's go ahead and find our y-intercept. Okay, since we know our slope is 6x, we can do 6 times 18, okay, in order to figure out how much we went up going from 0 to 18. So if we add a new point, 0, right here, okay, we see that we've got to go back by the value of 6 times 18, which is 108, and that'll leave us with 22. Okay, so now we've got 22 there, so we know that we have y is equal to 6x plus 22. Okay, from here, we need to translate this down by five units to get the value of line H because this equation we have right now is for line K. So that would mean that line H is going to be Y is equal to 6X plus 17. Now, keep in mind that we want to find the X intercept of line K. Our X intercept is where Y is zero. So we can put in a zero for Y and we have zero is equal to 6X plus 17. We'll subtract 17 from both sides. Then we get that negative 17 is equal to 6X. Then we divide both sides by six and we get negative 17 over six is equal to the value of X, which we see must be answer choice D. All right, that being said, let's go ahead and move on to question number 25. For question number 25, I will give you guys um, We'll do 60 seconds for this one as well. Actually, we're gonna do, um, we'll do 90 seconds for this one, so 90 seconds. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over it. In the xy plane, the graph of the equation y is equal to negative x squared plus 9x minus 100 intersects the line y equals c at exactly one point. What is the value of c? So for a question like this, the first thing that I'd like to do is find my vertex. Now, in this case, we don't have vertex form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug into Desmos since I don't see a very easy way to factor this. So I'll go ahead and put it in Desmos, and then I will see what my vertex is there. Okay, now keep in mind, this is specifically for the digital SAT that you have access to a graphing calculator within Bluebook, the testing environment. You also, if you are uh, taking the SAT on paper, you could use your graphing calculator to do this. If you have a TI-84, for example, you could plug this in and find the vertex. Okay, in this case, if we take a look at the graph, we have a vertex at negative 79.75 for the Y coordinate. Now keep in mind, we're really only concerned with the Y coordinate because we need this to intersect the line Y equals C at exactly one point. So the value for C then would have to be that uh, negative 79.75. Okay, so we need negative 79.75. We take a look at our answer choices. We've got answer choice B, which obviously is not equal to that. Same with answer choice D. Now between C and A, we know that option A would have to be negative something below negative 100. Okay, this would have to be below negative 100 right there. Okay, so once again, option A would have to be less than negative 79.75. Okay, so we'll ultimately would have to equal negative 79.75. That'd have to be answer choice C. Okay, so C would have to be our answer there for number 25. All right, let's go ahead and go over number 26 now. Okay, so I'll give you guys um, a certain amount of time. Let me go ahead and remove Desmos from my screen and we'll scroll down. 
All right, so number 26 is right here, okay? For this question, I'm gonna give you guys, uh, we'll do two minutes for this one, okay? Because this one's a little bit of a longer one. Let me go ahead and switch the sides that my camera's on so you can see the question. And I'll give you guys two minutes starting right now. All right, that two minutes is up. Okay, I will note that this question is one that is um, pretty time consuming if you don't know what to look for. So if you weren't able to get it done in two minutes, you might have still been able to get it right in more time, but you do need to be able to move fast on the digital SAT math section in order to get a really good score. So let's go ahead and go over how you can do this much more efficiently. So here's the way I would approach question number 26. So we've got for each real number R, which of the following points lies on the graph of each equation uh, of each equation in the xy plane for the given system. Sorry about that. I want to make sure I was recording still, and I am. All right, so we've got uh, 2x plus 3y is equal to 7, 10x plus 15y is equal to 35. So what I'm going to look to do here is see if something is a solution to this first one, if it's also a solution to this second equation. Okay, so if we take a look, we've got 2 times 5 gives us 10, 3 times 5 gets us 15, and 7 times 5 gets us 35. So that means that since we're multiplying this top equation all by 5, anything that is a solution to this top equation or anything that's a solution to this bottom equation will also be a solution for the other equation. Okay, so as long as something's a solution for one of the equations, it's a solution to both. All right, next thing I'm going to look at is you pretty much just have to use substitution here in order to get A through D, um, but you want to be smart about the order that you do substitution. So what I mean by that is since I have a two as my coefficient in front of my x, I'm gonna look for x values that have a denominator of two, which I see is the case in answer choice B. Okay, the next thing I look at is in terms of y, okay, I've got three y, so where do I have a denominator of three in that y coordinate? I see that's in the answer choice C. Okay, so from here what I'll do is I will go like this. I would go one, two, and then between D and A, I would take a look at option D and I'd probably go D before A. So I'd probably go one, two, three, and then four. And the reason why is because we've got this 35 as this constant, we're dealing with fives. Okay, none of that really makes much, um, it doesn't make the math very easy. It makes it much more difficult. If we look at down here, we've got this being over two, that just seems easier to deal with than over five and then constants as well. So this is the order I'd approach these in. So basically, if you're wondering you know, what you should do to order, um, as you saw, first start out with where you're gonna have things cancel out. For example, two in this numerator will cancel out these twos in the denominators. Um, and then from there, obviously B and C, they both have that, just one's X, one's Y. I would from there just go in the order that they're listed. So I do the first one first. So in this case, let's go ahead and start with B. So we'd plug in two, so we'd have two times negative three R over two plus seven over two, and these twos will cancel out with this two that's the coefficient. So that's gonna end up leaving me with negative three R plus seven. And then we have R for the value of Y, so we'd have plus three 
times r. So now we've got negative 3r and plus 3r. That'll give us 0r. So then we just have 7 is equal to 7. Okay, is that true? That is true. Okay, so we know that since this is a solution for the first one, it's also a solution to the second one, since the second equation is just the top one multiplied by 5. Okay, so we know our answer there would have to be answer choice B. Okay, so basically the big things to take away here, number one, make sure that if you have equations like this, okay, see if, you know, one is just getting multiplied by some constant to get the other, because then if something's a solution to one of them, it'll be the solution to the other one, and you'll have to check them both, which saves you, cuts the time in half, basically. And then the next thing, be smart about the order that you go through your answer choices when you have a substitution question, okay? Try to use hints from the, the question, because oftentimes you can, you know, go through certain answer choices much faster. It's much easier for me to check the value of one and two, or in other words, of B and C, because I know that these coefficients are just gonna end up canceling out with what's in the denominator. So way faster to check those than it is to check these other ones. So it makes sense to start with the ones that are easier to check. All right, that being said, let's go ahead and move on to question number 27. So for question number 27, I'm gonna give you guys 90 seconds. Okay, so 90 seconds starting now. All right, 90 seconds is now up, so let's go and go over this question. Okay, so we've got perimeter of an equilateral triangle is 624 centimeters. The height of the triangle is k root 3 centimeters, where k is a constant. What is the value of k? All right, well, if we've got an equilateral triangle, let's go ahead and draw it. Anytime you have a triangle or a circle question, I do recommend that you try to draw it out. Okay, so that this is equilateral, which means all sides are the same length. So we've got our height, which is k root 3. So I'll write that as k root 3. Okay, we've got 90 degree angles right here. And then we've got a 60 degree angle here, a 60 degree angle here, and then we have two 30 degree angles up here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually draw this out bigger so you can see this better. Okay, so I'm gonna redraw this and I'm only gonna draw one of the sides just to make it easier. Okay, so we're just gonna draw one of these so that we can draw it bigger. All right, so once again, we've got K root three, and we've got 90 degree angle here, 60 degree angle here, and a 30 degree angle here. So what you see is you got a 60, 30, 90 triangle. Okay, so a 60, 30, 90 triangle. And also just remember too that, I guess I will just redraw this just for clarity, that this is just one part of it that we're looking at. Okay, and same thing, 60, 30. All right, so from here, 60, 30, 90 triangle, what you wanna recognize is if we have K root three across from our 60, that means across from our 30, we would have K, and then our hypotenuse would be 2K. Okay, this is just the rule of a 60, 30, 90 triangle. You could think of K if you were to replace it with X as well, it just goes for any variable. All right, with that being said now, we have 2K there. We know it's equilateral, which means all side lengths are the same, which means that we have 2K on this side as well. And then we would have um, you know, K there and K there. And that means that this whole side length would be 2K as well. So as you can see, our perimeter for this equilateral triangle, it's 624 centimeters, but it's also 6K. So we can write this as 624 centimeters is equal to 6K. From here, we can just go ahead and divide both sides by six to get the value of K. And when we do that, we're gonna end up with 104 as the value of K. So the value of K would be 104. You've now reached the point in the course where it is time for you to take your first full-length digital SAT practice test. To do this, I recommend that you download Bluebook using the instructions on the College Board's website and take digital SAT practice test number four while simulating the testing environment as best you can. If you are able to take the practice test at a similar time of day to which you will be taking the actual digital SAT, I recommend doing that as well. 
After completing the practice test, the next task in this course will be to review every question you got wrong. I will discuss specifically how I recommend you review your test after you have finished it. For now, I'm going to start a 2 hour and 14 minute timer for you to take practice test 4.
Now that you've completed the practice test, I want you to go to the College Board's website and open up your results. For every question you got incorrect, read through the entire answer explanation for both the correct and incorrect answers, and identify what mistake you made, as well as how you will avoid making that mistake on future questions. It may be helpful to write this down or create a PowerPoint with screenshots of every question you got wrong for future reference and studying. Depending on how many questions you got wrong, this review may take a while. That is okay. Make sure to finish the entire review before proceeding on to the rest of the course. I'm going to allocate two hours here for you to review. Once the timer is finished, the next portion of the course will begin.